5. Ice Maidens, Volcanoes, and Incas, Peru These children, to be sacrificed to the mountain and other gods, would be collected from all over the land and would be carried in litters together. They should be very well dressed, paired up, female and male. Juan de Patanzos, 1551 some females included in the sacrifices were maidens kept in the enclosures or convents of the Mamaconas. They could not have any blemish or even a mole on their entire body before they were sacrificed. Human nature would not allow them to kill their own children if they did not expect some reward for what they were doing or if they did not believe that they were sending their children to a better place. Bernambi Cobo, 1653 Juanita was just ten years old and only four short years from death as she hurried to keep up with her mother. The two walked quickly down a street lined by perfectly cut stone walls in the Inca capital of Cusco. Sparkling water so cold it made your hands turn purple gurgled down a channel in the middle of the stone-flagged street. The water from a snowmelt funneled into the city from the sacred mountains nearby. Men and women passed by them the men wearing sandals and clothed in colorful alpaca tunics, or unco, the women, like Juanita's mother, wearing equally colorful tunics and cloaks. Juanita loved to peek at visitors to the capital and guess where they were from. Her mother could tell which part of the empire they lived in simply by looking at the colors and patterns of what they wore. Some were nobles from the north, from recently conquered areas, others from the far south, beyond the great lake of Titicaca. Still others were part of the local Hanan nobility, to which she and her mother belonged. On the right, up ahead, two warriors stood guard in front of a large trapezoidal door bordered by smoothly cut stones and set within a massive wall that seemed to stretch along the street forever. Although Juanita couldn't possibly have known it, as she and her mother hurried through the capital of the newly created 2,500-mile-long Inca Empire, fate would soon transform her from a pasña, or ordinary girl, into an aclacapacocha, or human sacrifice. In less than a handful of years, Juanita would be led up to the top of a 20,700-foot volcano overlooking the great majestic sweep of the Andes, and there would be sacrifice to the gods. Mama, what do they do inside the Aklawasi, the house of the virgins? Juanita asked, as she and her mother passed by the two guards and the trapezoidal door. Juanita spoke in her native tongue of Quechua, the lingua franca of the Inca Empire. Hush! her mother said in a low voice, then seemed to walk even faster. Hurry, child. Juanita would have given anything to enter the doors of the Aklawasi, the secretive enclosure run within by priestesses and where hundreds of Aklakuna, or chosen women, led their mysterious lives. But doing so was forbidden to unauthorized visitors. Any man found inside would immediately be put to death. Up ahead, Juanita could see a group of Rukana natives smoothly carrying an Inca nobleman on a litter. The man sat on a low wooden stool, a canopy over his head, and with the bright green feathers of jungle parrots interwoven into the canopy's cloth. The man had the specially elongated earlobes, bearing large golden plugs, signifying his noble status. He also wore golden amulets on his arms. Juanita caught herself staring, first at his clothing, which was sumptuously dyed and woven, and then at his face. As the procession moved toward them up the street, Juanita saw the nobleman turn and look at her, causing the skin on her face to flush. Juanita then cast her eyes down, but not before she saw the nobleman point at her and say something to one of his attendants. As Juanita and her mother hurried along, she glanced back and saw the attendant turn, and then quickly begin running after them. The attendant ran past Juanita, then touched her mother's shawl, causing her to stop. He said something, but Juanita couldn't make out the words. The young girl only saw her mother's eyes on the ground and her mother's face, which suddenly seemed to lose all its color. Her mother listened, nodded solemnly, then looked over at her. Neither the cold mountain air nor the dampness from the recent rains, but rather something in her mother's eyes, 
caused Juanita's skin to tingle. With just that single, somber look, Juanita knew that her life and that of her mother's would never again be the same. Abby Frankamont was just five years old when she, her sister, and her parents were stricken with severe hepatitis in Peru. The year was 1977, and the American family had arrived in the country only about four months earlier. Falling ill in their home in the small rural town of Chinchero, about 25 miles by dirt road from Cusco, Abby's parents decided to move the family to the former Inca capital, where they could be close to a hospital. Their problem was that they were freelance anthropologists, work was scarce, and they had only a few dollars' worth of Peruvian soles left to their name. Abby's parents were in their late twenties and had come of age during the 1960s. Her mother, Chris, had graduated from Radcliffe, while her father, Ed, had graduated from Harvard. The two had then moved to a commune on a rural farm, where Abby was born. When the elderly owner of the farm passed away and his heirs wanted no part of the commune, Abby's parents moved to a small tract of land her mother had inherited in New Hampshire. Their idea was to build a small cabin. Abby's father was strong and bearded and had wrestled in college. He was a natural leader, was good with his hands, and had a decisive can-do attitude. Chris Frankamont, Abby's mother, had begun college at sixteen and had graduated cum laude by the time she was twenty. She was pretty, brown-haired, and slender, and had met Ed while on an archaeological dig in Ancon on the coast of Peru. The two had sifted sand together, pulling out bits of bones and scraps of two-thousand-year-old tapestries, while gradually falling in love. Abby's mother dreamed of one day becoming a professional ethnologist, of researching cultures, and of living abroad. Her father was especially fascinated by ancient textile techniques and had begun learning how to weave. Years later, now married in New Hampshire and with a young family, Abby's parents realized that the cabin they intended to build would never be finished before the onset of winter. They then made a fateful decision. Throwing their possessions into some suitcases, the couple bought four round-trip tickets and boarded a plane for Peru. Ed and Chris, five-year-old Abby, and her two-year-old sister soon arrived in Cusco. They had a total of two hundred dollars that remained. The family soon made their way to Chinchero, a sleepy rural community of whitewashed adobe buildings, red tile roofs, and scattered Inca ruins, located on a high pampa, or plain, at an elevation of twelve thousand four hundred feet. It took three hours riding on the back of a cattle truck to get there, even though it was only a few dozen miles from Cusco. Surrounded by steep hills sown with potatoes that were grazed by sheep and alpacas, Chinchero's biggest attraction was that it was renowned for the quality of its traditional weavings. We settled in Chinchero because of its active community of weavers of all ages, Ed and Chris later wrote but our primary goal at the time was to unlock the meaning of the complex textile patterns woven by Chinchero women. The two freelance anthropologists hoped to research weaving and somehow make a living by writing articles about it. News of the young Gringo family with the two small blonde-haired girls and of their strange request to settle there soon spread throughout the community. The town council held a meeting. The request was considered, and after much deliberation it was decided that the family could stay. The council placed the family under the care of the Cooper Ayu, one of thirteen sub-communities the inhabitants of Chinchero were divided into. Ayus are an ancient Andean survival strategy, in which communities are divided into groups comprised of extended family members. The tightly bound groups function as workforce organizers and human social nets, helping to mitigate the impacts of frost, drought, earthquakes, and other kinds of calamities. Occasionally, an IU will allow non-family members to join. For Abby and her family, the Cooper IU made just such an exception. Four months after they had arrived, Abby and her father fell very ill. They soon suspected hepatitis, a virus that attacks the liver, when Abby's sister and mother also began to get sick, the family set off on a cattle truck to Cusco in search of medical care. They soon moved into a room an American archaeology student had rented but didn't occupy while out conducting fieldwork. 
Abby's parents, who'd been expecting a check to arrive in Cusco for an article they'd written, arrived only to find that no check was there. Now they had only pocket change left. I've been really, really sick, recalls Abby, who is now forty-four and lives in Ohio. I remember waking up in the room and it being cold and my dad having been very sick and my mom and little sister were starting to get sick. A few days after arriving, Abby and her father went out in search of food. They had just five soles, a little over a dollar, left to spend. That was all the money we had, and I remember my dad having to make the decision about what we were going to buy, Abby remembers. Either powdered soup, which we could cook on a hot plate, or bread, because that was all we could afford. And my dad said, well, I think it's going to have to be the powdered soup because I have a whole sick family and the soup will go further. In the end, Abby's father bought the soup, and the two of them walked back to their room. Abby remembers watching her father pour the powder into a pot full of near freezing water and then putting the pot on a hot plate. She also remembers how, at precisely that moment, the power in Cusco went out. The power was out for a day, Abby said and I remember this particular moment and me running around and shouting, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, why can't we eat? I remember my father sitting there with his head in his hands and saying, You know, it's one thing to lead a hippie lifestyle when you don't have a family, when you don't have responsibility, but boy, does it change when people are counting on you. Abby recalls that she and her father went back outside to walk around a bit, her father wanted to clear his head and try to figure out what next to do. They were now literally penniless, without even so much as a Peruvian soul remaining. Then, while crossing a street, Abby spotted something crumpled up in the gutter. She went over and picked it up. It was a ten-soul bill. I was ecstatic, Abby remembers. That was enough for us to go to the covered market and buy something to eat. Cusco's central market in the 1970s was much as it still is now, a huge, cavernous building with Quechua-speaking women inside wearing bowler hats and dressed in long ankle-length skirts, or polleras, minding tiny booths and stands. Surrounding the women stood piles of potatoes, mottled plantains, scaly onions, okra, squash, lucuma, papayas, onions, and other vegetables and fruits. In one section, women hovered over cooking stations, replete with small tables, wooden benches, and steaming kettles of soup. By the time Abby and her father entered the market, holding on to their ten-soul bill, they were obviously the worse for wear, both having only recently recovered from hepatitis and having lost considerable weight. We saw a food vendor lady, Abby recalls. She took one look at us and insisted that we sit down and eat. She then fixed a whole big meal and gave us food to take back to my mom and sister, all for free. That's how Peruvian people have always been. That's indigenous Peruvian generosity. They don't want to see anyone go hungry on their watch. So we ended up spending the money I found on medicine instead of for food. The Francomat family ultimately survived their illness and eventually returned to Chinchero, where Abby and her sister began to learn Spanish and all four of them began to learn Quechua, which was routinely spoken in town. I remember consciously studying Spanish, Abby remembers, but Quechua I learned simply by soaking it up. On one particular evening, Abby says, she woke suddenly in the middle of the night. Outside, a group of men were returning from a celebration from somewhere in the fields. They had obviously been drinking and were talking loudly in Quechua as they passed by the Francomat's small adobe home. I remember waking up and hearing them, and I remember suddenly realizing that I understood every word they were saying, Abby says. That's how it happens when you're a child. Language kind of gradually sinks in and then suddenly, bam, it's there. Every Sunday in Chinchero, the townspeople held a large open-air market, just as they do today. The market took place on a square lined on one side by an Inca wall with large trapezoidal niches and on the other by adobe buildings. On such mornings, women dressed in colorful hand-woven shirts or amillas, snug jackets or huyunas, wide-brimmed hats or monteras, and long skirts. 
There they would throw down sheets of blue plastic or woven blankets in rows, and then pile onto them heaps of woven textiles they hoped to barter or sell. Beyond the town and past the sixteenth-century church set upon an ancient Inca palace rose terraced hills. To the north lay the sacred valley, and even farther out rose the sharply etched, snow-covered mountains of the Cordillera Vilcabamba. In the late 1970s, when the Francomots arrived in Chinchero, market days were still largely based on barter, with farmers exchanging corn for potatoes, potters exchanging ceramics for alpaca wool, herders from the highlands exchanging dried meat for coca leaves from the jungle, and so on. Some tourists occasionally arrived, despite the difficult road from Cusco, and paid for the women's weavings in cash. The weavers then used the cash to buy items that couldn't be so easily bartered for, medicines, for example, or books, pens, and pencils for their children attending the local school. For five-year-old Abby, the market with its piles of pungent herbs, vegetables, and meats, the people from nearby towns wearing their own distinctive hand-woven clothing and speaking Spanish or Quechua, the wandering sheep and goats and the live guinea pigs for sale were all something out of the pages of Alice in Wonderland. As a child I'd seen pictures that my parents had taken in Peru, and I'd heard all of these stories, so I was dying to go to Peru. I was just desperate to go. I thought it sounded like some kind of fantasy land. So when we went, I was really thrilled. It just seemed like a great place to be. The people were fantastic. I was useful. It didn't take that long to learn to speak the languages. I had jobs. I had value to my family and to my peer group and my community. I loved it there. In fact, I didn't want to go back to the U.S. Ed and Chris Francomont, meanwhile, didn't waste any time in trying to pick up local weaving techniques, the complexity and beauty of which completely fascinated both of them. Not long after moving to Chinchero, Ed began asking the town's weavers, who were all women, if they would teach him to weave. Most thought the request quite comical. After all, everyone knew that weavers began weaving when they were very young. Girls, and many boys, typically learn to spin yarn from alpaca or sheep's wool when five or six years old. By the time girls reach ten, they begin to learn to weave thin strips of cloth called hakimas on simple backstrap looms. At fourteen, girls have advanced to weaving complexly patterned chumpis, or belts. At eighteen, a common age to marry, a young woman is fully capable of weaving yikyas, kipirinas, ponchos, and other types of complexly woven cloths. And now here was this bearded twenty-seven-year-old man, a foreigner whose own weaving skills were rudimentary at best, who wanted to learn how to weave. It was enough to make the women laugh. One Sunday morning, however, Ed saw a young teenaged girl on the square selling her own weavings and stopped to inspect them. He was immediately impressed with their quality. The girl was seated and wore the typical black, white, and scarlet Montera hat that women in Chinchero wear. Ed watched as the girl deftly wove a small textile, only half finished, on a small loom. "'I'd like to buy that from you,' Ed told her. The girl looked up at him, not understanding. "'So that I can finish it.' he said. The girl smiled, shrugged, and eventually sold Ed the unfinished weaving. As she watched the strange gringo walk away, she shook her head in wonder. A week later, Ed returned to the market. He'd spent the first part of the week carefully examining the weaving, which still had its spools of colored thread attached to it. Eventually, he'd figured out how to finish it. Now he wanted to find the girl who had sold it to him, so that he could show her. Ed didn't know the girl's name, however, and was unable to find her. So he asked around, describing the girl to other women and showing the weaving he'd bought. "'Ah, that's Nilda,' a woman finally told him. "'Nilda Kayanalpa. The woman said the girl lived on a certain street, in such and such a house, and the door of the house was of such and such a color. Ten minutes later, Ed knocked at the door and Nilda opened it. "'I finished your weaving.' Ed said matter-of-factly. Will you teach me more? The girl at first didn't believe the gringo had finished it. Then, as she listened, she finally smiled and nodded. Yes, she said, I will teach you. 
And thus it was, on a certain Sunday morning in 1977, as the jagged peaks of the Vilcabamba Range glistened in the distance, llamas strolled the hills, and people haggled over exchanges in the nearby market, that a meeting occurred between Ed Francomont and Nilda Kayanalpa. It was a meeting that would not only change both of their lives, but would also change the future of traditional weaving in Peru. Juanita was by now fourteen and had been living in Cusco's Aklawasi, the house of the chosen women, for about four years. She still remembered the day when she and her mother had been walking down the street outside, the day when the Apupanaka, or imperial official, had seen her and had chosen her to be an Akla, or chosen woman. Not long afterward, her parents had accompanied Juanita to that same street, to that same imposing trapezoidal doorway she had once tried to peer through, wondering what lay within. Her mother had wept as they stopped before the door where an older priestess stood waiting. Her father, with his long earlobes and golden plugs, simply said he was proud that his daughter would now serve the son, but Juanita could see the sadness in his face. Juanita stared hard at both of them, fighting back tears, and then turned and followed the attendant inside. Juanita had already been told that neither she nor any of the other girls would ever be allowed visitors, so she knew upon entering that she would probably never see her family again. That night, trying to sleep on a pile of alpaca blankets in a cold stone room with other new girls beside her, Juanita quietly wept. Life in the Aklawasi, however, hidden as it was from the rest of the city, soon became routine. Juanita and other first-year girls would wake early to follow the instructions of the older temple priestesses, or mamaconas. The mamaconas taught them how to prepare various soups and stews, such as motipatasca, a corn soup flavored with chili peppers and herbs, locro, a stew made of fish, potatoes, vegetables, and peppers, and cornbread, or kanku, which Juanita learned to bake. She and the other girls also began the long process of learning how to use the various looms on which to weave kumpi, or royal cloth, the finest cloth that Juanita had ever seen. It was this cloth, made from either the finest alpaca or from pure vicuña wool, that the Inca emperor and his family wore. Kumpi cloth, too, was often burned in sacrifices for the gods, or used to clothe the sacred idols made from gold or silver. Juanita and the other girls soon began to learn about the numerous religious rituals, so many that it sometimes made her head spin, and were instructed in the nature of the various gods and the sacrifices needed in order to please them. Every morning, when the sun god woke, his first rays struck the large golden punchao, or sun idol, that had been placed prominently in a patio of the sun temple. The rays illuminated the glistening metal and immediately bathed the entire area in a rich golden light. Meanwhile, Juanita and the other aklas placed the food they'd prepared before the idol. As they made their offerings, the priestesses in attendance chanted, Son, eat this food that your wives have prepared for you. The rest of the food was for the priests and the numerous temple attendants, or was offered in sacrifices to other gods, such as Viracocha, the creator god, Iapo, the god of lightning, Pachamama, the earth goddess, or to Mama Kia, the goddess of the moon. Juanita soon discovered that there were about two hundred girls and priestesses living in the compound, most of them, like her, having been chosen when they were about ten years of age. All of them, here in Cusco at least, were the daughters of Inca nobles or native chiefs from the conquered territories. Juanita and the other girls had been selected because of their physical beauty and also because of their noble status. It was here that they were to be trained to become either priestesses or wives who would be given away to Inca nobles or valiant warriors. A small number of the new Aklas, Juanita was told, her eyes no doubt opening wide upon hearing this, would join the Inca emperor's harem, there to be bedded by the son of the sun god himself, perhaps to bear some of the emperor's children. A small number of new Aklas, Juanita also learned, and this time from whispered comments made by some of the older girls who had already become priestesses, would be sacrificed to the gods. 
Juanita was told not to worry, however, for if that were to happen, and it was the Inca emperor himself who would decide this, she was told, then those sacrificed would be the most fortunate, for their reward would be to join the gods and to enjoy with them a life of ease and abundance in the afterworld. When Juanita first heard this story, she trembled. The different possibilities for her future both fascinated and frightened her. As her nimble fingers practiced weaving a belt from fine alpaca fiber, Juanita fervently hoped that her own fate was not to become a sacrifice, or to join a harem, or even to become a temple mamacona, but rather to one day become a nobleman's wife. Only in that way, Juanita realized, would she ever be able to see her family again. She greatly missed them. Then, one morning, when Juanita was fourteen years old, she learned that this year, just after the great sun festival of Inti Raimi, she and the rest of the royal virgins would be presented to the emperor. It would be during that meeting, Juanita was told, that the emperor would decide their fates. When Nilda Cayanalpa was about four years old, her mother began to take her to the fields. There, her family raised some of the 880 different varieties of potatoes in the Chinchero area, as well as oyuku and oka and other root crops. By the time Nilda was six, her family trusted her to watch over their sheep flock. Nilda would walk long distances every day, nimbly climbing the rugged hillsides around Chinchero, the town sprawled out below, its market square visible along with the white rectangular tower of the 17th century adobe and stone church, Nuestra Señora de Montserrat, the bells of which would periodically ring out over the hills. It was during her wanderings that Nilda met another shepherdess, this one not a girl, but rather an ancient woman named Doña Sebastiana. The elderly woman, too, tended a flock of sheep during the day, and, like the other women in the area, wore the typical long pollera skirts and the flattened black, red, and white hat with its upturned rims that all Chinchero women wore, hats that both protected them from the sun and also clearly communicated which village they were from. Nilda often used to visit Doña Sebastiana's adobe home. There she would sit and watch as the woman's gnarled hands spooned out locro stew into two bowls, one of which she invariably set down for her inquisitive visitor. In a corner of the small living area, the woman had an old wooden loom, and on it was always strung a partially finished weaving, a manta cloth, or a chuspa bag, or a shawl, weavings invariably so beautiful that even as a young girl Nilda was taken aback by the old woman's dexterity and skill. Her spinning was so fine, and she spun so quickly that I dreamed at night of spinning, Nilda later wrote who is now fifty and divides her time between Chinchero and Cusco. That is where my love of handmade cloth began and my desire to learn from my elders. Nilda's own mother could weave, but Nilda's grandfather was Spanish, and her grandmother had thus taught Nilda's mother only to weave simple patterns for making generic cloth. As Nilda recounted, When I was growing up in Chinchero in the 1960s, traditional cloth had little value to the people in my village. The country folk still spun and wove, and the older and more traditional women of Chinchero as well. But in families with Spanish heritage, the men put on modern trousers to go to their jobs, and all the children wore modern clothes to school. To do otherwise would be looked down upon. Four hundred years earlier, Spanish conquistadors had conquered the Inca Empire and had seized not only the land but also the Quechua-speaking peasants, the Spaniards divided the peasants up among themselves like so many cattle, demanding that they pay tribute to their new masters. It wasn't until the 1960s, more than four long centuries later, that the Peruvian government finally undertook an agrarian reform that tried to redress some of the many injustices created by the original conquest. The Spanish language was by now dominant, having displaced Quechua, while other European institutions, such as the Catholic Church, a monetary economy, and European jurisprudence, were firmly implanted, like foreign grafts spliced into thick indigenous roots. Countless generations of Catholic priests, meanwhile, had done their best to exterminate the local religion, a practice referred to euphemistically as the extirpation of idolatries. 
While doing so, Spanish priests smashed idols, destroyed temples, raised sacred monuments, and built Spanish-style buildings on top of what remained. Other aspects of indigenous culture also gradually disappeared, such as how to read the knotted quipu cords, an information storage system that had been used in Peru for thousands of years, or how to cut, score, and position giant blocks of stone so deftly and without mortar that the resulting structures still astound visitors to this day. Even as late as the 1970s, when Andean children such as Nilda mandatorily attended state-run schools, students had to be careful not to make the mistake of speaking their own native language in classrooms, even in whispers. Otherwise, they were literally beaten by their teachers with sticks until they switched back to Spanish. In 1968, the Quechua-speaking Peruvian novelist José María Arguedas won the Inca Garquilaso de la Vega Literary Prize. The award was named after a 16th-century indigenous chronicler who wrote the first account of the Spanish conquest from a native point of view. In his acceptance speech, Arguedas made it clear that he was accepting the prize not only for himself, but also on behalf of the art and wisdom of a people who were considered to be degenerate and debilitated, or strange and impenetrable, but instead were really doing nothing less than becoming a great people, oppressed by being scorned socially, dominated politically, and exploited economically on their own soil, where they accomplished great feats for which history considered them a great people. They had been transformed into a corralled nation, isolated in order to be better and more easily managed, about which only those who had walled it in spoke, while viewing it from a distance with repugnance or curiosity. Despite centuries of Spanish dominance, however, native Quechua and or Aymara continued to be spoken by family members in homes scattered throughout the Andes. Meanwhile, in the nooks and crannies of Peru, and especially in the remote highlands, Numerous indigenous practices continued, such as the worship of sacred mountains and other gods, the maintenance of social structures such as the Ayu, and even the practice of traditional spinning and weaving. Yet, by the late 1960s, even as the novelist Arguedas was delivering his speech, this last practice was also falling into disuse, as inexpensive synthetic yarns and cloth manufactured on machines continued to infiltrate the Andes. Village men especially, who often had to travel to the cities in order to get jobs, were eager not to be viewed as country bumpkins, and thus began wearing western clothing instead of their traditional attire, the latter hand-woven and replete with the symbols and motifs of their ancestry. Faced with hanging on to traditions or shedding them in order to blend in better with the dominant culture, native Peruvians were increasingly at a crossroads, there was no reason, however, the novelist Argetus pointed out that the route followed by indigenous people in Peru had to be, nor was it possible that it should solely be, the one imperiously demanded by the plundering conquerors, that is, that the conquered nation should renounce its soul and take on the soul of the conquerors, that is to say, that it should become acculturated. I am not an acculturated man. I am a Peruvian who, like a cheerful demon, proudly speaks in Christian and in Indian, in Spanish and in Quechua. In technology, they, the Western world, will surpass us and dominate us. For how long, we do not know. But in art, we can already oblige them to learn from us, and we can do it without even budging from right here. As Argetus well knew, ancient South American coastal and Andean artists had produced some of the finest weavings ever created. Weavings fashioned on looms over 2,000 years old on the coast of Peru, for example, had thread counts of more than 600 threads per square inch, a feat not duplicated anywhere else until Europe's Industrial Revolution in the 19th century, and then only with machines. A typical burial ceremony among the Paracas culture on Peru's southern coast included wrapping a deceased relative in exquisite weavings that equaled some 300 square yards of cotton cloth, a quantity that required two acres of cotton plants to produce. More than a thousand years later, when the first Spanish conquistadors arrived in Peru, they quickly discovered that the Incas, too, produced enormous quantities of cloth, some of the finest the Spaniards had ever seen. 
Pedro Pizarro, a young cousin of the Spanish leader Francisco Pizarro, wrote, There were vast numbers of storehouses in Cusco when we entered the city, filled with very delicate cloth and with other coarser cloths, and stores of stools, of foodstuffs or coca leaves. There were also cloaks, completely covered with gold and silver chakiras, very delicate little beads, with no thread visible, like very dense chain mail, and there were storehouses of shoes with soles made of sisal and, the upper part of the shoes, of fine alpaca wool in many colors. By the time the Incas rose to power in the mid-1400s, woven cloth was as integral to their empire as coinage was to Rome. Inca citizens, both male and female, not only wove clothing for themselves, but also produced cloth for the Inca state as a required labor tax. The Incas wove three basic kinds of cloth, cosi, which had thread counts of roughly 120 threads per square inch, was coarsely woven from llama wool, and was mainly used for blankets. Awaska, a grade used for most clothing and fashioned from native cotton or alpaca wool, and kumpi, which was made from specially bred alpacas with very fine wool, or sometimes from vicuñas. It was Inca citizens who harvested the cotton or sheared the flocks, spun the thread, and wove. It was also from their labor that cloth and other goods filled the state warehouses to the ceilings. Especially fine weavings were produced by male weavers called kumpikamayuk, or keepers of fine cloth. The latter wove one of the highest grades of kumpi cloth worn by the nobility. Finally, the richest cloth of all, with thread counts surpassing six hundred and almost exclusively woven from vicuña wool, was woven by the chosen women of the sun, who lived as Juanita did in their nun-like aklawasi, or convents. It was the chosen women, instructed in the arts of weaving since they were young girls, who wove the finest embroidered clothing for the emperor and the emperor's principal wife, or koya. The chosen women often interwove into the cloth tiny beads of gold or silver, iridescent hummingbird feathers, or other precious materials. According to the seventeenth-century priest and chronicler Bernabe Cobo, the Inca king wore a cloak and a shirt with sandals on his feet. In this respect he followed the custom of the common people, but his clothing was different from the usual, in that it was made of the finest wool and the best cloth that was woven in his whole kingdom, with more brilliant colors and finer quality weaving. The Mamaconas, the older chosen women, made this clothing for him, and most of it was made from vicuña wool, which is almost as fine as silk. Some of his clothes were ordinary and simple. Other clothing was very colorful and showy, with very small feathers woven into it, and still other clothing was covered with ornaments of gold, emeralds, and other precious stones. This was the finest formal attire, and corresponds to our embroidery, cloth of gold or silver, and brocades. Within eighteen years of the conquest, however, Spanish chroniclers wrote that the production of kumpi cloth, as fine as the finest European silk, was already a dying art, as such cloth was destined for the noble classes, and the noble classes themselves were quickly disappearing. And yet, even as the power and influence of the Inca rulers gradually faded, the traditional art of weaving continued in hamlets and villages across Peru, Peasants continued making clothes for themselves down through the centuries, just as they had long before the emergence of the Incas. It wasn't until the appearance of synthetic thread and inexpensive manufactured cloth in the mid-twentieth century, however, that the production of traditional cloth for the first time began to falter. Connected to a cash economy and wanting to earn money more quickly, Peruvian weavers began to abandon the more time-consuming ancient traditions, and instead began adopting styles and methods that produced more goods, although of lower artistic quality. The Quechua-speaking community of Chinchero was inevitably caught up in the midst of these great tidal sweeps of globalization and modernity, as was young Nilda Cayanalpa. Nevertheless, Nilda continued to teach herself how to spin and weave in the ancient tradition, the movements of her fingers mirroring the fingers of thousands of her ancestors, guided in the present by the influence of the elderly shepherdess Doña Sebastiana. 
After several years of full-time herding, Nilda had finally begun school at the age of eight. The state-run school consisted of a series of rectangular adobe buildings whose classrooms had wooden desks and a single light bulb that hung from the ceiling. From the very beginning, Nilda proved to be an excellent student, applying herself to her studies while continuing her independent study of weaving. As she later wrote, my father was insistent that I study hard and spend time on my homework. I enjoyed learning in school, but at the same time I was developing my interest in traditional weaving. My father would come back from trips bringing cloth from distant villages, and each piece was unique. How was that made? I would ask myself. I experimented, trying techniques I had seen older women doing. I did this late at night, in my room, when my father thought I was studying. My mother knew what I was doing and did not discourage me, but my father would say, Weaving will never make you prosperous. Nilda persisted, however, and by the time she was a young teenager, she'd begun to sell her weavings at Chinchero's Sunday market. I continued learning to weave in the traditional style like a crazy person, she said, not because I was thinking about money, but just because I was so interested. One would have thought that Chinchero's older generation of weavers, those who were witnessing the gradual decline and disappearance of their craft, would have approved of a young girl's interest in their old-fashioned methods. Yet the encouragement of Doña Sebastiana proved to be the exception. You would think the grandmothers would have been the very people to have said, Oh, how marvelous! Look at her learn to weave, Nilda said but instead they told me that weaving was something to do on the side, that this is never going to make any real money, that at best it would merely allow me to survive. They acted like it was almost stupid for a young person to be spending so much time learning to do this, that I should be thinking of other things. For Nilda, however, weaving had long since become a passion. She loved the feel, she loved the textures, she loved the challenge of it. Now a young teenager, Nilda was not only a quick study, but she also soon realized that Chinchero's Sunday market was a kind of natural laboratory. There she could experiment with whether the skills she was learning had any effect on tourists or not. Instead of using synthetic yarns, Nilda continued to make ever more complex weavings from alpaca or sheep's wool, mostly using ancient designs, and on Sundays she sold them. It was while she was at the Market Square one Sunday when she was fourteen that Ed Francomont approached her with his unusual proposition. A week later, Nilda says, he knocked on the door of my house and said, Look, I finished your belt. At first I didn't believe him. I said, No, it's impossible that you finish that. I don't believe you. None of the tourists I'd met knew anything about weaving, and besides, he was a man. But he finally convinced me and asked me if I would teach him. And that's how I met Ed Francomont. Conch shells blasted the air, signifying the emperor's arrival on Cusco's packed square, the square filled with nobles and priests wearing colorful tunics, golden bracelets, and ear spools. Beneath everyone's sandaled feet lay fine white beach sand, brought up from the coast on the backs of llamas, inside woven sacks, then emptied and spread out over the square. The sand symbolized the connection between the mountains and Mamacocha, the mother sea. Here and there on the sand lay embedded sacred pink spondylos shells from the northern sea coast, as if they had washed up into the Andes. Also scattered about were gold and silver figurines of llamas, alpacas, foxes, and other animals that craftsmen had created in smoldering forges on the outskirts of the capital, Juanita and the other Aklas of her age group strained to see over the crowd and catch a glimpse of the emperor, Topa Inca Yupanqui, son of the sun god and conqueror of so many distant peoples and lands. Juanita strained, too, to look in the direction of the adjacent streets that led onto the square. These were crowded with townspeople, men, women, and children. Juanita was hoping to catch a glimpse of her father or mother or members of her family, Last year, at this same festival, she had seen her father in the distance, for the first time since she'd entered the Aklawasi. Her father had held his hand up, but Juanita had been commanded, along with the other Aklas, not to make any gestures in return. In any case, today, Juanita knew, her fate was to be decided. 
and since the last full moon she and the other girls had wondered aloud in whispers among themselves as to what might become of them, which among them might be wedded to the emperor, which to the son as a temple priestess, which to a royal noble or to a renowned warrior, and which among them, they asked one another, in even lower whispers, would become an akla kapakocha, or sacrifice. Juanita stood on her toes and tried to see over people's heads. She was just able to see the sun-priest, or Wiyak Umu, who stood near the emperor. During this month of Inti Raimi, when the days were shortest and the sun-god farthest in his sacred journey to the north, the priest held his hands up toward the glowing orb in the sky and beseeched him to return, to warm their fields and crops, to give them life, sustenance, and blessings. O son, our father! the priest cried out, as the crowd hushed, and the emperor, wearing his royal yunku tassel over his forehead and clothed in a sumptuous vicuña cloak, stood alongside. Our father, who said, Let there be Cusco, and by your will it was founded, and it is preserved with such grandeur. Let these sons of yours, he said, gesturing toward the emperor, the Incas, be conquerors and despoilers of all mankind. We adore you and offer this sacrifice to you, so that you will grant us what we beg of you. Let them be prosperous and make them happy, and do not allow them to be conquered by anyone, but let them always be conquerors, since you made them for that purpose. Juanita watched as incense and smoke rose into the air, and then as a priest led six pure white alpacas, with woven red tassels hanging from their ears through the crowd toward the high priest. Juanita could also see four previous Inca emperors, desiccated now and sitting in an upright fashion and still richly clothed, carried on litters by attendants. The mummified emperors seemed to look out over the square, which was lined on all sides with massive gray stone palaces. Servants with whisks stood by the former emperors, making sure flies didn't bother them. They're sacrificing the alpacas, Kispe, her best friend, whispered. Kispe had entered the Aklawasi the same year she had. Then they'll make the selection. As the alpacas disappeared, one by one, pulled to the ground and sacrificed by the priests with bronze knives that quickly turned red, Juanita turned again to scan the crowds in the streets, staring hard at the faces. Then, just as she had about given up, she saw a familiar figure. There was no mistaking it. Their eyes locked. It was her father. It's a half-hour bus ride from Cusco to the town of Chinchero, where a paved road eventually shortened the journey in 1982. It's November, which is simultaneously springtime and the beginning of the rainy season in the Andes. The bus winds its way past fields where farmers still slice the earth with wooden plows pulled by oxen, or else punch holes in the ground with Inca-style foot-plows called chacatacia. November is also potato planting season, so the fields are brown now with furrows, and also with tiny expectant tubers that lie in wait for the rains. An old woman on the seat across from me clutches a woven blue bag of small lilac-colored potatoes. The potatoes are rumpled in texture and are almost as wrinkled as her brown hands. I ask her what kind they are. Potatoes originated in the Andes, and Peru has a mind-numbing 5,000 varieties of them. It's difficult for most foreigners, including myself, to tell them apart. Chuño, the woman says, smiling and revealing two gold-capped upper teeth. For soup. Chuños are potatoes that have been left outside to alternately freeze and dry in the sun, a process that is repeated over and over again until a nearly waterless tuber remains. The technique was invented in the Andes thousands of years ago and has subsequently been exported as the freeze-drying process known to the rest of the world. After a week of such treatment, the potatoes and other tubers can be stored for decades. The old woman hands me a three-inch long chuño. I cup it in my hand. It's as light as a piece of styrofoam. A half hour later I arrive in Chinchero, the ancient Inca settlement and political province located on a high plain near the sacred valley. 
Chinchero was once the site of the Inca emperor Topa Inca Yupanqui's royal residence, which he had built sometime in the late fifteenth century. When the Spaniards conquered the area, two peasant communities lived near the cluster of finely hewn royal buildings and terraces, each belonging to a different ayu. The Spaniards quickly built a Christian church on top of the remains of Topa Inca's royal palace, then forced the two native communities to join together and relocate nearby, so that they would be easier to control. It was from those two relocated communities that the town of Chinchero was born. Today is Sunday. Chinchero's market is in full force, and the strong tropical sunshine splashes everywhere. Men wear black ojota sandals, brown, black, or gray pants, and jackets or colorfully woven ponchos. Some older men wear knitted chuyos on their heads that look like ski hats, a tassel hanging from their tops. Women are for the most part dressed as they have dressed for at least a century, with multiple pollera skirts, woven shawls of alpaca, and depending on which village they are from, a variety of hats. The streets of the town are narrow, cobblestoned, and bordered by row houses of adobe or brick, the walls of which have been plastered over with lime. Inca ruins emerge here and there alongside the streets, and the nearby hills are scored with Inca terraces still in use. At the entrance to the market stands an old colonial portal, and on either side women are gathered. The women have long black hair woven into two braids with a tassel of black yarn tying the braided ends together. They sit or stand beside knee-high stacks of fresh green barley which they are selling. Barley is an old-world import, and its color contrasts sharply with the oranges, reds, and ochres of the women's clothing. The ancient cereal is used to make beer, and is also fed to one of the New World's few domesticated animals, the Andean guinea pig, or cuy. The small rodents are often served on a plate, roasted and splayed, with their arms and legs stretching out, looking like roadkill. Cui live in people's homes, scavenging about on the floor for scraps of food and emitting occasional squeaks. Ancient Andean peoples domesticated the tasty rodents at least seven thousand years ago. The cui, easy to breed, were later used in lab experiments in the eighteenth and nineteenth centuries before scientists ultimately switched to mice and rats. Hence the expression of not wanting to be used as a guinea pig. On Chinchero's market square I ask a young girl selling weavings where I can find the Centro de Textiles Tradicionales, or weaving cooperative, founded by Nilda Cayanalpa, the same woman who, as a young girl, once sold her own weavings here. I'm interested in the story of Juanita, the Inca ice maiden, and Nilda, I'm told, has some unusual knowledge about the girl, specifically about the clothes she was wearing when she was discovered. But first, I have to find her. Nilda should be at the centro, the girl tells me, pointing in the direction I should go. She then returns to weaving a small belt. Unlike most girls in Chinchero, Nilda not only finished grade school and middle school, but she also finished high school. She had then gone on to do the unthinkable. She enrolled in college in Cusco and graduated. Nilda was the first woman in Chinchero to do so. Her old friends, the Francomonts, meanwhile, had by this time returned to the United States, although the two families had remained in contact. As soon as Nilda graduated from college, Ed and Chris Francomont told her about a travel grant she could apply for that would allow her to spend six months in the United States and teach weaving there. Nilda was, after all, not only a college graduate, but also a master weaver who specialized in traditional Andean techniques. At the time Nilda applied for and got the grant, she spoke only Quechua and Spanish and had never traveled beyond Cusco. I didn't speak English, Nilda later told me. Not a word. It was my first time in an airplane, my first time in Lima, my first time for everything. In the United States, Nilda was surprised to find such intense interest in her weaving, a fact that only served to reinforce her belief in the value of studying local weaving traditions traditions that were continuing to fade as, one by one, the older generation of weavers passed away. "'Young people were not learning to weave,' Nilda says. "'The only good quality weavings you could find in markets were used ones, forty, fifty, or sixty years old.' Nilda's trip to the United States, 
coupled with her own understanding of the tourist market in Chinchero, got her to thinking. What if she taught a group of young weavers in Chinchero how to weave in the ancient style? And what if they wove using traditional dyes, threads, and looms, and tried selling high-quality weavings, like those created a generation ago? What if together they formed a cooperative and shared their earnings with one another? Creating a cooperative became my dream, Nilda says, but everyone I spoke to about it, except for Ed and Chris, Frank Amont, said it was impossible. Only Ed volunteered to help. As I walk across Chinchero Square, women have set out their weavings and sit patiently beside them, ready to bargain. Tourists mill about, some haggling, others walking off with brightly embroidered bags meant to carry coca leaves or else with square weavings called mantas, used as a shawl to protect against the Andes' often bitter nighttime cold. Without clothing, of course, the Andes could never have been inhabited in the first place. And what better material to use than wool fibers that evolution has taken millions of years to produce? A few blocks away, up a stone-lined street, I find a sign on a wall beside a large double door. Centro de Textiles Tradicionales. Inside I discover a large grassy courtyard. Perhaps a hundred people are milling about. Weavers and weaving aficionados from around the world. Some come from Bolivia, others from Ecuador, Colombia, Guatemala, the United States, Canada, and various European countries. Sprinkled among them are Quechua-speaking women from nine local villages who sell their weavings through the cooperative. The women wear traditional long skirts and broad flat hats, the colors and designs distinctive to each village. This week, the center run by Nilda Kayanalpa, is hosting a semi-annual tinkui, which in Quechua means encounter. Attendees have found their way to this weaver's gathering from all over the world. Buildings with tile roofs and stuccoed exteriors surround the courtyard. The stucco is ochre-colored, and the buildings house offices, storerooms, and additional rooms for visiting weavers. Under a portico squats the cooperative's retail store, a large rectangular shop stacked with high-quality weavings, fresh off the loom. In an adjacent area, I find Nilda Kayanalpa standing before a large steaming cauldron. She's in the middle of giving a demonstration in natural dyeing techniques to a group of foreign weavers. Nilda is short and stocky, with black hair pulled back in a single braid, She's fifty, but looks about forty, with not a trace of gray hair. In the distance, the Urubamba Mountains rise up, some of their jagged peaks ice-capped. The highest, Mount Sulkantai, reaches over twenty thousand feet. The word Sulkantai comes from the Quechua word Salke, which means wild, uncivilized, or savage. Salkantai, perhaps not surprisingly, is the most sacred peak in the region and is home to a powerful local god, or Apu. You can make a dye in any quantity, Nilda is saying, in Spanish-accented English. But just be sure to use the same proportions. Once it's heated, the dye is ready. Nilda takes a bundle of spun white alpaca wool and places it into a waist-high metal vat filled with a bubbling black liquid. The dye's color comes from a fungus that Nilda is teaching the crowd how to use. About forty weavers from around the world watch carefully, taking notes or filming on small video recorders or phones. As Nilda stirs the vat, she tells her audience the story of how she discovered this black dye in a remote community in the cloud forest. There was only one elderly man, Nilda says, stirring the black brew with a long wooden pole, who remembered how they used to make this. He took me out into the forest and showed me a tree that had a black fungus growing on it. They hadn't used the fungus in years. Out in the courtyard, during a break, the women from the cooperative begin serving lunch, one of them wearing a bright, colorful red-and-black outfit that is typical of Chinchero, hands me a plate of roasted guinea pig with a side of small, freeze-dried chuño potatoes. The potatoes have been rehydrated. Would you like a mate de coca? Coca leaf tea? she asks. I nod, and she returns with a steaming cup and a big smile. The feeling here is of a big family reunion, the colorfully dressed women milling about the more drably dressed foreigners, like so many brightly plumaged birds. 
A pair of obviously foreign women walk over and occupy two empty chairs next to me. One is lean and gray-haired, in her sixties, the other blonde and rubenesque, about forty. They both have plates of guinea pig and potatoes, and both are from the United States. They introduce themselves. I'm Chris, says the elder one, the mother. I'm Abby, says her daughter, smiling. Their last name, it turns out, is Frankamont. At twelve thousand four hundred feet, as we work our way through plates of guinea pig, a rodent that's tasty yet full of small bones, the Frankamonts fill me in on their lives since leaving Peru. Abby now lives in Ohio, has a son, and owns a weaving studio. Chris lives in Connecticut and is retired. Ed Frankamont, they tell me, was diagnosed with bone cancer in 2002. He passed away in 2004 at the age of 59. I miss him every day. Abby says. In the last year of his life, Abby says, Ed was working hard to help raise funds to purchase the store the cooperative now owns in Cusco on the grounds of the old Inca Sun Temple, or Coricancha. The man who'd once bought an unfinished textile from a teenaged Andean weaver ultimately shared that girl's dream of not allowing an ancient weaving tradition to die. He didn't live to see the cooperative's inauguration, Abby says but he was pretty confident it was going to work out. He would have loved to have seen it and how it's grown. It's funny how things come full circle, she says, looking around. If my parents hadn't met on an archaeological dig in Ancon, I don't think any of this would ever have happened. We speak for a while of sickness and losing fathers. I tell Abby that until my own father died, I never understood what anyone else went through when something as tragic as that occurs. She agrees. At first, I couldn't understand why some people's condolences bothered me and why others really mattered, she said, until I realized that the ones that really mattered were from people who had experienced the same thing. Abby's father had suffered from bum knees, she says, reminiscing. It was a condition she believes she inherited from him. One day, when she was a girl in Chinchero, she wrenched one of her knees. Her neighbors quickly took her to a local curandero, an older man named Lorenzo. I dislocated my knee so badly that it bent forward toward me, Abby says. Lorenzo was this fantastic bone and joint guy who people from all around came to visit. He was a curandero, so he had this whole spiritual realm thing going as well. They brought me in. He took a big swig of cane alcohol and coca leaves and chewed them all up together into a paste and spit it onto my knee. It went numb pretty quick, because that's basically like morphine. Then he put my kneecap back in place. My dad was there, and he'd had surgery for this same problem. In his case, he couldn't walk for weeks. But Lorenzo got me back walking again within days. My dad was amazed. Lorenzo was not only a talented physical therapist, Abby says, but he was also able to foretell people's futures and could rid their bodies of evil spirits. He did so with coca leaves. Did Lorenzo ever read leaves for you? I ask. He did, when I was fourteen, Abby says, referring to the process of casting a handful of coca leaves onto the ground and carefully studying their arrangement. In the end, he said, and I remember this very distinctly, he said, you know, I have to tell you something that's going to be hard, hard for you to hear and hard for you to accept, but it's going to be okay. Abby had looked at him, not comprehending. I have to tell you that you will have only one child, and it will be a son, he said, gathering the leaves up and replacing them in his bag. He then looked at her carefully. But the son will live. Abby looks at me and laughs. So the bad news was that I was only going to have one child, but the good news was that he would live. Years later, on a visit to Chinchero with her son, who was ten years old at the time, Abby ran into Lorenzo. The old curandero, although aged and stooped, immediately recognized her. Abby introduced her son to the old man, who nodded knowingly. And you still have just the one, no? he asked. Abby nodded. But don't worry, he will live, the old man said, remembering. Lorenzo passed away five or six years ago, Abby says, taking his gift of prophecy with him. 
I ask Abby if she knows the story of Juanita, the ice maiden, and Abby nods. Do you remember making offerings when you lived here? I ask. Yes, you would always share your food and your drink with Pachamama, the Earth Mother, she says. That was just a part of the way of thinking about things. Like on All Saints' Day, when you take food to your dead family members in the graveyard and leave it there for them, people would make offerings. It's kind of like Catholics burning candles, asking for this and that. It's very personal. There's this sense of sharing what you've got with the whole surroundings, with the mountains you live with. I mean, everyone sort of has a mountain that owns them, Abby says. And of course, I have one too. I ask her how she first discovered that. Well, you just know, she says. You just know. Mine is called Kilka, and it's here in Chinchero. If you stand looking at the old church, it's right behind it in the distance. When she was a young girl living here, Abby explains, she used to have dreams of being abandoned by her parents and of being separated from the people she cared about. In her dreams, she visited the far side of Kilka Mountain, where she'd never been before, and it was there that she was reunited with her parents and friends. The strange thing is, when she eventually visited the far side of the mountain, it was exactly like what she had seen in her dreams. At the time, she'd told her Quechua-speaking girlfriends about this. They immediately knew what her dreams meant. "'Well, it's obvious,' they said. "'You belong to Apu Kilka. The Apu mountain spirit owns you now.' Abby finishes her plate of guinea pig and sets it down beside her. "'Auntie Kilka still shows up in my dreams,' she says matter-of-factly. I ask Abby what struck her most about growing up in this small Andean town— she thinks a bit before speaking. When I think of being homesick for a place, it's for this town and this community. It's where I feel like I'm from, even though clearly I'm not. But this is where the formative things happened to me, where I used to hang out in the hills with the other shepherd girls, and where I learned how to weave. Even now, living in Ohio and an American, my loyalty is to this town and to my community. It owns me to a great extent. And I think it's partly because this is a culture of people who never looked at anybody based on how they appeared or how they looked and made all of these judgments. Everybody was just a person with the same needs. I feel comfortable in saying that our family would not have made it here were it not for the people of Chinchero and their belief that we were a young family in need of help and that we were in their community and thus belonged to them. They felt a responsibility to bring us up to speed, and we felt a responsibility toward them. They shared what they had with us. I don't know anywhere else that's like that. So this is the place, and these are the people I get homesick for. Chinchero is where I feel at home. I ask Abby if her father felt the same way, or if it was different for her parents as adults. My dad was pretty good at learning languages and getting along with people. He was remarkably charismatic. He could get along with anyone from any walk of life. But it was my mom who had the obsession for Peru. My dad always liked to say that he just went along for the ride. But he fell in love with Peru, too. Her father was a doer, she said. For some reason, he always ended up in a leadership position. People relied upon him. Abby remembers how surprised she was at the sheer number of people who showed up at his memorial service and who said that, when they were undergoing extremely stressful moments, they would ask themselves silently, what would Ed do? Abby particularly remembers a man who showed up who'd lived on the commune with them as a troubled teen. As a young man, he'd later joined the Merchant Marine and had worked his way up to captain. There was many a time, he told the audience, that as a captain guiding his ship through heavy seas, he would suddenly stop and say, Now what would Ed do in this situation? And he would do exactly what he thought Ed would have done. The funny thing, Abby says, is that my dad was never in the Merchant Marine, nor did he know a thing about sailing. He was decisive, Abby says. He didn't spend a lot of time sitting around wondering if something could be pulled off, my father was the kind of guy who would pack up and move his family to Peru with a few hundred dollars in his pocket, and he would say, We can swing it. We can figure it out. And that's exactly what he did. 
she says. You know, it's amazing how interconnected so many things are in life. It's amazing to see all these things come together and work out. It's just remarkable. She looks around at the people milling about, chatting with one another, sharing their passion for weaving, all of them from a kaleidoscope of backgrounds. I mean, how much more in life can people really ask for, Abby says, than to know that what they did made a difference? Juanita could scarcely believe what she'd seen. Already, standing in Cusco's great square, she'd watched as a small group of aklas had knelt before the emperor and the sun-priest had bidden them to rise. For the temple, is all the emperor had said, and the girls had immediately realized that they would spend the rest of their lives in the aklawasi, where they had already spent the last four years. The priests had then brought another group of girls forward, the audience silent, the length and breadth of the square. Once again the emperor had lifted his hand, his robe shimmering with the tiny feathers of hummingbirds that had been sewn into the immaculate cloth. For the nobility, he'd uttered, his eyes gazing down upon girls now destined to become the wives of various nobles and warriors. Juanita found it difficult to breathe, and her skin felt cold. Already the emperor had selected Aklas to become temple priestesses and others to become nobles' wives. Now all that was left were those who would be selected for the emperor's harem and those who were to be sacrificed. Juanita stared hard at a small seashell lying in the beach sand next to her sandals and uttered a silent prayer to Mama Cocha, goddess of a vast sea she'd heard of yet had never seen. Juanita's friend Quispe stood close beside her, wearing her woven tunic of burnt umber colors. Juanita could clearly feel Quispe's body trembling. Juanita wanted to look back, to look over the crowd, to see if she could see her father again. There was no doubt that he was here, watching. Was her mother here somewhere, too? Here he comes, Quispe whispered, referring to a temple priest who somehow seemed to know which girls were to be formed into which groups. Juanita watched as the priest held out his arm, parting the remaining aklas into two groups. On whichever side his arm pointed, the girls moved to the left or right. Quispe tried pushing against Juanita, but the priest approached, and his arm pointed directly between them. Reluctantly, Juanita's friend moved away, then stole a fearful glance backward toward Juanita as her group approached the emperor. It was all Juanita could do not to look left, over the crowd, in the direction of her father. Before the emperor and the high priest, Quispe and the other girls knelt. The emperor gazed over the crowd, swept his eyes over their bent heads, then looked up at the sky. Juanita stole a glance at the emperor's royal headband, which only he wore. It had a fringe of scarlet-colored alpaca fibers dangling from it, each interwoven around a small golden ornament that glistened in the sun. Juanita held her breath as the emperor stretched his arm out toward the group of aklas kneeling before him. Silence descended once again upon the square. For the harem, the emperor said. Juanita's eyes opened wide. She looked hard at the back of Quispe's head. Several girls around her let out deep sighs. Juanita's head spun, and suddenly she felt weak as she watched Quispe's group head off. Her own group, quite small and the only one remaining, was now led forward. In a daze, Juanita knelt with the others before the priest and the emperor as the other groups had done before. Akla Kapakocha, the emperor said simply, his eyes dark and solemn. Chosen women sacrifices. The crowd was hushed before the high altitude tableau of the small knot of girls now destined to join the gods, wordless before the presence of their emperor and the newly appointed offerings. The sacrifices to the sun had been dutifully made. The Akla Kapakochas had been selected. The world was as it should be, as it had always been, ever since the first Inca emperor had brought forth the world from darkness and had given civilization to the world. The son of the sun-god, having spoken, now stepped on to his royal litter, seated himself on his duo, then was lifted up and borne away toward his palace. Juanita, 
walking across the square with the other girls and through a crowd that now parted respectfully before them, the specially chosen ones, felt her legs growing weak. And then, suddenly, blackness overcame her. Weaving in this way is beautiful, says Nilda Kayanalpa. She's seated in an office at the Centro de Textiles Tradicionales in Chinchero, which is now one of nine centers, each run by a local community of weavers. It's not solely about weaving and making money, she says. It's about staying in one's own community. It's about bringing alive traditions of all types, including languages. It's about relearning things that have been lost in agriculture and in the arts. It's all of those things. What we do is not going to make anyone rich, but what we do is rich in traditions, rich in knowledge, rich in art. In 1979, when Nilda was 19, Ed and Chris Frankamont helped the Chinchero community establish a local museum dedicated to promoting traditional Chinchero culture. Four years later, the Frankamonts, with the help of Earth Watch volunteers, began a systematic, multidisciplinary study of all of the Chinchero district's flora, assembling in the process a team of international botanists, among them Harvard ethnobotanists Timothy Plowman and Wade Davis, anthropologists, Ed and Chris Frankamont, and native Quechua speakers from Chinchero. The study ran off and on for nearly a dozen years, and ultimately became the largest of its kind. Nilda, meanwhile, after graduating college in Cusco, began leading tours of foreign weavers visiting Peru as a way of earning a living. She also continued to visit nearby communities to learn local weaving techniques. In some communities, she discovered, weaving traditions were literally hanging by a thread, with only one or two elderly people who knew how to weave in the traditional manner. There had to be some way to create an organization, she realized, to help preserve these traditions before they completely disappeared. The time was not right, however, as beginning in 1980 a fierce guerrilla war had broken out between the Maoist Shining Path guerrilla insurgency and Peru's government, a struggle centered in the south-central Andes. Many of the guerrillas were native Quechua speakers. At least some of them fought believing in the Andean myth of Incari, the resurrection of the Inca state. That myth began to emerge after the execution of the Inca emperor Atahualpa by the Spaniards in 1533. According to legend, Atahualpa was said to have vowed to avenge his death, and the Spaniards were said to have buried the Inca emperor's body in different parts of the empire in order to prevent that from occurring. They thus buried the emperor's legs in the Andes, in Ayacucho, his head beneath what is now the presidential palace in Lima, and his arms under the Huacaypata, or Square of Tears, in Cusco. One day, the legend proclaimed, the parts would reassemble themselves, and Atahualpa would rise from the ground, re-establishing the rule of the Inca and restoring the pre-invasion harmony that had ended with the conquest. The war was brutal, Nilda says, and it touched everybody. People's friends disappeared. Some were captured by the shining path and forced to fight. Others were killed or captured by the army. Everyone was afraid. Given the increasing negative publicity, foreigners were afraid of visiting Peru. The normal flood of tourists to Cusco soon shrank to a mere trickle. In 1992, the government finally captured Abimael Guzman, the guerrilla movement's leader, but by then more than 70,000 people had died in the struggle. Slowly, ever so slowly, Peru's economy began to recover, and with it, tourism began to flow again. It was time once more for Nilda to think of realizing her dream. In 1995, Cultural Survival, a UK-based organization dedicated to helping indigenous people defend their lands, languages, and cultures, sponsored Nilda to help protect and revive the backstrap loom traditions in the Chinchero and Cusco areas. Called the Chinchero Culture Project, the idea was for Nilda to begin researching and documenting the various weaving techniques that were quickly disappearing. Nilda had only recently returned from a trip to the United States, where she had worked with the Peabody Museum at Harvard University, the Museum of Textiles in Toronto, 
the Center for International Studies at the University College of Cape Breton, and the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. By now, she was a university graduate, fluent in English, Spanish, and Quechua, and a master weaver, and she possessed several additional qualities that would serve her well during the coming years. She was a born leader and organizer. Abby Frankemont, in fact, remembers Nilda chastising Abby and her other eight-year-old girlfriends when they had tried to sell their small weavings at Chinchero's Sunday market. Nilda, Abby says, who was perhaps fifteen or sixteen at the time, would come over when girls were thinking about cutting corners and doing something half-assed to make a sale, and she would quietly say something like, You know, is that really work that you feel good about? Then she'd walk away. Or she'd come over and say, Oh, really? You're going to sell that for how much to make a sale? If you sell all of your weavings for that price, then you won't have enough money to buy material and you'll be out of business. Does that seem like a good long-range plan? And we would all look at one another and say, Uh-oh. She had that kind of presence as a girl. In fact, we all looked up to her and wanted to be how Nilda was and wanted to be able to do the things that Nilda could do. We used to say, Well, I hope that I'm going to grow up to be as good a teenaged girl as Nilda. Years later, when Abby worked for a stint in California as a software developer, before she turned full-time to weaving, she was always amazed at how well Nilda fit into any given situation. When I was at my Silicon Valley job, Nilda once called me up and said, Meet me at the Stanford Alumni Center for lunch. And I would say, Oh, I didn't realize that you were here. And then, at other times, she'd take me to the most remote, 15,000-foot mud hut you could possibly find, and would sit around and hang out with people. She's equally at home in either of those settings. She's inspirational and empowering, and a lot of the time you don't even think about whether what she's suggesting you do is feasible or not. You just do it, and somehow it works out. Tim Wells, a 62-year-old weaver and artist, first met Nilda at an Andean textile workshop Ed Frankemont was teaching at the De Young Museum in San Francisco in the late 1990s. Nilda had been in the area for other purposes and decided to stay a few extra days in order to help out Ed, recalls Tim. So for the three days she was there, helping people learn to do Andean weaving, mainly belts and things like that. Nilda had already begun her project to preserve traditional techniques in Chinchero, and Ed wanted her to tell the class about that. So, on the last day, Ed gave this introduction, and Nilda basically thanked him and walked away. She just kept helping with the class. Nilda was too humble. She had no intention of mentioning the project. She said she was there to help people weave, and that was it. Wells, however, was interested in the project and introduced himself. The more he heard, the more he wanted to volunteer to help out. First, however, he called up two seasoned community organizers who had recently accompanied Nilda to some remote Andean communities. Nilda had been there to discuss the idea of the communities forming a weaving cooperative and joining together in a common effort. Different villages, Wells says, have different histories, and their inhabitants belong to different Ayus, so the politics involved can be quite delicate. The two organizers had already worked in Chile and Ecuador, Wells said, but when they returned they were flabbergasted. They told me in a nutshell that Nilda was the most effective community organizer they had ever met. Wells soon traveled to Peru and volunteered, and has been doing so off and on for the last twelve years. It wasn't until 1996, however, that Nilda's ideas finally gelled and she decided to establish a weaving cooperative, not in Chinchero, but in Cusco, which the vast majority of tourists visited on their way to Machu Picchu. As Nilda later wrote in her book, Weaving in the Peruvian Highlands, I had been going out into other communities in the Cusco department for some time to look at textiles. I realized that in some areas textiles were disappearing or changing, and that these traditional techniques should be preserved. I believe that locating a museum in Chinchero would limit that effort. So I thought, what if I dream of a bigger project? What would be the next step? And these questions 
led to the idea of locating a center in Cusco, one that would represent the weaving of many parts of the Department of Cusco. We called it the Center for Traditional Textiles of Cusco. The center's overall purpose, Nilda envisioned, would be to help preserve and celebrate Andean textiles, a tradition that has been carried on for thousands of years. At the same time, she wanted to help improve the economies of the different villages that participated. Rather than have young women leave their communities and emigrate to large, deracinated cities such as Lima, what if they could supplement their income substantially by carrying on an ancient tradition right in their own villages, among their friends, families, and ayus? Nilda began in Chinchero, gathering a group of women and encouraging them to begin making high-quality traditional textiles made from hand-spun fibers and natural dyes. There had to be an incentive, however, and that incentive was being able to sell their weavings for a price commensurate with the added time and labor invested. Nilda provided the venue through the cooperative store in Cusco, she then sought to expand the market by soliciting museums and other institutions to place orders. Slowly, the orders began to trickle in. Eventually, Nilda visited other communities whose weaving traditions were in danger of disappearing and pitched them the idea of forming their own cooperatives. At first, Nilda tells me, there were just a few villages. Then there was a handful. Today, there are nine communities, each with its own cooperative, Together, the cooperative employs about 800 master weavers. The weavings they produce currently find their way into local stores, into the Center for Traditional Textiles store in Cusco, and, through the Center's website, into museums and collector's hands around the world. For young women, and some men, who have not finished their public schooling, a requirement of joining the cooperative is to do just that, to complete their schooling. It's not an apprenticeship says Tim Wells. And that comes from Nilda, because she realizes that the future lies in education. Each cooperative can do what it wants with the members' earnings. The cash produced can thus be divided individually or else used for communal purposes, which is an ancient Andean tradition. In one of the participating communities, Acha Alta, Wells was stunned by the village's location. It's 5,000 feet up from the valley floor, he says, they grow incredible potatoes and herd alpacas. It's an extremely harsh climate. All their water is glacial runoff. In this particular community, the villagers use a supplementary warp technique and create weavings in various shades of reds and ochres, all from natural dyes. They took their extra income, Wells says, and set up an education room so that they could learn to read and write. That's how much education means to them. One of the other things Nilda began through the center was to create a weaving competition, complete with prizes and awards offered to weavers in the participating villages. Nilda, who is always encouraging the weavers to strive for the highest quality possible, set up the competition in order to encourage the creation of truly virtuoso weavings, weavings as good as any the women's Inca ancestors had ever produced. In 2006, the center created an unusual competition that reached into the very heart of the weaver's past. Eleven years earlier, in 1995, an American high-altitude archaeologist, Johann Reinhardt, along with his Peruvian climbing partner, Miguel Miki Zarate, had climbed to the top of Ampato Volcano, outside of Arequipa in southern Peru. There, at an elevation of 20,700 feet, the two could clearly see the nearby volcano of Sabancaya, which was regularly erupting, and also the long chain of ice-covered Andean peaks. Reinhardt and Zarate had been searching the summit for possible Inca offerings and had found two gold and silver female figurines dressed in miniature textiles and wearing feather headdresses. They discovered the figurines near portions of a sacrificial platform that had recently collapsed. When the pair began searching for the rest of the platform below, Reinhardt's companion suddenly called out, I see something inside the crater. It looks like a mummy bundle. As Reinhardt later wrote, an Inca mummy bundle was simply lying on top of the ice. This seemed so unlikely that we couldn't believe our eyes. 
For fifteen years I had visited dozens of sites on peaks in the Andes and had never even seen a mummy bundle on a mountain, let alone one lying out in the open. Only a couple of intact mummy bundles had ever been recovered from high mountains, and only one by an archaeologist. The outer, intricately woven cloth wrapping had stripes typical of Inca textiles. This could mean only one thing. The Incas had performed a human sacrifice. I took photos as Mickey used his ice axe to cut the ice beneath the bundle to free it. He turned it on its side for a better grip, and as he did so the bundle revolved in his hands. Suddenly we froze and time seemed to stop. We were looking straight into the face of an Inca girl. The girl was completely frozen, Reinhardt discovered, and had remained in that state for at least five hundred years. She'd been sacrificed on top of the volcano. Wearing sandals and the perfectly preserved clothing she'd worn on her final day, the young girl had lived briefly sometime during the mid-fifteenth century. Reinhard's team later nicknamed the frozen girl Juanita as a tribute to Johann, the leader of the expedition that had discovered her. The girl's own name, of course, was unknown. Juanita appeared to be from nobility, as she'd been wearing beautifully woven clothes of spun alpaca wool, clothes that either she or others had made for her. Women from the Cusco area, it was known, had a specially beautiful and stylish dress. The Spanish chronicler Pedro Ciesa de Leon had marveled that. Some of the women wear the very graceful dress of those of Cusco, with a long mantle extending from the neck to the feet, having holes for the arms. Round the waist they fasten a very broad and graceful belt called chumpi, which tightens and secures the mantle. Over this they wear another fine mantle falling from the shoulders and coming down so as to cover the feet, called yikya. To secure their mantles they wear pins of gold and silver, rather broad at one end, called topu. On the head they wear a very graceful band, which they call uncha, and the asutas, or sandals, complete their attire. In short, the dress of the ladies of Cusco is the most graceful and rich that has been seen up to this time in all the Indies. The chronicler's description could have been a description of the dress of the young, four-foot-two-inch-tall Inca girl found on the mountaintop, born presumably in the Cusco area sometime in the 1400s. On her head Juanita wore a headcloth frequently used by noblewomen. She also wore a brilliantly colored, rainbow-hued dress, or aksu, which consisted of a rectangular piece of cloth wound around her body and under the arms, fastened with silver pins, or tupus, one over each shoulder. Juanita also wore an elaborately woven belt, or chumpi, around her waist, while over her shoulders she wore a bright red and white striped shawl, or yikya, fastened with a silver pin. All the clothing was, of course, woven from hand-spun threads colored with natural dyes, and it was precisely this discovery of a nearly perfectly preserved Inca girl and her clothing, which Time magazine hailed in 1995 as one of the world's top ten discoveries, that caught the attention not only of the press, but also of Nilda Kayanalpa. Johan is an old friend, Nilda tells me in her office, pulling out some aged photos and showing me two of them. We used to work together as guides at a travel agency. When the news hit about the discovery of the Ice Maiden of Ampato, Volcano, as Juanita came to be called, Nilda and Johan got in touch. Nilda remembers the shock of seeing the first photos taken of Juanita's clothing. Beautiful, of very high quality, she says, shaking her head slowly. Some years later, after Nilda had established her center and had begun carrying out yearly weaving competitions, Johann suggested an idea. Why not see if any of the women in the different village cooperatives could reproduce the clothes that Juanita had been wearing? Why not have them examine the girls' clothes and see if their present skill level approached that of their ancestors? And so began the 2006-2007 Lady of Ampado weaving competition, a challenge open to any of the weavers belonging to one of the cooperatives. The women who participated ultimately were not able to visit Juanita herself, who remained in a glass-lined, ice-cold chamber in Arequipa, but they did closely examine photos of what Juanita had been wearing. Then, working from these same photos, they slowly began the process of deciphering what Inca hands some five hundred years earlier had created, 
weaving so fine that there was little doubt that they had been produced by chosen women, who, like Juanita, had once lived in Cusco's Aklawasi. The weavers asked themselves, How was this done? Nilda recalls. Were these made on a backstrap loom, or were there some tapestries, weavings hiding the warp threads and made on vertical looms that fell into disuse after the fall of the Inca Empire? Finally, after close examination, the women determined that the girls' clothes had been made on backstrap looms such as those they themselves used, and set to work trying to duplicate the Inca women's feet. You know, the winner is here today at the Tinkui, Nilda tells me. Her name is Olga Huiman, and she's from Chinchero. I find Olga tending a vat of dye on the courtyard, surrounded by other weavers from her community. She has her hair done up in multiple braids, in the Chinchero style, is decked out in resplendent woven clothing, and smiles shyly when I mention the lady from Ampato competition. Olga was worried, at first, she says, that she couldn't figure out how the weavings were done. It's difficult to study a weaving just by looking at it, and even harder when only looking at a photo. How did it make her feel, I ask, reproducing the clothing of a young girl from Inca times? Privileged, she says, and smiles again, stirring the bubbling liquid dye before her. Because the women and men who belong to the cooperatives are mostly from small, isolated communities and have traveled very little, the center has sponsored trips for them so that they can see for themselves some of the heritage that millions of tourists visiting Peru each year get to see. In 1996, a group of them traveled for the first time to the citadel of Machu Picchu, once the royal residence of the greatest Inca emperor, Pachacutec. There, Olga and the rest of the women, dressed in their characteristic clothes, explored the citadel surrounded by giant crags and swirling clouds, a city assembled from thousands of stones cut and carved by their ancestors. "'What was your impression?' I ask her. "'It was like a dream,' she says. "'I felt like I was dreaming.' It strikes me that, had Olga been transported five hundred years into the past, and had she met people living in Machu Picchu, she no doubt would have understood both their language and the intricate manner in which they were dressed. Proud, she continues, remembering her visit. It made me proud. Early in the morning, on the seventh day of her journey from Cusco, at sixteen thousand two hundred feet on the lower flank of Ampato Volcano, Juanita woke suddenly with a start. She'd slept only fitfully ever since she and the rest of the procession of lamas, priests, and assistants had left Cusco the week before. Four months after learning that she'd been chosen by the emperor as an Akla Capacocha, whose destiny was now to be joined with the gods, Juanita was told by a priestess that she was to prepare herself for a journey the following day. That night Juanita had not been able to sleep. It had been months since she'd last seen her friend Quispe, who was now married to an Incan noble and could no longer visit the Aklawasi. It had also been four months since she'd last glimpsed her father on Cusco's sacred square. It had been a year since she'd last seen her father, a brief interlocking of the eyes when she'd spotted him in a crowd. The morning of her departure, Juanita had said goodbye to those Aklas she had lived with and also to the Mamacona, or head priestess, the Mamacona had placed both hands on Juanita's bowed head and had whispered for her to be strong, for she had been chosen and was blessed to be with the gods. Juanita's memory of the following week was blurred. Sometimes she'd ridden on a litter, borne by members of the Rukana tribe up and down stone roadways that twisted like snakes along sheer cliffs. At other times, when the ground was not so steep, she'd walked in the middle of the procession, through valleys rimmed by ice-topped mountains, and past small villages whose inhabitants bowed or sometimes fell to their knees when they saw the procession pass. Just yesterday Juanita had glimpsed for the first time the mountain that was their destination, a sheer black upswept cone with a white cap of ice on top. When they'd first came in sight of it, and a priest had told her what it was, her heart had seemed to stop beating. The procession of priests and the train of lamas carrying supplies had come to a stop, and the priests had stretched out their arms and bowed. There, beside Zampado, rose another 
cone-like mountain, but from the top of this one a stream of gray-white smoke rose skyward and then flattened and formed a gray mantle above. Apu Sabankaya, one of the priests had told her. It was the god who dwelled within this volcano who had shaken the whole region. Even now Juanita could feel his sudden movements through the ground. That night the volcano had glowed red in the distance, and they could hear the Apu roaring and grumbling, the mountain god enraged, with flames sometimes bursting from the volcano's mouth. Because of the roars and the red glow, and because of everything that had happened since her meeting with the emperor, Juanita had been unable to sleep. Now, in fact, she ate very little, some roasted corn and a few other vegetables. A priest wearing a golden amulet and carrying a staff had given Juanita a small woven bag full of sacred coca leaves, instructing her how to place the leaves in her mouth, just inside her cheek. The leaves helped numb her body and took away her hunger. They made her feel stronger. Yesterday, climbing up on Pato's flanks and leaving their footprints finely etched in a layer of gray ash, they'd arrived at a camp on the volcano's lower flank. A group of small stone houses had awaited them with roofs of thatched ichu grass. The attendants had taken off the llama's packs and had enclosed the animals in a small stone corral. This morning Juanita had woken with a start. Outside the stone house a number of priests had already left, beginning the climb above her and toward the volcano's crown. Juanita soon joined them. At this rarefied height, she could look out over at Sabankaya, which continued to rumble and growl and pour out smoke. Sometimes the angry god shook the ground, as if threatening them. At other times a fine veil of gray ash fell, as delicate as the smallest snowflakes Juanita had ever seen. Now, and almost in a daze, Juanita climbed up the volcano's side, followed by several priests. Behind them followed the lamas and attendants, the going was steep, and Juanita frequently had to stop. A priest offered her more coca leaves, directing her to place fresh ones in her mouth. Another gave her chicha, a strong fermented corn drink that made her head feel light. The chicha was so cold it almost seemed to freeze in her mouth. Snow now appeared beneath their feet as Juanita pulled her alpaca shawl closely around her, clutching at the cloth. Her bare legs beneath her tunic felt cold, nearly frozen. She was unused to the altitude, unused to climbing, and was so numb with tiredness and cold that she found it difficult to think. Juanita felt fear. She felt awe. She also felt a strange mixture of both exhaustion and anticipation. Late in the afternoon they arrived near the summit. Juanita's breathing was difficult. Her lips were cracked from the sun and the thin air. The priests instructed Juanita to walk with them to a stone platform. There, before her, spread a line of white-capped mountains, each the home of a powerful apu, or mountain god. These were the same gods who provided them with streams and rivers and water for their crops, who provided them with abundant herds of alpacas and llamas, who provided them with life itself. Juanita was surprised to see that now, slightly below them, she could clearly look down upon angry Sabankaya. A tortured river of smoke still poured out of its mouth, at times obscuring the sun. Stones occasionally shot straight up, and Juanita could see the Apu's angry red lips of fire. The priests now poured offerings of chicha onto the ground, each in one of the four sacred directions— they then bowed and offered a stream of golden chicha to the angry volcano. Apu Sabankaya, the eldest priest said, gesturing toward it, have mercy on us and behold our offerings. Juanita, eyes wide, pulled her cloak even more tightly around her, gazing at the smoke pouring forth so violently, as thick and convoluted as a coil of writhing snakes. A priest poured chicha into a small golden cup and handed it to her. Prepare yourself, he said. Two hundred and eighty miles south of Cusco lies Arequipa, a sunny, resplendent colonial city hemmed in by ice-capped volcanoes, flamingo-dotted blue lakes, and high plains with yellow tufts of ichu grass. 
Arequipa is sometimes called La Ciudad Blanca, or the White City. Depending on whom you speak to, this is either because its first inhabitants were white-skinned Spaniards, or else because its colonial buildings were fashioned from a pale, lilac-colored stone called sillar. The stone is a soft volcanic rock full of holes made from volcanic gases. Because of the sillar, the buildings lining the central streets of Arequipa appear as if they've been sprayed by machine-gun fire, or else hit by shrapnel, giving the appearance that great battles once raged here. Some of the holes, however, are actually from bullets, as Arequipa is also a city of coups and revolutionaries. Mario Vargas Llosa, the Peruvian Nobel laureate, was born here, his career launched by his first novel, The City of the Dogs, an expose about life in a Peruvian military academy, which the government promptly banned. Abamel Guzman Reynoso, the imprisoned leader of the Shining Path, is also an Arequipeño, and frequently took coffee as a young law student in a small café off the Plaza de Armas. During the Shining Path's ten-year millenarian war, the guerrilla group never launched an attack on the city. Many say that this was due to the fact that Arequipa was Guzman's hometown. Most of the battle scars on Arequipa's colonial facades, however, are not the result of human, but tectonic forces— Arequipa sits in the midst of a region that has long served as a crucible for the ancient conflict between man and nature, a real millenarian war that is sometimes quiet, sometimes simmering, and occasionally catastrophic. House walls here are purposely built thick, often as much as three to seven feet, as earthquakes and volcanic eruptions are common. Seismic events frequently decapitate one or both of the city's high cathedral towers, collapsing bridges, arcades, and porticos at the same time. It was on top of a volcano not far from here that the body of Juanita, the Inca Ice Maiden, was found. On the city's outskirts rises another majestic, nearly 20,000-foot-tall volcano called Misti, the volcano's cone-like outline resembles that of Mount Fujiyama in Japan, or the outlines of the 19th-century Krakatoa volcano before it exploded into smithereens. All three of these volcanoes, Misti, Fujiyama, and Krakatoa, as well as more than 430 others, form part of the Pacific Ocean's Ring of Fire, a 10,000-mile diameter volcanic circle that surrounds the Pacific Ocean, the friction arising from two enormous continental plates grinding their way eastward across the Pacific has ultimately created a kind of giant flaming hoop around the ocean's edges, a band of volcanoes that periodically belch fire and smoke into the atmosphere and often incinerate their surroundings. At 7,600 feet, Arequipa sits midway in a line of more than a dozen volcanoes that form part of this ring, in a region that is one of four major volcanic zones in South America. One of these zones lies along the coast of Colombia, another stretches through the Andes of southern Peru and Bolivia, while two more extend farther south into Chile. All are the result of the Nazca Plate slowly smashing into the South American Plate, sliding and grinding its way beneath the latter in a subduction zone that forms the Peru-Chile Oceanic Trench, just off the coast. Where the angle of that collision zone is steepest, some thirty degrees or more, earthquakes are common and volcanoes emerge, the latter forming giant vents that help release some of the immense heat generated below. On February 19, 1600, one such volcanic release took place, about forty-three miles southeast of Arequipa. Three days after the initial eruption, as many of Arequipa's inhabitants crammed themselves into the cathedral, repenting and wondering if the end of days and the apocalypse had begun, another violent earthquake struck the city. The new cathedral abruptly collapsed upon the worshippers. In 2001, the most recent earthquake struck the region, measuring 8.1 on the Richter scale. It brought down the cathedral's southern tower and damaged other buildings in the city. Especially hard hit was Arequipa's 16th-century Santa Catalina convent, which is surrounded by high CR walls and lies in the heart of the city. The entire convent was destroyed, 
My guide, Carmen, a young Quechua-speaking woman, says to me as we tour the four-century-old convent one afternoon. Wrought iron grills fit like bird cages over the windows where once lived the nuns wearing black or white habits and living in seclusion. Over one archway is stenciled the command that is still followed by the two dozen nuns who presently live here and who will spend their lives within these cloistered walls. Silencio. Everything collapsed, Carmen says, as we walk down an azure-colored alleyway lined with wooden doors leading into nuns' cells. Many were killed. Ever since it was founded in 1579, Carmen says, Peruvian families have been bringing their daughters to the convent named after St. Catherine, a 14th-century Italian woman who experienced a vision of Jesus Christ at the age of six. By tradition, Spanish descendants living in Peru commonly selected their second eldest sons to become priests and their second eldest daughters to become nuns. Thus, ever since the convent's founding, young girls of a certain birth order have entered, usually around the age of twelve to fourteen, and then have spent the rest of their lives in seclusion, devoted to God. Like the Inca girls cloistered in the Aklawasi, these young Christian girls entered the convent knowing full well that their future lives of abstinence and devotion would ultimately benefit their families and the rest of society. They were, after all, now married to God, just as the Inca girls had been married to the sun. They thus had one foot on earth and another already in heaven. Once inside the convent, nuns were not allowed to leave, while the newest entrants, known as novitiates, were sequestered from the rest of the convent and allowed no contact with family or friends. Once the three-year novitiate period had ended and a girl took her vows, family members could visit, but the visits took place in almost prison-like conditions. The nun's family would enter one room, while the nun, seated in an adjacent corridor, visited her family by speaking through a double wooden grill that allowed no physical contact. Once fully betrothed to Christ, and now wearing a ring symbolizing their marriage to Him, the nuns were exposed to as little temptation as was humanly possible, their lives carefully supervised and regulated. When they died, the nuns were buried in a cemetery within the convent's walls. In a courtyard nearby, I watch as a brown-skinned woman in a broad-rimmed hat and long pollera skirts walks carefully up the steps besides a cupola and places a small stone the size of a potato on a wall. A gray-haired man in a black jacket waits for her below. The scene reminds me of the fact that, for thousands of years, native Andeans have placed similar small stones, or apachetas, on sacred places, offerings to the earth goddess or other deities. Even today, Christianity in the Andes remains infused by native beliefs, the natives having dutifully added the Christian god to their own abundant pantheon of indigenous gods and spirits, along with the hundreds of lesser Catholic saints. Just four blocks down from the convent, past the cathedral with its two white silar stone towers, past the Plaza de Armas with its two-story arcades, and down Santa Catalina Avenue rises the blood-red façade with white pilasters of the Catholic University of Santa Maria. The locale was virtually unknown outside of Peru until September 13, 1995, when several men carried a freezer through the university's doors and then placed it in a hastily cleared room. Inside the heavy box crouched Juanita, the ice maiden, discovered on the summit of Ampado Volcano, some sixty miles to the northwest. The nearby volcano of Sabancaya had been erupting on and off for some time, sending up ash that had coated the snow and ice-covered summit of Ampado. The darker ash had absorbed the sun, had melted the snow, and then suddenly a portion of the summit's ridge had collapsed, carrying down with it a mixture of ice and rock, and also a strange alpaca wool bundle that contained the frozen body of Juanita. Around her, amid the snow and ice, lay small gold and silver figurines, a feather headdress, and scraps of woven cloth. Stunned by his first encounter with an intact Inca sacrifice, the archaeologist Johann Reinhard had been immediately faced with a difficult decision. 
Should he leave everything as he had found it, possibly to be looted by grave robbers or destroyed by the elements? Or should he try to move the mummy bundle and the artifacts down the volcano and take them to Arequipa, where they might be secured? As he later wrote, My mind raced with all the implications of the discovery. What was the next best step? If we left the mummy behind, the sun and volcanic ash would further damage it. Also, at this time of year, a heavy snowfall could cover the summit any day and make recovery impossible, perhaps forever. I knew that obtaining an archaeological permit could take weeks, if not months, as could obtaining the funding to organize a scientific expedition. Nor could we save time by flying in with a helicopter— most helicopters could not land safely, even at the 16,700-foot altitude of our base camp, let alone at the summit. Eventually, Reinhard decided he had no choice. He had to get the mummy down off the mountain. To do so, however, would require a quasi-Herculean effort, as he and his companion were by now tired and hungry, standing on a volcanic peak at 20,700 feet, and had no one to help them. What's more, Juanita was frozen and weighed more than eighty pounds. Below them, meanwhile, stretched a dangerous section of slippery snow and ice. As Reinhard later recounted, I couldn't hoist the pack with the mummy inside directly off the ground, so I sat down, put the straps around my shoulders, and Mickey pulled me to my feet. I could hardly stand up, let alone navigate an ice-covered slope. In the fading light, the nearby Sabancaya volcano's cloud of ash seemed to take on a sinister aspect. Having a dead body on my back added to the surreal scene. Images of Incas struggling through the same terrain ran through my mind. For a moment I was transported back in time, and I had the eerie feeling that I was rescuing someone who was alive. Later examination revealed that Juanita had died from blunt force trauma that had cracked the side of her skull near her right eye, no doubt inflicted by a stone hammer or club. In full view of an erupting volcano, and no doubt with the hope that her sacrifice would calm the mountain god responsible for the eruption, Juanita had been sacrificed. According to the chroniclers, Reinhardt later wrote, Inca children were selected because their purity made them more acceptable to live with the gods. After being sacrificed, these children became messengers or representatives of the people to the gods and could intervene on their behalf. The children became, in effect, deified and worshipped together with the gods with whom they were believed to reside. They would be honored for all time, unlike the majority of common people who only received offerings for a few generations after their deaths. It was considered an honor for the parents of the children selected, and some were known to have offered their children willingly. The parents were not supposed to show sadness, and it was even said to have been a major offense if they did. Not all parents felt the honor worth the price, however. Thus, they were not opposed to their daughters losing their virginity, since in this way they avoided being taken away. The next day, and now farther down the volcano, Reinhard transferred Juanita from his backpack frame to a burrow. Once a road was reached, he then placed the still-frozen girl in the storage area of a bus bound for Arequipa. The following morning, at 6.45, the bus arrived in the city, a freezer was located, and Juanita was placed inside. Eventually, the Catholic University of Santa Maria created a permanent exhibit, placing Juanita in a glass chamber whose temperature was lowered to 10 degrees Fahrenheit. By the time I arrive at the Catholic University, Juanita has been sitting in her icy crypt for more than 16 years. I enter the Museo Santuario Sandinos, Andean Sanctuaries Museum, through an arched entryway with a Moorish style wrought iron grill covering the upper arch of the portico, then pass through to a sunny courtyard set amid rust colored walls, white pilasters, and red geraniums. I buy a ticket and then pass between thick wooden doors and into a series of rooms inside. A sign at the entryway announces that one is about to step into a world some five hundred fifty years in the past. 
Inside, Inca offerings from various mountaintop burials rest quietly beneath glass cases, including miniature gold and silver alpaca figurines that symbolized the Inca's flocks. A large Inca yikya weaving, in rich burgundy colors and bordered with black, stretches across one wall, the colors of the alpaca fiber so rich the weaving looks like it was made only yesterday. As I penetrate into the museum's inner sanctuary, the atmosphere darkens and the lights dim. Finally, I enter a room that is lit in perpetual twilight. Against one wall, on a waist-high stand, rests a large glass cubicle. Because of the chill air, goosebumps rise on my skin. Through the frosted glass I can make out the outlines of an Inca girl, still covered in a finely woven tunic and shawl, her hair quaffed in an almost gorgon's coil of finely woven black braids. Juanita sits in the same crouching position she has remained in for half a millennia, until recent global warming and nearby volcanic activity suddenly broke open her icy crypt, spilling her abruptly outside. Juanita's face has a remote look. Her eyes are slightly open. She seems to be squinting into the face of eternity. Not long after her discovery, Mario Vargas Llosa visited her new crypt, wishing to examine this sudden apparition from his country's distant past. She was the age of Shakespeare's Juliet, Vargas Llosa wrote afterward. Fourteen years old, and like her, she had a romantic and tragic history. I was convinced that the spectacle of seeing her would turn my stomach. It was not like that. It takes nothing else than to see her. Her exotic, lengthened face, with high cheekbones and large, somewhat slanted eyes, suggest a remote Oriental influence. She has her mouth open, as if challenging the world with the whiteness of her perfect teeth that purse her upper lip in a coquettish expression. I was moved, captivated by Juanita's beauty. In May 1996, museum technicians loaded Juanita onto a jetliner within a specially made freezer. The plane took off, flying first past Misti and then Ampato volcanoes, the latter still crowned with the ice on which she had been discovered. The plane then turned northward, reaching an altitude of 30,000 feet, before heading toward Washington, D.C., for the next month, and at a specially made exhibit at the National Geographic Society's headquarters, Juanita received a steady stream of visitors. One of those was Peru's president, Alberto Fujimori, who happened to be in the capital at the time. Moved by his visit, Fujimori spoke to a small crowd of gathered dignitaries. On behalf of the people of Peru, I am proud to be here to introduce Juanita, the Princess of Amparo. Hers is a tale told across half a millennium, one that might have remained buried forever, but has emerged suddenly to astound the world. The story of her discovery is known to you, her long journey from the top of Mount Amparo to here today. The lessons we and all the world may learn from her are beyond today's calculations. We are proud to share with you, our neighbors and friends to the north, this great and precious treasure— Lifted by nature herself, from the very depths of the ground atop one of the highest peaks on earth, Juanita's awakening and her long journey to this time and place leave us mindful of the great distance the world has traveled in these centuries. The princess could not have known that one unimaginable day fate would give her a new and conspicuous place on the global stage of the future. May she teach us lessons— Bring us to look into our hearts, our history, and our conscience, and may the soul of Juanita rest in peace. Ricciari Sankoyai, a voice said into Juanita's ear, wake up. It was morning. Juanita opened her eyes and saw the eldest priest's face quite near hers, his dark eyes peering at her intently. At first she stared at him, uncomprehending. Wake up he said again, shaking her lightly. Somehow, Juanita had fallen to sleep the night before, covered in alpaca blankets beneath an alpaca cloth tent. The priest held out a small bowl of cooked vegetables, and Juanita ate them, grateful, but
but still so bone-shakingly cold that her arms and legs shivered. A few moments later she stumbled outside. The sun had not yet come up, and Juanita was soon surrounded by the priests, who began helping her up the last stretch of mountainside to the volcano's crest. The ground was now pure ice, in spots layered with gray ash, and in places her sandals had trouble gaining a foothold. The air was so cold and thin it took her breath away. Once on the summit, Juanita and the priest waited for the sun-god Inti to emerge. Finally, almost miraculously, he did so, bathing them now in a sharp yellow light that also etched the edges of the funnel of gray smoke that was still pouring forth from Sabankaya below them, filling up the sky. Juanita could feel a priest's hands adjusting her shawl, making sure her silver tupus were correctly fastened, adjusting her aksu as well around her, straightening her hair and fastening her long braid behind her to her chumpi belt with a cord of black wool. In a daze from the thin air, lack of sleep, and the biting cold, Juanita watched as a group of priests crouching beside her readied small figurines of gold and silver llamas and alpacas, fitting them with small woven clothes. Juanita followed the line of priests to a small platform on the volcano's icy summit, stumbling at times, the rainbow colors of her aksu dress bathed in the early morning sun. On a small stone platform, a priest bade her to kneel, and Juanita knelt, dutifully doing as she was told. Before her, arms stretched horizontally out toward the sun, two priests stood and poured golden-colored chicha from a vase onto the volcano's crown, the liquid cord of their offering glimmering in the sunlight. Another held his arms outstretched toward the erupting Apu, pleading with it to spare their crops, to spare their fields, to spare their villages and towns. Juanita knelt silently in the snow and ice, on top of an Apu on the very summit of the world. Apu Zabankaya, she heard the priests' voices say, rising together in unison. Have mercy on us. Behold our offerings. A strong hand then pushed her head down. Juanita waited, her breath heaving, the sound of the chanting and the volcano's eruption in her ears. On her tunic she saw fine flakes of freshly fallen ash, gray against the rich ochre colors of her dress, the tunic's bright colors almost blinding her because of the dazzling sun. Two hands held her strongly from behind, and another pushed her head down even farther as the chanting grew louder. And then, like a sudden clap of thunder, Juanita knew no more. 6. The Contiki Voyage, White Gods, and the Floating Islands of Lake Titicaca, Peru and Bolivia I asked the Indians what this creator god Viracocha looked like when the ancients saw him, as far as they have information. They told me that he was a tall man, dressed in a white garment that reached to his ankles and was belted at the waist. His hair was short, and he had a tonsure like a priest. I asked them the name, and they said his name was Contiki Viracocha, which means God, maker of the world. Juan de Betanzos Narrative of the Incas, 1564 I was no longer in doubt that the white chief god, Suntiki, whom the Incas declared that their forefathers had driven out of Peru on to the Pacific, was identical with the white chief god, Tiki, son of the sun, whom the inhabitants of all the eastern Pacific islands hailed as the original founder of their race and the details of Suntiki's life in Peru, with the ancient names of places round Lake Titicaca, cropped up again in historic legends current among the natives of the Pacific Islands. My theory was complete. I must go to America and put it forward. Torheardal, Contiki, Across the Pacific by Raft did you know we found a dead rooster and a dead dog inside our wire fence just a few days ago? Torheyrdal, the Norwegian explorer, asks me. It is May 1987, and we are driving in a jeep on a dirt road on the northern coast of Peru. 
2,000-year-old adobe pyramids from the Moche culture loom around us, and Heyerdahl, 71 years old, with white wispy hair and wearing a blue jumpsuit, looks over at me, all the while trying to dodge the occasional barking dog or surprised chicken. I shake my head. Witchcraft, he says, then swerves past a dog that races after us, fangs bared. The dog reminds me of some of the palm-sized golden faces with fangs that have recently been unearthed near here, buried within the tomb of a moche king called the Lord of Sipan. Looters had stumbled upon the grave, so full of copper and silver and gold artifacts, that it was soon dubbed the New World's version of King Tut's tomb. Within days of the discovery, the police arrived, shot one of the robbers, and confiscated some of the golden images. A few of the gold figurines, later smuggled out of Peru, sold for nearly a million dollars each. All of this occurred just thirty miles north of where we are driving. The local people are now understandably nervous, apprehensive, and angry. They know that pockets of fabulous treasure could lie anywhere within the crumbling pyramids around them, and at least some of them want a portion of that treasure for themselves. Adobe homes with thatched roofs appear, and a few people with dark brown skin and black hair and wearing tire sandals emerge to look at us. Heyerdahl waves genially. Not all of them wave back. We want to dig in their ancestors' burial grounds, he says, within their temples and pyramids, and the witch doctors don't like it. To counteract the witch doctor's spells, Heyerdahl and I are off to a local market to search for some hot peppers and other secret ingredients that a friendly shaman has instructed us to buy. They'll help ward off any evil spells, the shaman said. Heyerdahl parks his jeep near an open-air market. Although I'm more than four decades younger, Heyerdahl's invited me to spend a few days with him. He knows that I've been working in Peru for the last year as an anthropologist in the Amazon. We climb out of the jeep and enter the market, then begin exploring the stalls stocked with bags of quinoa, ahi peppers, star fruit, grandilla, lucuma, and other produce. Years ago, when I was a child, I'd read Heyerdahl's first book, Contiki Across the Pacific by Raft. I remember being completely captivated. This is how he began his book. Once in a while you find yourself in an odd situation. You get into it by degrees and in the most natural way, but when you are right in the midst of it, you are suddenly astonished and ask yourself how in the world it all came about. If, for example, you put to sea with a parrot and five companions— it is inevitable that sooner or later you will wake up one morning out at sea, perhaps a little better rested than ordinarily, and begin to think about it. On one such morning I sat writing in a dew-drenched logbook. May 17, Norwegian Independence Day, Heavy Sea, Fair Wind. I am cook today, and found seven flying fish on deck— one squid on the cabin roof, and one unknown fish in Torstein's sleeping bag. The fish, it turned out, was a wonderfully rare snake mackerel, which had never been seen alive before. And the voyage, 4,300 miles across the Pacific Ocean on a small balsa-wood Inca-style raft, had also never been seen before, at least not in modern times, Heyerdahl and his companions, some of whom, like himself, were Norwegian resistance fighters who'd fought against the Nazis during World War II, eventually sailed their craft from Peru to the Tuamatu Islands in French Polynesia, where they crash-landed on a coral reef. Heyerdahl called his raft the Kontiki, after an ancient god once revered by the Incas and by the ancient Tiawanako people who lived near Lake Titicaca, twelve thousand feet up in the Andes. His book eventually sold more than twenty million copies and was published in sixty-seven languages. Now financially independent, Heyerdahl continued to research and excavate the remains of ancient cultures, on the Galapagos Islands, on Easter Island, on the Maldives, and on the Canary Islands, all in an attempt to prove that indigenous people not only had developed seagoing rafts, 
but that they had also once used those rafts to cross entire oceans. Heyerdahl believed that rafts had allowed contact between ancient civilizations such as those in Peru and Polynesia and between the Old World and the New. "'Have you been to Egypt?' Heyerdahl suddenly asks me as he makes a purchase from an old woman of some peppers. I shake my head. The Egyptian pyramids at Saqqara look much like the ones around here, he says, referring to the ancient Moche pyramids in the area, so eroded that they look like crumbling hills. You think there's a connection? I ask. Yes. But how? Read rafts, he says similar to those on Lake Titicaca. The woman places the cluster of withered maroon-colored peppers in a small bag and hands them to Heyerdahl. "'Have you been there?' he asks. I shake my head again. "'Fabulous place,' he says. We climb back into the jeep and take off. They still use reed rafts on Titicaca, just like they used to in Egypt and ancient Mesopotamia, Heyerdahl says. On Titicaca, people still live on islands made from reeds, the Uros Islands, that's what they're called. There was a connection between the old world and the new. The weathered explorer turns to look at me. His face is lined, but his blue eyes are as fresh and sparkling as the open ocean on a sunny day. More than forty years after he and his five companions crash-landed the Contiki onto an atoll in the Pacific, Heyerdahl is still deeply passionate about this work. If you haven't been to Titicaca, he says, then by all means, go. The boat builders who built my ship, the Ratu, still live there. That's what I sailed on, from Morocco to Barbados, in the Caribbean. The two continents weren't separated. They were once connected by rafts. Nearly a quarter of a century later, I arrive in Puno, Peru, a city on the edge of the world's highest navigable body of water, Lake Titicaca. Although I'm no longer in my twenties, I did take some of Heyerdahl's advice. After my visit with him among the Moche pyramids, I eventually visited the pyramids of Egypt traveled among Greek and Roman ruins around the Mediterranean, investigated various ancient temples strewn across India, explored the ruined temples of Angkor Wat, lived with a recently contacted tribe in the Amazon, visited isolated areas of Papua New Guinea, and now, while on a north-south journey from the northern edge of South America to its southernmost tip in Patagonia, I can't help but hear Heyerdahl's questions come back to me, have you visited Lake Titicaca? Do you know about the Uros? I had visited the lake after our encounter, but only briefly. Since then, I've read that at least one of the boat builders Heyerdahl mentioned, the man who had designed and built the Ra Tu, still lives on an island in the Bolivian part of the lake. Heyerdahl's Titicaca boat builder, I calculate, must by now be in his eighties. Since the Uros Islands are quite near Puno, and since I'm on my way south to Bolivia, I decide to visit the islands, and then to try to find the man who built Heyerdahl's boat. Along the base of hills that rim the northwestern corner of Lake Titicaca, the city of Puno spills like a river down a hillside until it reaches the shore. There a cement quay squats, lined with small boats, Puno has a population of 100,000 and sits at 12,500 feet, or more than two miles, above sea level. I soon discover that any main avenue you follow either runs down to the lake shore or else tilts up from the lake's edge and heads back up through town. Bicycle-pedaled, three-wheel taxis ply the roads, with plastic roofs overhead to keep the frequent rains off the passengers. The tricycles have rubber-bulbed horns on their handlebars that the drivers use to bleat their way in and out of traffic. Puno itself is rather drab and roughly hewn. Around the main plaza, women sit on stone benches wearing shawls and bowler hats, knitting or tending children, while elderly men dressed in worn and creased suits sit beside them, holding canes, their heads nodding forward in slumber. A few policemen stroll about in uniforms of dull green, past homes and buildings that are made from red brick. 
Most buildings in Puno have sprouts of iron rebar sticking up out of the upper corners of the roofs like insect antennas. The rebar is for adding another floor to a building or house. Eventually, when a building reaches completion, and in this area of Peru that means four or five stories high, the owners plaster over the brick exterior and paint the building blue, green, or some other color. Most buildings in Puno are thus creeping slowly skyward, one floor at a time. Although Puno has little in the way of sights to recommend it, ironically, the city sits on the shores of one of the most beautiful lakes in the world. Imagine a giant swimming pool over 100 miles in length, 50 miles wide, and more than a thousand feet deep, lifted into the air and suspended two miles above the sea. Imagine a line of mountains, the Cordillera Real, complete with 20,000-foot peaks, ranging along the lake's eastern border, while another mountain range, the Cordillera Occidental, ranges to the west. To the east, beyond the sacred, ice-capped mountains, lies the Amazon rainforest, which stretches for 3,000 miles. To the west lie the shores of the Pacific Ocean, about 150 miles away and two miles down. Viewed from above, Lake Titicaca sits like a glistening blue jewel in the midst of the brown Altiplano, its southern half in Bolivia, its northern half in Peru. Down on Puno's concrete wharf, I meet Juan, a 36-year-old Aymara Indian who lives on one of Titicaca's floating islands, Los Uros. These are the same islands Tor Heyerdahl had told me about years ago. Juan, who wears tire sandals and a knitted Chuuyu hat of brightly colored alpaca wool and speaks Spanish with a thick Aymara accent, tells me that he'll be departing for his island home later in the afternoon. He invites me to go along. When I tell him that I'd like to spend a few nights on the island, he quickly assures me that not only does he have room, he has a hotel made entirely from reeds. Of reeds? I ask. Si, si, si. De Totora. Yes, 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 of Totora reeds. Late in the afternoon, we take off in a small wooden boat powered by an Evinrude motor and head out into Puno Bay. Juan is short and stocky, has high cheekbones and short black hair. He was born on a floating reed island, as were his father, his grandfather, and all of his ancestors as far back as he can remember. His wife, Elsa, was also born on the Uros, floating mats of reeds that are man-made, are moored to wooden stakes, and are about ten feet thick. Like Juan's, his wife's mother tongue is Aymara. The Uros, it turns out, have a rather complicated history. Although archaeologists believe that the first Americans walked across the Bering Land Bridge sometime between 22,000 and 15,000 years ago, with their descendants arriving in the area around Lake Titicaca by 8,000 B.C., no one really knows when people began to live on floating reed islands. What archaeologists do know is that people began inhabiting some of the natural islands in Lake Titicaca by 2000 B.C. and presumably arrived there by rafts made from Totora reeds. Sometime after that, although the exact date is unknown, people began fashioning islands from reeds and started living on them. It wasn't until the 16th century that Europeans visited Lake Titicaca for the first time and wrote of a people they referred to as the Uros. The first Spanish chroniclers spoke of these unusual lake dwellers disparagingly because, unlike people who lived a settled existence on land, the Uros lived on floating islands, subsisting on fish, ducks, and even on the reeds themselves. Wrote the Augustinian monk Antonio de la Calancha, these Uros are barbarous. They are blackened, unclean, are enemies of language, and have no affection for the worship of our faith. The Uros Indians are born, reared, and live on the lake, among the reeds, which are called Totora, and are very thick reed beds. They live here without any more clothes or cover, although this land is very cold, than a mat of reeds. Their language is the most obscure, short and primitive of all the guttural ones in Peru. Their religious practices are to worship the sun and the lake. They adore the latter and make it offerings of sacred corn. Forty years later, another Spanish priest, José de Acosta, 
poured further scorn on the islanders by writing, They raise a large amount of reeds, which the Indians call Totora, and which is useful for a thousand things, because it's food for pigs and horses and men. They make houses from it, and fire and boats, and when it's necessary, the Uros Indians can be found in the Totora reeds. These Uros are so brutish that they themselves do not consider themselves men. It is said that when they were questioned, they responded that they were not men, but Uros, as if they were another kind of animal. Whole villages of Uros have been found, the inhabitants in their reed boats that were bound to one another and tied to a bluff, and if it became necessary to move, they would move the entire floating village to another site. So if searching for them today, where they were yesterday, you would find no trace of them or of their village. What seemed to annoy the Spaniards greatly, and no doubt the Incas before them, was the fact that the Uros people were so difficult to find and keep track of. Both the Spaniards and the Incas ran empires based upon the taxation of their citizens. But how do you tax a people who, at the drop of the proverbial bowler hat, can simply vanish from one day to the next, taking their entire village with them? Anthropologists continue to debate whether the Urus referred to by the chroniclers were actually a distinct ethnic group with a separate language, or were simply Aymara Indians who specialized in making a living on and about the lake. In any event, if there ever were a separate Urus language, it has long since vanished, as have many other languages in South America. The people living on the Urus Islands today speak Aymara, a language spoken by more than two million people in the Andes of Peru, Bolivia, and Chile. It was the Aymaras who created the great civilization of Tiahuanaco, and its renowned capital of the same name, which lies at the southern end of Lake Titicaca in Bolivia. Knifing out through water that is as pure and blue as the sky, we motor away, leaving the city of Puno shrinking in our wake. Titicaca is the largest lake in South America, and its average temperature hovers between 50 and 57 degrees Fahrenheit. Because of its elevation and the tropical sun, evaporation rates are high, thus the skies around the lake are often full of giant cumulus clouds that boil up and rise to tremendous heights, periodically exploding with rain, lightning, and thunder. The vast, low reed beds among which the Uros live begin only about three miles from the city, so within a short time I can see the islands, at first a line of low green reeds, and then, poking out above them, the rounded tops of reed houses, like clusters of strange, sprouting yellow mushrooms. An Andean gull spins overhead, white with a black head, through air that is fresh, well-scrubbed, and chilly. Our boat then turns as Juan motors it into a large blue channel in the reeds. The floating islands of the Uros soon begin to appear, forty-two of them, no longer obscured by the reeds, but now out in the open, the islands floating on either side of the reed channel. The islands appear like flat, low spits of land with dried yellow reeds strewn on top of them, although there is no land but instead layers of reeds and nothing but lake water that extends for sixty feet below. On top of the islands, small reed houses with curved roofs squat clustered together. From one island rises a high wooden watchtower, the kind used centuries ago to warn of danger. The mustard-colored homes with their rounded roofs are the kind you might think that hobbits lived in, or at least an unusual people who have a fantastic sense of craftsmanship and style. The Uros, Juan shouts, guiding the boat down the middle of the channel and gesturing with one arm. Other small boats ply the channel or are docked against the islands. Women on one island wear bowler hats and bright lime green or pink pollera skirts and are hanging out laundry to dry. On another island, a couple of small kids kick a soccer ball around. Moored to some of the islands are large Totoro reed ships with curved prows that have been fashioned into puma heads. The whole area looks like some kind of fantastical, mythical world, as if it were lifted directly out of a page from The Travels of Marco Polo. Life among the Uros Islands, Juan tells me, is literally based upon the Totoro reed, 
a subspecies of Scenoplactus californicus. Scenoplactus is Latin and means plenty of grass material. Although long and cylindrical, Totoro reeds are not grasses, but a type of bulrush, a flowering plant related to the papyrus reed in Egypt. The Totora subspecies grows only in the shallow waters of Lake Titicaca and along Peru's northern coasts, where local fishermen bind them together to make small fishing craft. The reeds also grow, strangely enough, on Easter Island, nearly two and a half thousand miles away. Beneath the water, the Totora reeds' roots interweave with one another in a thick, buoyant mass, rather like a giant cork. Natives learned, most likely eons ago, to cut the living roots into blocks that they found growing along the shallow lake edge, which they then bound together with rope that was also made from Totora. After a few months, the roots in the blocks intermesh, and the inhabitants cover them with a layer of dry Totora reeds equal in thickness to the root layer. If the root mass is three feet thick, then the islanders lay down three feet of harvested reeds on top. Small foundations, consisting of another foot of dry Totora, are then laid down, and houses are built upon them. The raised Totora reed foundations become the floors. The houses are all one-roomed, with walls made from woven Totora reed mats, one mat forming each of a house's four sides. The roofs are fashioned from two large Totora mats, woven even more tightly together, so that water cannot penetrate. The mats are then joined carefully together at the top, and are pulled out and down so that they form large rounded eaves that project around the walls like a Totora reed tent. In a sense, a reed house is like an overturned boat. The roof is the equivalent of the hull, while the walls are like a ship's bulwarks. The upside-down hull is fastened into place to keep the rains from dribbling through the house and wetting the inhabitants. Instead, rainwater drains off the reed roofs onto the island, filtering down through the reeds before rejoining the lake and then evaporating again and beginning the cycle anew. Lake Titicaca's rainy season occurs during the Andean summer, from December to March. During the heavy rains, the islands are often soggy. Extra attention must then be taken to lay down fresh Totora on the island's floor. One motors into a reed inlet, cuts the engine, and our boat glides through the water until it nudges softly against the stiff Totora edge of his island home. His wife, Elsa, is there, wearing a typical ankle-length pollera, bright blue in color, a black bowler hat on her head, and a sweater the color of rouge. Elsa smiles, revealing two front teeth rimmed in gold. Juan's children are here, too, Sarah, fifteen, and Leonardo, thirteen. Leonardo is playing on the edge of the island, pulling a three-foot-long Totora reed boat along with a string. I step on to their island home, expecting it to sink like a waterbed underneath. It doesn't. Although the island is spongy and walking on it is a bit like walking on a stiff, giant marshmallow, a visitor's feet actually sink only a few inches each time. Juan's island is about one hundred feet long and half as wide. It is surprisingly stable, moving only when a motorboat's wake washes against it. When that occurs, you can feel a dull lifting and sinking as the waves pass smoothly underneath, like an underground ripple. The island is really a giant raft, and the houses are the raft's tiny cabins. The islanders' homes have a fresh, clean, Totora smell to them, like a hayloft or barn. "'What about storms?' I ask, looking at a bank of threatening clouds that seem to be approaching. "'Do they affect the islands?' "'They do,' Juan says. "'But the islands themselves are anchored with long ropes, nylon now, Totora in the past, that are tied to eucalyptus stakes planted firmly in the mud. The stakes are pounded into the shallow reed beds, and each island has at least eight or ten stakes anchoring it. When a storm comes, the islands shift on their moorings like floating ships attached to buoys, but they don't drift away. Gradually, Juan says, the Totora layer on the top of the island becomes water-laden and rots, so the islanders are constantly refurbishing them, paddling off into the Totora beds, cutting fresh reeds with metal scythes attached to wooden poles, then laying down fresh Totora again. It takes roughly eight months to a year for several families to create an island, Juan says. 
They vary in size, and may have from two to ten families on each of them. To weave the roof of a house takes one person a month. Three people can build the walls of a house in a day. During the wet season, they lay down a fresh layer of Totora every two to three weeks. We can't live without the Totora, Juan says, walking to the edge of his island to a grove of the dark green reeds. He reaches for one, then begins to carefully pull it up, root and all. We eat it, we sleep on it, we make our houses from it, we make our furniture with it, we use it to make boats, we use it as tea, we even use it as fuel, he says, stripping the white, root-like rhizome at the bottom of the six-foot plant. A foot-tall, mottled gray, black-crowned night heron walks up to us, one hesitant leg at a time. The bird is young and has intense orange eyes with black pupils, the eyes of a predator. Its name is Martin, from the bird's Spanish name, Martin Pescadero. It's one of the family's pets. We took it from its nest as a chick, Juan tells me. If you do so before the chick is a few days old, the chick will imprint on whichever human has taken it and not on its mother. The orphaned heron pecks at the freshly cut totora in front of us, looking for food. I'm surprised to see a cat walking toward us about twenty feet away. We have no mice, Juan says. Every island has cats, and thus are vermin-free, he explains. When the cat approaches too closely, the heron lunges toward it, pecking aggressively. He can take care of himself, Juan says, as the cat runs away. Juan hands me a short section of Totora root. The Aymara word for the root is chuyo. It's white and clean and looks like the end of a giant green onion. I bite into it. The taste is slightly sweet, and the sensation is like biting into a piece of white asparagus. I suddenly realize that living amid the vast maze of Totora reeds, which supply mats and houses and rope and twine and boats and furniture, is a bit like living in the middle of a lumber yard. Except that here you can even eat the tips of the lumber. Juan's wife shows me the cooking area, about ten feet from their house. She does all of her cooking in a small clay oven about two feet high that sits on a large stone placed on the reed floor. The stove has a foot-wide cavity for the fire and two small holes above on which to place pots. A metal pot hangs nearby, suspended from a piece of twine made, of course, from Totora. Juan's wife, who smiles frequently, gets up at four in the morning, she says, unless it rains. If it's raining, she stays in bed. On most days, however, Elsa emerges from their house while it's still dark, lights a fire in the clay oven, and feeds the fire stalks of dry Totora. The Totora burns well, she says, but it's difficult to find dry Totora in the rainy season. Living on the island requires a lot of upkeep, Juan says. They're constantly repairing and refurbishing their Totora reed houses, boats, and the islands themselves. Still, I can't help but think that the islanders here pay no rent for their homes, have no mortgages, have plenty of free building materials, Totora, can transport themselves on Totora boats, if necessary, have an abundant supply of fresh drinkable water beneath their feet, can hunt ducks and grebes, and can find plentiful amounts of fish which they catch in nets. Having visited new settlements on Peru's barren desert coast, where people live in shacks made from whatever materials they can find, and where they must find a job in order to buy basic things like food and water, I find the Urus Islanders to be far better off. They've clearly mastered their watery environment. Juan takes me to my hotel, basically an extra house on the island. He opens the Totora reed door and turns on a light. Juan has installed power here in the form of a small solar panel and a low wattage bulb. He purchased the solar panel with a five-year loan from the government. Two wooden beds adorn my room with mattresses and thick woolen blankets. It's neat and clean, and Elsa has decorated the walls with weavings bought on the mainland. Juan leads me to a smaller Totora house and indicates that this is the bathroom. He's installed a sink and a commode toilet that is glistening white. The islanders themselves maintain tiny outhouse islands nearby, where their waste is absorbed by the Totora reed roots. The guesthouse and bathroom have electricity, Juan says, but there is none in the larger house where they live next door. 
Electric power is only for the tourists, he says. Juan and his wife charge $10 a night. I hope to eventually be able to house 20 people, he says. Juan's been working on his hotel project for 10 years and has three other small hotels under construction. Later in the evening, after the family has gone to sleep, I wander about. It's dark and quiet among the floating reed islands. Few of the inhabitants have lights of any kind, and most people are in bed by seven or eight o'clock. The air is cold and still, and in the distance, beyond the reed beds, I can see the lights of Puno glimmering, spreading up into the hills and rimming the black lake like a wash of jewels. Overhead stretches an almost equally intense, glimmering, milky way, the stars etched into the night sky, and with even some galaxies visible, like faint puffs of smoke. I return to my Totora Reed room, climb under the covers, and try to go to sleep, but the intense cold keeps me awake. After about an hour I pull out my down sleeping bag, put it on the bed, climb inside, and fall immediately to sleep. Early the next morning, Juan and I take a small wooden boat out to check on the fishnets he set the day before. Juan stands and oars the boat through the reed canals. Yellow-winged blackbirds flit about the Totora, calling in raucous, melodic voices, as do sparrow-sized, many-colored rush tyrants, fittingly colored green, black, yellow, and blue. Long, flowing water plants, looking like bottle brushes, undulate in the translucent water below us. As we pass by stands of reeds, we begin to see plastic bottles bobbing on the surface. Juan says they're floats attached to nylon nets. Juan has set his own translucent green net closer to a certain patch of Totora. The edges of the reed beds are the best place to catch small carachis, the preferred native fish, bony yet tasty. Although more than 15,000 species of fish live in the world's oceans, and more than 2,000 live in the Amazon River Basin, the lake we are gliding on, at 12,500 feet, has a mere 26 native species. Around three million years ago, a small fish related to the pup fish somehow worked its way up the Andes River systems and finned its way into Lake Titicaca. Like Charles Darwin's ancestral finch species that blown out to the Galapagos Islands, eventually gave rise to thirteen separate species, so too did Titicaca's first finned visitor give rise to twenty-four of the lake's twenty-six native species. The other two species are closely related catfish. Juan has set his floatless net with small stones, so that the net is invisible from the surface. He finds it easily, however, by recognizing the Totora reed outlines, similar to how city dwellers recognize landmarks while driving down a street. On market days, Juan says, the villagers retrieve their nets at 1 a.m. in the dark using no lights. Juan says that they can find their way to their nets simply by following the topography of the reeds and with the light of the stars or moon. Finally, Juan stops, puts down the oars, reaches over, and finds the rim of his net underwater. He then begins to pull it in, bit by bit, the thin green filaments piling into the bottom of the boat, with an occasional silver-yellow carachi emerging as well, snared by its gills and flapping. Juan extracts each carachi, only about four or five inches long, and places it squirming inside a small ceramic bowl. After about a half an hour, he has retrieved perhaps twenty of them. Blackbirds squawk and fight nearby. In the distance, I can see other lone fishermen pulling in their nets, hand over hand. Like Juan, they use wooden boats, not Totora ones, although Juan says the older Urus islanders, such as his father, still use the small Totora reed boats they call balsas. Do you want to see the goddess of the lake, the Mamacocha? Juan asks suddenly while pulling the last arm length of net into the boat. I nod my head. We now head out on another excursion, this time through the maze of natural canals that slice and wind their way through the reeds toward shore. We pass other small boats, a man often standing and oaring, a woman wearing a bowler hat in the prow, and between them a huge pile of freshly cut green totora, stacked chest high. The crews call out to one another in Aymara, everyone seeming to know everyone else, even though there are some two thousand people 
who live on the Uros Islands. Although people here have mostly stopped using small Totora reed boats, they haven't given up building large ones. In 1912, a year after discovering the Inca ruins of Machu Picchu, Hiram Bingham ventured out onto Lake Titicaca. He later wrote, Ages ago the lake dwellers learned to dry the Totora reeds, tie them securely in long bundles, fasten the bundles together, turn up the ends, and so construct a fishing boat or balsa. Large balsas, constructed for use in crossing the rough waters of the deeper portions of the lake, are capable of carrying a dozen people and their luggage. Once I saw a plowman and his team of oxen being ferried across the lake on a bulrush Totora reed raft. One of the more highly speculative of the Bolivian writers, Signor Poznansky of La Paz, believes that gigantic balsas were used in bringing ten-ton monoliths across the lake to the ancient city of Tijuanaco. My ancestors used to live on reed boats, Juan tells me matter-of-factly, continuing to oar our boat down a canal. When the Incas arrived in this area, my ancestors moved out onto the lake with their boats. That's when they began living in the reeds. Look there, he says, jutting out his chin and pointing with it. In the distance, a small island begins to loom, an island seemingly made up of massive round gray boulders. That's Foroba, he says. The oars dip and drip water, then dip and drip water again, the boat gliding smoothly ahead. A flightless grebe, dark brown with a white neck and rust-colored head, flushes from the Totora ahead of us, propelling itself like a skipping torpedo across the lake before sinking into the water again. This grebe lives only on Lake Titicaca and nearby lakes. Long ago it lost its ability to fly. My grandparents used to call Foroba the Island of the Devils, Juan says. It had sirens that lured people there. No one went near it. We touch ground on the island's edge, stepping off onto dry land. Massive gray boulders like Naguchi sculptures loom above us. A long wooden dock protrudes from the island out toward the shore. Because the lake has sunk nearly twenty feet in the last quarter century, most likely due to global warming, the dock now sits stranded high in the air and forty feet from the lake's edge. In 1978, the Peruvian government declared the entire sweep of Totoro wetlands in this part of Lake Titicaca a national reserve, much to the disappointment of the Uros Islanders. Few of them wanted the state controlling natural resources that they had used and taken care of for centuries. My father fought against it, Juan says. When the Peruvian government went ahead with the reserve anyway, Juan's father and the rest of the islanders promptly chased the reserve guards out of the area. The Reserva Nacional del Titicaca exists more on maps in Lima than amid the labyrinth of reed beds on Lake Titicaca. On one side of Foroba Island, two white buildings with A-frame corrugated tin roofs protrude from the ground, built by the government as guard houses for the reserve. Both are empty when we arrive. A local watchman from the Uros Islands is supposed to be here, but is absent. One of the buildings is open and contains a dilapidated museum. Inside we find a few photos and posters of other reserves in Peru hanging from the walls. The photos are badly faded. Juan and I hike up a trail to the top of the island. From its summit, we discover a panoramic view over the vast beds of Totora, with the Uros Islands and their houses a splash of green and yellow in the distance. To the west, the city of Puno spreads out along the bay, some of its tin roofs sparkling in the sun. A sweep of brown hills rises like a mantle behind it. Beside us, in a small enclave formed by two massive gray boulders, sit a couple of clay pots, two small woven tapestries, and a small pile of burnt ashes. Offerings to the Mamacocha, Juan says, the goddess of the sea and lakes. On land, they make offerings to the Earth Mother, the Pachamama, he tells me. Here we make them to the Water Mother, the Mamacocha. It's the Mamacocha who controls the waters in the oceans and the lakes. It is she who is responsible for making the waters calm or rough, and whether fish and totora and waterfowl will be abundant or scarce, Juan tells me. Juan looks out over the lake and points to the signs below of a much higher water level before. Ever since 1986, the lake water has been falling, 
he says. There is less rain, and rain feeds the lake. Without rain, the Totora dies. We pray to the Mamakocha, he says, so that she'll make the Totora grow again. On another boulder nearby, someone has set up several small piles of hand-sized rocks. The rock piles are offerings called apachetas. Burnt sticks lie in front of the piles, and a piece of worn clothing hangs nearby. It's the work of the shamans, Juan says. More than four hundred years ago, a Jesuit priest named Barnabi Cobo observed that the Andean Indians worshipped the sun, water, earth, and many other things that they held to be divine. In each of these cases, they believed that these things had the power to make or preserve what was necessary for human life, and this was always their main interest. These Indians used two names to designate their gods. One of the names was Vilca, and the other Huaca. Both of them are used in the same way, and mean not only any god or idol, but also all places venerated and where sacrifices were made. It's clear that Foroba Island, an outcrop of bedrock, is a living Huaca, or shrine. Rocks, rock outcrops, and mountains were sacred places to the Incas, and continue to be with many Andean natives. Ironically, the Peruvian state tried to implant its own symbol of authority on this ancient site by locating a park outpost here. Their attempts, however, seem to have been largely ignored. The locals continue to make offerings to the Mamacocha and to other spirits, ignoring the state and its demands, just as the Uros islanders ignored the demands of the Incas and the conquistadors five centuries earlier. We row back toward Juan's home, down a labyrinth of canals that wind their way through the reeds. The beds themselves are alive with waterfowl. Juan points out a black gallina de agua, a squat Andean coot the islanders like to eat. Even though they live in a reserve, some of the islanders hunt with shotguns made by a man who uses old water pipes for gun barrels. The islanders mix saltpeter, charcoal, and sulfur together, and then test a bit with a match. If the handmade gunpowder burns quickly, Juan says, it's good to use. Plastic bottles and other trash bob in some of the canals. Juan says they have a service on the islands that takes trash to the mainland. He blames the trash on national Peruvian tourists. Farther along, we pass two small A-frame buildings, isolated in the reeds, each painted bright green and bearing a cross on the top of its corrugated metal roof. Therefore the saints, Juan says, who is Catholic. I ask which ones. Santiago, he says, but he seems uncertain. Pedro? he then asks himself rhetorically. He shakes his head, unsure. Like elsewhere in the Andes, Catholic saints here must wait in line behind a long line of gods, goddesses, and spirits. A priest comes out of Puno, Juan says, and gives mass at each of these small chapels on that particular saint's day. Juan says there are also Adventists here. How many? Fifty? The rest are Catholics? Yes, he answers, and continues pulling on the oars. But the Catholics on the Uros are Catholics similar to himself. Juan doesn't go to Mass. Instead, he makes offerings to the Mamacocha. He says there are about eight shamans on the islands. Each learned from their fathers and took over shamanic duties when their fathers died. There are also brujos, witches, he says. The witches can cause you harm or can cause harm to your island or possessions. If you could have anything in the world, what would it be? I ask him. Juan thinks a minute, still rowing. Una chocita, a small house, he says finally, meaning on the mainland. Juan and his wife have only elementary school educations, he says. He wants his two children to go to college. Thirteen-year-old Leonardo already wants to be an engineer. It's difficult to find work on the mainland without an education, Juan says. Right now, his two children row forty minutes each morning to Chuyuni, the nearest town on shore, then take a bus to Puno to go to school. They require books and clothes and other things, he says. Juan and his wife want to secure their futures. That is the reason for Juan and Elsa's hotel, I realize. The Reed Hotel is a net set not for fish, but for tourists, which Juan hopes will one day power his kids into good professions. 
The people who are most content on the islands are those who have never been to school, Juan says, meaning anything above elementary school or la primaria. Juan hopes that his kids will one day have houses on the mainland and a life filled with all the advantages and amenities that mainland life has to offer. In the meantime, as their hotel business searches for its footing, at six o'clock every Sunday morning Juan's wife arrives at Acora, after rowing to shore and taking a bus in order to attend the weekly market. There she sells or trades dried fish and fresh totora for potatoes, wheat, barley, quinoa, and anything else she might need. It's an exchange the Uros Islanders have carried on for centuries, capturing the resources of the lake and trading those resources to the land-dwellers who cultivate the soil and tend the herds. The land-dwellers eat the totora roots and feed the rest to their sheep, guinea pigs, alpacas, and cattle. We turn into the main canal and suddenly see the sweep of blue water and the sky boiling with muscular white cumulus clouds in the distance. A breeze kicks up, and Juan mentions that everyone on the island knows where the winds will come from. They know how the wind routinely shifts on the lake, and when that is most likely to happen, like sailors. If the families on one island decide they want to move, they wait until the wind and currents are right, pull up their stakes, and then drift toward the new location. Juan, in fact, is thinking of moving his own island. There are too many people around here, he says, although his island seems quite isolated to me. Do families on the same island ever have conflicts? I ask. Sometimes, he says. He continues rowing and then asks me, do you know about the juez, the judge? I shake my head. He oars the boat a little farther along in points. On a small island with a number of houses, a large tree saw, perhaps ten or more feet long, stands on end against a storage shed with a conical roof. That's the juez, Juan says. If two families really begin to get on each other's nerves, then the final arbiter of any dispute is not a jury but the long saw, or judge. In a very short while, islanders can cut their island in two. Then the two halves can take their differences elsewhere. We pass by a giant twin-hulled catamaran docked on one island and made from totora reeds. A number of Urus islanders have recently begun building the catamarans in order to take tourists out for cruises. Most tourists arrive on larger, motor-driven boats, stop off at one or two islands, buy some trinkets, take some photos, then return to Puno after a few hours' visit. Some spend more time and take a tour on the large reed boats. A few spend the night. A giant catamaran, perhaps thirty feet long, travels down the canal with the benefits of a small outboard, the dried yellow reeds bound tightly together with cords and formed into giant cigar-like pontoons, firm, sleek, and curved. A group of tourists snaps pictures of the islands as Juan oars our boat along, which soon begins to bob in the catamaran's wake. The islanders, Juan says, carefully regulate the tourist trade, charging each tourist a fee for entering the island area. On carefully designated days, the islands moored along the southern edge of the canal are visited, and the islanders sell their trinkets, small foot-long boats made from totora, or else fairly rudimentary weavings. On alternate days, the tourist boats visit the islands on the northern side. As we watch a boat disgorge a group of tourists onto an island, I realize that they are the real harvest now of the Urus Islanders. For centuries the islanders have relied upon the resources of the lake and have maintained their independence through the specialized knowledge it takes to make a living here. Now the tourists are the choicest catch, their visits generating the largest source of income on the islands. Are there any master Totora Reed boat builders left on the lake? I ask, as we pass by another twin hulled ship, whose prows have been fashioned into puma heads. Old craftsmen who can make fine ships? In Bolivia, Juan says, on Suriki Island. Suriki is famous for its reed boat builders. In order to get to Suriki, which lies in the southeastern portion of the lake, you must first pass near the ancient city of Tiahuanaco, located just south of the lake. It was the Tiahuanacan culture, 
Thor Heyerdahl believed, that had spread down from the Andes, reached the Pacific Ocean, and then diffused its culture throughout the Pacific Islands by raft. Eventually, Heyerdahl stated, the Tiawanakans had reached Easter Island some 2,500 miles away. The enormous stone monolithic heads found on Easter Island, Heyerdahl had told me, greatly resembled the famous stone statues found high in the Andes at Tiahuanaco. To get to the ancient city, I traveled to La Paz in western Bolivia. Early one morning I board a bus that stops at various hotels in the city, picking up small clumps of tourists in twos, threes, and fours. A light drizzle falls on the black stone streets, while 21,000-foot Mount Iyamani, partially hidden in the distance, shows only its lower black flanks. The mountain's crown of blue and white ice lies hidden beneath sullen gray clouds. In 1546, a small group of Spanish conquistadors founded Nuestra Señora de la Paz on Bolivia's high altiplano, about twenty miles north of here. Three days later, after discovering that farther south an enormous protected bowl offered better shelter from the cold, they refounded their capital city there. During the next four centuries, La Paz gradually spread up the sides of what, geologically speaking, was an enormous erosional bowl. Eventually the city filled the bowl and crept up over the edge onto the Altiplano. The outer flanks of the city are now spreading rapidly outward, straight across the high plains. The bus grinds gears as it labors through the city, up the glistening cobbled streets and toward the sodden Altiplano above. After about a half hour we reach the edge of the bowl, flatten out, and then begin lumbering past the four- and five-story raw brick buildings of El Alto, a city of immigrants from the countryside. While the 900,000 inhabitants of La Paz live snugly fitted within their protected erosional bowl, more than a million inhabitants of El Alto live on the exposed flat plains above. At 13,615 feet, it's one of the highest major cities in the world. El Alto is also the fastest-growing city in Bolivia. The ground floor of nearly every building on its main streets, in fact, seems to have been converted into a ferretería, or hardware store, the doors open to the streets and overflowing with construction materials. Bolivian women in bowler hats and long pleated skirts push wheelbarrows piled with hardware goods, such as rolls of blue and green plastic or bales of wire. Sacks of cement lie piled on top of one another on the sidewalks, covered now in blue tarps. Because of today's drizzle, some of the women wear white plastic bags over their bowler hats, which were introduced by English railway workers in the 19th century. Other than their covered hats, the women go about in the rain unprotected. Sixty miles north of La Paz, we arrive at the outskirts of Tijuanaco, the ancient capital of a culture that sprang up upon the Altiplano in the first centuries after Christ. Gradually, by harnessing increasingly intensive forms of agriculture, the Tijuanaco culture grew in size, power, strength, and complexity. The civilization then entered a classic period, during which the empire extended its range southward into what is now northern Chile and northward into southern Peru. At its height, the city of Tijuanaco had a population of 100,000 people, with an additional 300,000 inhabitants living in the nearby countryside. At the time, it was one of the largest cities in the world. For roughly a thousand years, the Tijuanaco culture flourished, until by A.D. 950 its builders' hard-wrought empire abruptly disappeared. Left behind were giant pyramids of adobe and stone, towering, enigmatic standing figures, and a residue of myths about the civilization's origins, rise, and collapse. According to the Spanish chronicler Ciesa de Leon, who wrote in the 1550s, Tijuanaco is famous for its great buildings and for its stone idols of human size and shape, with the features beautifully carved, so much so that they seem the work of great artists or masters. They are so large that they seem like small giants. Some of the stones are very worn and wasted, and there are others so large that one wonders how human hands could have brought them to where they now stand. The Spaniards who visited the ruins, and who had only recently arrived in the New World, had no understanding of South America's history. They were familiar with the Incas, whom they had conquered, 
but they knew nothing about this ancient city who had constructed it, or why it had been abandoned. Both genetic and linguistic evidence supports the theory that the languages spoken by the first inhabitants of South America eventually separated into the multitude of tongues, about 1,500, that were spoken there when the first Europeans arrived. Like the first meandering fish to arrive in Lake Titicaca, the cultures of South America's first inhabitants, along with their languages, gradually evolved into a bewildering variety of new forms. Roughly 10,000 years ago, the first evidence of agriculture appeared in the South American archaeological record. By 3000 BC, roughly the same time as the Egyptians were building their first pyramids, people on Peru's northern coast had begun building ceremonial architecture and terraced mounds. By AD 100, the first state or kingdom arose, that of the Moche, AD 100 to 800. It was the highly stratified Moche society that constructed the adobe pyramids I had visited during my stay with Tor Heyerdahl on Peru's northern coast. Meanwhile, two miles up in the Andes, along the high plains bordering Lake Titicaca, the Tiahuanaco culture gradually emerged nearly a thousand years before the Incas. The Tiahuanacans most likely spoke Aymara, and near the southern shores of Lake Titicaca they erected a beautiful city of stone, with soaring stepped pyramids, sunken courts, stone temples, and large enigmatic stone sculptures of humans whose eyes seemed to stare blankly at the heavens. By A.D. 950, however, the Tiahuanacan culture suddenly disappeared. By the time the Incas extended their own empire southward five hundred years later, the local Aymara farmers could no longer tell them who had created the giant monuments. When the Spanish chronicler Pedro de Ciesa de Leon showed up in the 1550s, he too queried the local inhabitants. When I asked the natives if these buildings had been built in the time of the Incas, they laughed at the question. However, they had heard from their forefathers that all that are there appeared overnight. Because of this, and because they also say that bearded white men were seen on the island of Titicaca, I say that it might have been that, before the Incas ruled, there were white people in these kingdoms, come from no one knows where, who did these things, and who, being few and the natives many, perished in the wars. Another Spanish chronicler, Bernabé Cobo, who visited roughly a hundred years later, was told that when the Inca emperor Tupac Inca Yupanqui first visited the Titicaca area in the late 1400s, he tried to find out by asking the natives of that town, of Tijuanaco, from where the stone for that ruined city had been brought and who had been its builder. The Indians answered that they did not know, nor did they have any information about when it had been built. Various chroniclers gradually continued gathering the receding fragments of memories and tales, trying to decipher the ruins' origins. The Spanish chronicler Pedro Sarmiento de Gamboa, for example, was told that a subsequent Inca emperor, Huayna Capac, visited Tijuanaco in probably around 1500. The emperor, it was said, had received news that the northern provinces of the Inca empire had rebelled he therefore hurried his return and came to Tijuanaco, where he prepared for war against the Quitos and Cayambis, and gave orders how the Urus people were to live, granting them the localities in which each tribe of them was to fish in the lake. He then visited the Temple of the Sun and the Huaca Shrine of Tiki Viracocha on the Island of the Sun, and sent orders that all those provinces should send troops to go to that war which he had proclaimed. The island of the sun the natives referred to is located in nearly the center of Lake Titicaca. According to this account, the Inca emperor visited the island on a fleet of rafts made from local Totora reeds, which were no doubt piloted by the Urus Indians, now vassals of the Inca empire. It's not surprising that the busy emperor took the time to visit the island, as it was one of the most sacred sites in their realm, the very birthplace of the sun and stars and which had been brought into existence by the creator god, Contiki Viracocha. According to another chronicler, Juan de Betanzos, the creation had taken place in the following manner. In ancient times, the land and the provinces of Peru were dark, and neither light nor daylight existed. During this time of total night, they say that a lord emerged from a lake in this land of Peru, 
and that his name was Contiti Vericocha. When he had emerged from the lake Titicaca, he went from there to a place near the lake where today there is a town called Tijuanaco. Then they say that he suddenly made the sun and the day and ordered the sun to follow the course that it follows. On the island of the sun, wrote another chronicler, Viracocha then ordered that the sun, moon, and stars should come forth and be set in the heavens to give light to the world, and it was so. This done, Viracocha made a sacred idol in that place, as a place for worship and as a sign of what he had there created. Wrote still another, In the city of Tijuanaco, the creator, Viracocha, used clay to form all the nations that there are in this land. He painted each one with the clothing to be used by that nation, and he also gave each nation the language they were to speak, the songs they were to sing, as well as the foods, seeds, and vegetables with which they were to sustain themselves. After creating mankind and bestowing upon him the arts of civilization, Viracocha next journeyed north to Cusco, then along the Andes, and finally down to the coast of Ecuador, working his miracles and instructing his created beings. There, with the Pacific Ocean as a backdrop, Viracocha stopped to make one final and dramatic speech to the people he had created. He told them that people would one day come who would say that they were Viracocha, their creator, and that they were not to believe them, but that in the time to come he would send his messengers who would protect and teach them. Having said this, he went to sea with his two servants, and went traveling over the water as if it were land, without sinking. For they appeared like foam over the water, and the people, therefore, gave them the name of Viracocha, which is the same as to say the foam of the sea. According to Inca myth, then, it was Viracocha who had created the sun and the stars on the island of the sun, and it was he who had created the moon nearby, the Incas thus venerated the northern part of the island where they believed this miracle to have occurred. The Incas built an important shrine, and the shrine thus became a great pilgrimage center, with penitents arriving from throughout the empire. What the Spanish chroniclers didn't know, however, was that long before the arrival of the Incas, the same island had already been considered sacred by the Tijuanaco culture, the Tijuanacans, too, had built shrines on the island, and the site had similarly been a great pilgrimage center. No doubt the Tijuanacans' myths had described a similar story, that something miraculous and powerful had occurred here, perhaps the origin of their world. When Inca armies finally arrived at Lake Titicaca's shores five hundred years after Tijuanaco's collapse, they not only physically appropriated the former empire's territory, but they also appropriated the former empire's most sacred island, incorporating it into their own mythology. For although the Tijuanaco culture may have disappeared, the island of the sun had remained a sacred center for the local inhabitants. By physically and figuratively incorporating the island into the fabric of their own culture, the Incas were thus able to increase both their own ruling legitimacy and also their mythological power. Amid the ruins of Tijuanaco, I walk with a small tour group and our guide, climbing up the stone steps of the Acapana, a pyramid six stories high. A Japanese couple is also on the tour. The fortyish husband has a Nikon camera slung from his neck and carries a small notebook. He scribbles furiously when our Bolivian guide says anything and closely shadows the guide to make sure he misses nothing. During a pause in the guide's speech, I ask the man if he's taking notes for any particular reason. I have been to over fifty countries, he tells me in broken Spanish. I try and tie everything together. His name is Hiroshi, and he's a firm believer that South American and Central American cultures once had contact in the past. Our Bolivian guide is in agreement. North, South, and Central America, he assures us, all once had contact— the British Columbian totem poles look very similar to the giant stone statues the Tijuanacans left, the guide says. Hiroshi scribbles furiously, nodding his head. Both the Aztecs and the Tijuanacans carved similarly in stone, our guide continues, and it's not a coincidence. The only problem with that theory, I reflect, is that at least five hundred years separate the collapse of the Tijuanacan culture 
and the rise of the Aztecs. If the Aztecs had arrived here, they would have had to have traveled three thousand miles from their homeland, and even then would have found only ruins, and then they would have had to find their way home. Tiahuanaco is an unforgettable sight, however, and would have impressed any visitor, no matter from what region of the globe. The Acapana Pyramid has seven terraces, like the step pyramids of Egypt. A thousand years ago, visitors ascended the pyramid by walking through a stone gate that had a crouching stone figure on either side, each holding a severed human head. On top, where priests apparently once sacrificed llamas and alpacas and even humans, one can look out over the layout of the ancient city below, with its walled compounds, subterranean temple, massive stone gates, and giant standing figures. The whole complex is apparently laid out with astronomical designs. Archaeologists, for example, have excavated humans who were sacrificed, and then buried in an area where, at sunset on the day of the winter solstice, a beam of sunlight appears through a temple doorway. Buried in a corner of the Acapana, beneath where I am standing, archaeologists also discovered the skeletons of seventeen humans, all without heads, the majority of them young males in their twenties. Fragments of Tiahuanacan ceramic pots, meanwhile, often depict warriors wearing puma skull masks, decapitating various enemies, and holding their severed heads aloft. The warriors' belts are adorned with more human heads, all of which have had their tongues torn out. At its height, in A.D. 600 to 800, and while Europe languished in the Dark Ages, Tiahuanaco contained a core of large, sumptuous buildings that could be seen for miles. In the distance rose the sacred peaks of the Andes, the two pyramids here possibly mirroring those peaks, while the city itself lay studded with stone portals and enormous statues, both of which were carved in intricate detail, as finely as medieval stained glass, displaying for all to see the stories and symbols of the Tiahuanacan religion. At the height of the empire, vast herds of llamas and alpacas roamed the Altiplano, while beyond the city's core extended the residential neighborhoods, dotted with gardens and separated by well-traveled streets or by artificially constructed canals and ponds. At one point, Tiahuanacan engineers designed and built an ingenious water system that allowed water to flow to the top of the Acapana Pyramid, then to emerge suddenly and rush down its sides. The water disappeared mysteriously into each level before emerging again at the next, possibly symbolizing the waterfalls and water cycle on the nearby mountains. The pyramids themselves are thought to have been covered in metal sheets or else with finely embroidered and colored cloth, rich in symbols and imagery. On the high plateau surrounding the lake, engineers dug canals and created raised earthen beds that allowed 40% more crops to be grown than with previous methods. Meanwhile, llama trains headed from Tiahuanaco down the Andes to bring back seafood and other goods from the coast. Pack trains traveling down the eastern side of the Andes, meanwhile, visited the Amazon rainforest, returning with large quantities of coca leaves, jaguar skins, resins, oils, and hallucinogenic plants such as ayahuasca. Mummies, recently disinterred here, in fact, were found accompanied by snuff trays, once filled with finely ground hallucinogenic plants. The plants induced not just trances, but allowed the imbibers to enter a three-dimensional spirit world that would have rivaled the best animated films currently shown in IMAX 3D. Priests, astronomers, engineers, potters, metallurgists, weavers, stonemasons, soldiers, peasants, road and canal builders, and tax specialists all congregated in the city. This was a highly stratified state-level society, one of only six such areas where state-level societies have emerged in the world. The others were Mesoamerica, northern China, Mesopotamia, the Indus Valley, and Egypt. Not surprisingly, making a pilgrimage to Tiahuanaco was like visiting another world. For the first time, a visitor would have glimpsed the fabled city lying beside the sacred blue lake of Titicaca, with the Mecca-like island of the sun set like a jewel in its center. Gold-colored reed boats would have ferried pilgrims to the sacred island while the whole area was surrounded by ice-topped mountains whose summits were inhabited by gods. With one's visit enhanced by the use of hallucinogenic drugs, this would have been an unforgettable, mind-bending 
once-in-a-lifetime experience. From on top of Akapana Pyramid, we descend and walk onto a stone-lined square. An acoustic amplifier has been cut into one of the large blocks, a kind of stone trumpet with a narrow opening on one side and a wide opening on the other. Our guide addresses us from one side, and his voice booms at us. Attention, old pilgrims! I can imagine a priest shouting. The Tiawanakins once played music on clay trumpets, so perhaps they once blew their trumpets into the amplifier orifice as well. We walk over to a large stone figure, its sightless eyes still peering into the distance and towering over us. Incised into its stone body are all kinds of carved symbols. On its right side, the stone around its neck has rough hack marks. Spanish priests once tried to sever the head, our guide says, as they had done with many pagan monuments throughout the conquered Inca Empire. Carved from hard andesite, however, the ancient god withstood the priest's blows, and the bewildered clergymen had obviously been forced to rethink their strategy. On the god's right shoulder the priest subsequently carved a Christian cross into the stone, defiling the natives' religious symbols by superimposing their own. The priests who came to Peru were sent to root out false beliefs, a process they called extirpating idolatry. They took seriously their own god's command. Psalm chapter 81, verse 9. You shall have no foreign god among you. You shall not bow down to an alien god. And Exodus chapter 34, verse 14. For thou shalt worship no other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous god. As a result, priests physically destroyed as many of the natives' false idols as they could, doing everything in their power to wipe out the local religion. What the Spanish priests had a difficult time rooting out, however, was the Pan-Andean belief that powerful spirits controlled the natives' resources, the rains, the water, the fertility of animal flocks and fields, the lightning, the earthquakes, the movements of the sun, the moon, and stars, and that these spirits were embedded in the very landscape itself. Tiahuanaco, one of the most famous and renowned shrines in the Andes, was purposely built near a sacred body of water that mirrored the sky and resembled the ocean. Its inhabitants purposely erected pyramids that appeared to have imitated the sacred Andean peaks, the same peaks whose glaciers provided water to the rivers, lakes, and crops below. The city's creators designed Tiahuanaco as a sacred center dedicated to guaranteeing the continued fertility and abundance of the surrounding crops and animals, and thus guaranteeing the very existence of life itself. To the Tiawanakan's descendants and to those who lived in the now ruined Inca Empire, the Christians' god might be powerful, but their own gods were equally so. Those of the sun, moon, lightning, water, stars, mountains, and earth. All of these gods, not just one, had to be honored in order for the world to continue as it was, so that the often precarious hold that humans had on life could be maintained and protected. I wander past the gateway of the sun, whose massive portal bears a skull-like face thought to be that of Viracocha, the god of creation. The doorway is ten feet high, the entire frame thirteen feet wide, and the whole is cut from a single enormous block of hard andesite stone, Andesite is an igneous rock known to be formed by the tremendous friction that occurs when two continental plates, such as those that form the Andes, meet far beneath the ocean. It is also the main ingredient of the crust on Mars. The stone that the sun gateway was carved from was thus originally created beneath the sea, was then lifted through geological processes 12,500 feet up into the Andes, only to be subsequently cut by Tiahuanacan stonemasons at a quarry across the lake, near the modern town of Copacabana. Ancient craftsmen then transported the block ninety miles to Tiahuanaco. The gateway portal weighs ten tons, which is about the same weight as two adult elephants. It was most likely transported across the lake by a gigantic reed boat, then dragged for roughly six miles to its present location. 
I look up at the face of Viracocha, whose head protrudes in a bas-relief from the smooth stone fronting. The face looks something like a cross between a human skull and a puma. The eyes are hollow sockets, the snout protrudes, and writhing snakes have been carved for hair. The decapitated heads of enemies hang from Viracocha's belt, while the friezes of thirty-two more gods surround him, covering the portal. Clearly this was a god to fear. Like the Old Testament god, Viracocha required offerings and demanded to be worshipped. He was a god to be obeyed and feared, yet no doubt also adored. Two days later, a bus deposits me one morning on the southeastern edge of Lake Titicaca, near the town of Watahata, alongside a lonely two-lane highway. The road runs along the lake's eastern side and is bordered by tall eucalyptus trees. I'm on my way to Suriki Island in search of Herdal's boat builder, a man whose name, I found out, is Paulino Esteban. By now he must be at least eighty years old. The bus I arrive in from La Paz was a local one, full of women with derby hats and men with gnarled and weathered hands from working in the fields. I watch the bus head north, then walk across the highway to a small, plain white restaurant that overlooks the lake. A girl is out in front, cleaning the restaurant's aging sign. I ask her about boats leaving for Suriki Island. It already left, she says. Will there be another one? If there are enough passengers. Are there any other passengers? Just you. Will there be another boat today? I don't know. The owner of the restaurant comes out, carrying a towel and wiping his hands. He has no clients. He is small and affable and introduces himself. His name is Jose. I ask Jose if he's heard of a boat builder named Paulino Esteban. He immediately brightens. Yes, he lives over there, he says, pointing back down the highway. A ten-minute walk. Jose tells me that Paulino has a sign out on the highway, that I can't miss it. I start walking back down the road, the lake on my right, low hills and occasional houses on the left. After about five minutes, I come upon an elderly couple hoeing potatoes in a field. The woman has gray hair and wears a typical pleated skirt or pollera, the color of dull maroon. They both grip short wooden hoes and are bent over like pretzels, working the earth slowly. The scene reminds me of Van Gogh's peasant man and woman planting potatoes, a portrait of a similar couple sowing New World potatoes outside a small village in Holland. Van Gogh painted it nearly four hundred years after the humble tuber had traveled from the Andes to Europe, where it eventually became an essential crop. It begins to drizzle, so I take refuge under a tall eucalyptus tree. The couple never stops hoeing. When the rain lets up, I move on, leaving the old potato planters bent over their field, slowly dragging their hoes through the soil. Clouds hover over the lake, etched by sun, the lake's water silver and expansive. Eventually I arrive at a large white sign on the right side of the road that reads, in Spanish, Paulino Esteban, expert builder of the Ra II, Tigris, Uru, Matarangi I, II, and III expeditions. A dirt path runs down beside the sign toward the lake. Near the shore squats a giant Totora reed boat, covered with blue plastic to protect it from the rain. On the right side of the path, and in a row, sit several one-story houses made from Totora reed, but with glass windows, tin roofs, and wooden frames. I walk down toward the dock. A middle-aged Bolivian man with a small pot-belly and closely cropped hair approaches me. He is one of Paulino's sons, Porfirio, and is thirty-five years old. Porfirio says his father is in one of the small houses nearby. A few minutes later, Paulino comes out. He's short, lean, and handsome, eighty-two years old with gray hair, high cheekbones, worn pants, tire sandals, and a brown jacket. His handshake is soft, and his hands are slightly swollen. His fingernails are as thick and curved as the prows of wooden boats. I tell Paulino how I met Tor Heyerdahl many years ago, amid the pyramids of Tucumé on the northern coast of Peru. He smiles, turns, then waves for me to follow him. We walk down to the reed boat, and he begins to pull off the blue tarp that covers it. 
The raft is sleek and elegant. Its tightly bound hull is thirty-three feet long and is freshly made. A low Totora reed cabin sits on its center. It looks ready to cross an ocean. It's going to Norway, Paulino tells me, running one of his thick hands over the reeds. One of Herodal's relatives has commissioned the boat, he explains. When it's finished later this month, workers will load it onto a truck and take it down the Andes to a port in Chile. There it will be loaded onto a ship and sent on its way. Paulino leads me to one of the low buildings where he has a small museum set up. In the main room sit two six-foot-long Totora reed rafts, as well as two other miniature rafts about three feet long, all with diminutive masts and Totora reed sails. They are all beautifully built, as painstakingly put together as the raft outside. Paulino opens a drawer beneath a table and withdraws a thick, well-worn binder. It's bulging with plastic leaves of photos of Paulino and Heyerdahl in Morocco, in Egypt, in Iraq, and on Lake Titicaca. Underneath one of his fingers he taps a faded image of the Ra too, which he and three other Bolivians from Lake Titicaca built in Morocco. Porfirio walks in and says that he last saw Heyerdahl on Tenerife Island in 2000. Heyerdahl was excavating mysterious stone pyramids that he was certain were linked to Egypt. I ask Paulino how he met the Norwegian. Forty years ago, he says, Heyerdahl took a boat out to Suriki Island, where Paulino was born and lived at the time. Heyerdahl gathered the boat builders together and offered them a job. There was only one catch. Heyerdahl was looking for only the best boat builders, so he suggested a competition. Whoever could build the best small Totora reed boat, Heyerdahl would hire and take to Africa. There the winner would be asked to build a much larger raft that Heyerdahl wanted to sail across the ocean. None of the boat builders listening to him had ever seen an ocean. Most had never been farther than a few miles from Lake Titicaca. There were fifteen of them, Paulino says. They all wanted to go, but it was he who won the competition. What's your name? Paulino says Heyerdahl asked him. Paulino Esteban. What's the biggest boat you can build? Five, six meters? Fifteen, eighteen feet? Can you build a much larger boat? A boat that is fifteen meters? Fifty feet? Yes, Paulino answered although he had never built such a large raft before. Tor was very aware, very intelligent, Paulino says. He didn't want to take someone who didn't know how to build a good balsa. True to his word, Heyerdahl flew Paulino and also three other Aymara boat builders from Suriki Island to Morocco, where an enormous quantity of papyrus reeds had been gathered. There they began work on a reed boat, using the same techniques they used for the smaller boats they commonly made on Lake Titicaca. One of his three boat-building companions has died, Paulino says. Another is sick. Me? I'm okay, he says, grabbing my arm in a strong grip as proof. Thus, in 1970, in a garden compound in the ancient Phoenician port of Safi, Morocco, Paulino and his compatriots fashioned a 39-foot reed ship from papyrus reed, a bulrush that is closely related to Totora. Only ten months earlier, Heyerdahl had attempted to cross the Atlantic on a papyrus raft, the Ra-1, built by boat builders from Chad. The raft had traveled more than two thousand miles before it sank due to storms and structural problems. Now Heyerdahl was taking no chances. He'd assembled a team of the best reed boat builders in the world, all of whom just happened to be from Lake Titicaca. They knew how to build reed boats with a perfection no engineer, no model builder, no archaeologist in our modern world could emulate, Heyerdahl later wrote. Launched in May 1970, the Ra-2 ultimately journeyed 3,270 miles and landed on the shores of the Caribbean island of Barbados. By the time it arrived, however, Paulino was already back on his tiny two-mile-long island of Suriki. My grandfather taught me how to make Totora boats, Paulino says. My father had died, so my grandfather taught me. Did he make very big boats? I ask. No, four, five meters? 
12 to 15 feet. Not big ones. With sails? Yes, with Totoro reed sails. Do your children know how to build big boats? Yes, my son. It's he who is going to Norway to teach them. And you? Are you going? Me? No, I'm staying here. Aqui no mas. We both laugh. Paulino has trouble with one of his knees, he says, so doesn't want to take an airplane flight. He begins to flip through the photos, leaning forward and examining faded Polaroids of himself among the 3,000-year-old pyramids of Egypt, in Iraq, in Morocco, and in a host of other countries. Have you been to Norway? I ask. I know the whole world. Norway, Egypt, Israel, Damascus, Denmark, Spain, India, all for work. I made a reed boat and took it to Seville for the expo in 92. Last year, to Denmark I went. Which country did you like the most? Denmark. How about Norway? A little bit, Paulino says, flipping through the photos. Dinamarca es de luyo. Denmark is luxurious. A very nice country, he says. Good food, good people, not like other countries. What about India? I ask. It happens to be one of my favorite countries. No, too much smoke from exhaust. Bad food, he says. Paulino's wife comes in, and he says something to her in Aymara. A bit later, she returns with cups and a pot of mate de coca tea. Ten years ago, the family moved from Suriki Island to Huatahata, where we are now, to be closer to the highway. Nowadays, on Suriki, Paulino says... The inhabitants no longer make Totora reed boats, but wooden ones, which cost money to build but last for years. The old boat builder takes out a weathered copy of Heyerdahl's book Aku Aku about the Norwegian explorer's excavations on Easter Island, 2,500 miles off the coast of Chile. Beautiful place, Paulino says, running his hand over a photo in the book. For six months I was there. A Spanish adventurer, he says, invited him to build a giant reed raft on Easter Island in 1996. The adventurer's name was Quitin Munoz, and he, inspired by Heyerdahl, wanted to sail the raft from Easter Island to Australia. Eventually, Paulino built a 120-foot, 40-meter ship called the Matarangi, using the same subspecies of Totora that is found at Lake Titicaca, but that also grows in Easter Island's lakes. The Totora is bad there, Paulino says. It's much better here. Perhaps as a consequence, the Matarangi sank after only twenty days, when it was only a hundred eighty miles out to sea. Paulino constructed a second boat for Munoz three years later, the Matarangi II. It sailed from Arica, a port in northern Chile, and was initially bound for Asia, some 8,000 miles away. Munoz, however, lost half of the ship in the Pacific. Eventually, he limped into a port on the Marquesas Islands, where he ended the trip. The idea for Munoz's attempt to sail from Easter Island on a reed raft came from Tor Heyerdahl, of course. Heyerdahl had led a multidisciplinary team to Easter Island in 1955 in order to try to solve the mystery of who had built the enormous stone figures there, some of which stand over 33 feet high and weigh more than 80 tons. By contrast, the largest stone monolith at Tijuanaco, called the Bennett Monolith, is 24 feet high and weighs 20 tons. Heyerdahl was convinced, however, that ancient South Americans on rafts had discovered and populated this remote, seven-mile-wide outpost. But not just any South Americans. The seafarers who arrived on Easter Island, Heyerdahl theorized, were led by none other than the pale-skinned, bearded god Viracocha, who, according to Inca legend, had created mankind. After founding the civilization at Tijuanaco and disappearing over the water, from the shores of Ecuador, Viracocha and his followers, Heyerdahl believed, then traveled 3,500 miles on rafts made of balsa logs, or totora reeds, before arriving at Easter Island. It was Viracocha, Heyerdahl thought, who brought the arts of civilization to Polynesia, which for Heyerdahl meant the mastery of agriculture, stepped pyramids, the worship of a sun god, and the possession of rafts that could navigate across the seas. 
from Egypt, where the oldest civilization had originated, Heyerdahl believed that ancient mariners had carried the embers of that civilization across the Atlantic to the New World. The mariners, or their descendants, had then somehow traveled to the other side of South America, had climbed 12,500 feet up into the Andes, and had bestowed the blessings of Egyptian civilization upon the local people living on the high plateau around Lake Titicaca. As a result, the ancient Tiahuanacans soon began constructing stepped pyramids and cities of stone similar to those halfway across the world. The descendants of these mariners, whom Heyerdahl believed possessed Caucasian features and were pale-skinned, then departed on rafts across the Pacific Ocean. Viracocha and his fellow white gods eventually traveled amid the inhabited and uninhabited islands of the Pacific, disseminating their knowledge of stone carving, agriculture, and raft building all of the way to New Zealand, some 7,000 miles from the shores of Lake Titicaca. Viracocha, Heyerdahl believed, was thus not a god, but rather the leader of a group of bearded white men who had somehow arrived in Bolivia a thousand or more years before Columbus made landfall in the New World. It was they, and not the local Aymaras, who had introduced the knowledge of how to cut and carve stones, how to build cities and empires, and how to construct ocean-going rafts from the slenderest of reeds. As Heyerdahl explained in his 1971 book, The Ra Expeditions, reed boats of this distinctive type are still built in their hundreds on every side of this enormous inland sea, Lake Titicaca. They were built exactly in this way by the Aymara and Quechua Indians' fathers and grandfathers. This is exactly how they had looked four hundred years ago, also, when the Spaniards came to this lake and discovered Tiahuanaco's deserted ruins with their stepped platforms, pyramid and stone colossi, abandoned vestiges which, according to consistent traditions among the primitive Aymara Indians, were not the work of their own ancestors. They, the Aymaras, firmly believed the spectacular constructions to have been left since the morning of time by the Viracocha people. These were described as white men with beards, whose priest-king was Contiki Viracocha, the sun's representative on earth. At the outset, the Viracocha people had settled on the island of the sun, out in Lake Titicaca. Legend has it that it was they who built the first reed boats. The white and bearded men, it was claimed, had come forth in a flotilla of reed boats when first appearing to the local Indians, who, at the time, were ignorant of sun worship, architecture, and agriculture. These legends, which the Spaniards wrote down four hundred years ago, are still alive among the lakeside Indians. Many times I was addressed as Viracocha, still the word for white man although some Spanish chroniclers, copying down the oral histories of the Incas, did write that Viracocha was pale or white, other informants made no mention of this characteristic. Most anthropologists today believe the myth of a white god was more an artifact of the sixteenth-century Spaniards writing down these stories and introducing their own biases from their European backgrounds. And while it is true that various ethnic groups in the Andes referred to the Spaniards at various times as Viracochas, it is more likely that this was due to the fact that the Spaniards, who had just conquered the vast Inca Empire with guns, horses, and steel, were perceived as extremely powerful and exotic beings, just like the natives' idea of Viracocha and his followers. Meanwhile, sun worship, architecture, and agriculture go back at least 8,000 years in Peru, long before the emergence of the Tiahuanaco culture and the stories of bearded gods. According to Heyerdahl, however, Paulino Esteban was one of the last purveyors of an ancient raft-building tradition that had originally arisen in Egypt, but had been reduced to a tiny island in the middle of Lake Titicaca, some 8,000 miles distant from Egypt's shores. Do you think they used rafts to travel from Peru to Easter Island in ancient times? I ask Paulino, who continues to examine old pictures of he and Heyerdahl in different parts of the world. Yes, 
Paulino says, but by the tone of his voice I can sense that he is equivocal. He is quiet for a moment and is obviously thinking. I like the ocean, he says finally, but it doesn't have sweet water. You can't drink it. Here on Titicaca the water is clean. As Paulino continues flipping through photos from the past, I can't help but wonder why Heyerdahl, who was so impressed by the great detail Egyptian artists lavished on their tomb paintings, didn't notice the most obvious trait of all. While some of those paintings depicted the Egyptians' reed ships down to the minutest details in their rigging and oars, why did they not show traces of the white, bearded gods Heyerdahl so firmly believed carried civilization from Egypt to the New World? I had seen plenty of Egyptian tomb paintings myself. Every single one depicted people with dark brown or black Nubian skin, dark eyes and black hair. Fixated on his old world to new world theory, Heyerdahl, with his Contiki voyage, had planted himself smack in the middle of a long-standing anthropological debate involving various theories about the origin of civilizations. During the latter half of the nineteenth century and the first four decades of the twentieth, for example, the idea of diffusionism had dominated anthropological thought. The theory hypothesized that most civilizations had a common origin and, in its extreme form, later called hyperdiffusionism, the theory held that all civilizations had derived from a single source, Egypt. Adherents of the theory believed that by natural diffusion, the physical transmission of culture from one area to another, basic inventions had gradually spread across the world only to be rediscovered in the New World by early European explorers. Heyerdahl, who was trained as a zoologist, was born in 1914. He thus grew up in a Europe where diffusionism was widely accepted. By the time hyperdiffusionism had become discredited in the late 1950s, however, Heyerdahl had already carried out his 1947 Contiki voyage. Unfazed by the theory's collapse, the explorer and amateur anthropologist would spend the rest of his life trying to prove that South American civilizations had derived from the Egyptian civilization. In 1971, nearly a quarter of a century after his Contiki expedition, Heyerdahl wrote in his book The Ra Expeditions, Who were right? the isolationists or the diffusionists. The jump from Morocco to the Mayan civilization in Mexico was not as startlingly absurd as the distance between the farthest points, Egypt and Peru. So I decided to build a reed boat to prove the possibility of contact between the old world and the new. Since Heyerdahl was essentially a hyperdiffusionist, then it made perfect sense that if other civilizations later cropped up in Peru, Bolivia, Mexico, Central America, Easter Island, or on Hawaii, they must all have somehow had contact with the cultural traditions that arose in the Middle East thousands of years earlier. In Mexico's southern rainforest, for example, is an archaeological site called Palenque, which is studded with Mayan pyramids. Heyerdahl visited the site, and not surprisingly, was soon convinced that the Mayans must have had contact with Egypt. As he later wrote, Here was a large pyramid in the deep rainforest. Had ordinary Indians put it, the pyramid, there? Or had people other than primitive hunters from Siberia mixed with the aboriginal population in Mexico's primeval forests? To Heyerdahl, the answer was clear. Mexico's Mayas and Aztecs, Peru's Incas and Bolivian's Tiahuanacans all owed the existence of their advanced cultures to the same source, Egypt. It was that simple. While Heyerdahl continued to search for evidence that would support his theory, diffusionism itself was gradually replaced by the American school of anthropological thought, which was heavily influenced by evolutionary biology and was dubbed ecological anthropology. According to this new school, just as dissimilar organisms often evolve similar adaptations when confronted with similar environments, an example would be the snow-white coats of certain rabbits, mink, and mice in the Arctic, so too did people at different places and times 
invent similar cultural adaptations in clothing, architecture, social organization, and so on, when confronted with similar environmental challenges. According to this school of thought, civilizations in the New World arose only after lengthy independent gestation periods and entirely removed from contact with the Old World. If early agrarian societies in Peru and the Middle East utilized similar hydraulic works, social structures, and sun-dried adobe houses, these analogous traits were due to similar strategies adopted in order to solve similar problems of survival, not because of contact with one another. The Urus people around Lake Titicaca, for example, confronted with figuring out the best way of making a living around a body of water filled with abundant fish, waterfowl, and extensive reed beds, ended up making reed boats and artificial islands. So too did the Buduma people, living halfway around the world under similar conditions on Africa's Lake Chad. Similarly, if people in hot, humid climates, such as in Central Africa and the Amazon, tended to go about nearly naked, it didn't necessarily mean that these widely distant cultures had once had contact with one another. Instead, these groups were simply meeting similar environmental challenges in similar ways, in this case by not wearing clothing in hot, humid environments. Although Heyerdahl clung stubbornly to his belief in diffusionism, he did successfully pioneer an entirely new field, the experimental use of ancient-style sailing rafts. Heyerdahl also pioneered the practical, hands-on testing of these rafts, often risking his own life in the process. Since his first Trans-Pacific crossing in the Contiki, a balsa wood replica of an Inca-style raft, Heyerdahl had subsequently crossed, or nearly crossed, the Atlantic on the papyrus rafts Ra-1 and Ra-2, then had sailed another papyrus raft, the Tigris, also built by Paulino Esteban, in 1978 from Iraq to Pakistan. The goal of the Tigris expedition was to show that contact between the Tigris-Euphrates and Indus civilizations could have occurred by sea. In Heyerdahl's opinion, the seas were not barriers to civilizations, as had often been presumed, but instead could be used as highways by cultures that had ocean-going rafts and the requisite knowledge to use them. Heyerdahl's pioneering expeditions inevitably spawned a wave of followers. To date, numerous adventurers have carried out more than two dozen pre-Columbian-style raft voyages— crossing and recrossing the Atlantic and parts of the Pacific Ocean. About half of these ships sank, for one reason or another, while the other half fared reasonably well. The longest journey of a reed ship was roughly 4,000 miles. The longest of a balsa wood raft was that piloted single-handedly by William Willis, who sailed 11,000 miles from Peru to Australia in 1964. Did any of these voyages prove that contact had existed between the Old and New Worlds, or between Polynesia and South America? The answer is no. They simply tested the possibility that such contact could have occurred, using the technology available at the time. To date, the only definitive proof of pre-Columbian contact between the Old World and the New is the Norse, Viking, colony at Lonso Meadow in the appropriately named Newfoundland, which has been dated to around A.D. 1000. On the Pacific side of South America, however, recent archaeological, linguistic, and genetic evidence has seemingly corroborated contact between Polynesia and South America, but not in the direction that Tor Heyerdahl believed it had occurred. Heyerdahl had always discounted the traditional view that the remote islands of Polynesia had been populated from west to east across the Pacific, beginning in Asia and moving gradually in the direction of South America. Instead, Heyerdahl felt that because trade winds generally blow from east to west over the Pacific, it would have been impossible for Polynesians to have sailed against them. In Contiki, he wrote, my migration theory, as such, was not necessarily proved by the successful outcome of the Contiki expedition. What we did prove was that the South American balsa raft possesses qualities not previously known to scientists of our time, and that the Pacific Islands are located well inside the range of prehistoric craft from Peru— 
primitive people are capable of undertaking immense voyages over the open ocean. The distance is not the determining factor in the case of oceanic migrations, but whether the wind and the current have the same general course, day and night, all the year round. The trade winds and the equatorial currents are turned westward by the rotation of the earth, and this rotation has never changed in all the history of mankind. The earth's rotation may not have changed during all of mankind's 200,000-year history, yet the trade winds that normally blow from South America across the Pacific from east to west do routinely reverse their direction. This occurs during the weather phenomenon known as El Nino, when water in the Pacific Ocean warms and the trade winds often reverse their direction. El Ninos emerge on average every three to seven years and last anywhere from nine months to two years. Thus, Heyerdahl's contention that trade winds are constant and thus would have prevented any kind of migration across the Pacific from west to east is not correct. Heyerdahl also seems to have underestimated, as did many other Europeans, the traditional Polynesian double or outrigger canoe. Instead, he remained focused on rafts constructed from either South America balsa wood or Totora reeds. As he later wrote in his book, Early Man and the Ocean, the crash landing of the balsa raft Contiki on the windward side of the Tuamotu Islands clearly showed the greater security of a raft vessel of this kind, and the writer has also enough experience of ocean travel by Polynesian canoe to be able to confirm that, in case of either a mid-ocean storm or coastal peril, he would unhesitatingly prefer to be on board a raft. The traditional Polynesian double canoe, however, which uses two canoes that have been lashed together in parallel to form a catamaran with a raised platform between them, is actually remarkably light, fast, and stable, capable of traveling long distances across the ocean. In fact, nearly two hundred years before the voyage of the Contiki, the renowned explorer, cartographer, and navigator, Captain James Cook, was one of the first to admire the Polynesian's large sea canoes, capable of carrying fifty to one hundred people. Cook was also the first European to visit Hawaii, and the first to explore and map many areas of the Pacific Ocean. While on Tonga Island in 1777, Cook wrote, I have mentioned that Fiji Island lies three days' sail from Tonga, because these people have no other method of measuring distance from island to island, but by expressing the time required to make the voyage in one of their canoes. In order to ascertain how far these canoes can sail in a moderate gale in any given time, I went on board one of them, when under sail, and, by several trials with the log, found that she went seven knots or miles in an hour, close hauled in a gentle gale. From this I judge that they will sail on a medium, with such breezes as general blow in their sea, about seven or eight miles in an hour. Cook not only discovered that the Polynesian canoes could travel faster than his own ship, and, by extension, two or three times faster than the Contiki or the various other papyrus and Totora reed rafts, thus cutting down on voyage times, but that these same canoes could sail both before and against the wind, like a European ship. The Polynesians didn't need to wait, therefore, for an El Nino reversal, to be able to sail from west to east toward South America. They could sail in any direction they wanted. Cook made an additional observation that was even more startling than the speed of the Polynesians' canoes. It had to do with the Polynesian navigators who manned them. In these navigations the sun is their guide by day and the stars by night. When these are obscured they have recourse to the points from whence the winds and the waves come upon the vessel. In other words, without knowledge of the European sextant, compass, and other navigational tools, the Polynesians were somehow able to navigate long distance accurately by using the sun, stars, and other cues. On his very first voyage, in fact, Cook took a Polynesian navigator he had met in Tahiti with him through the South Seas. The navigator's name was Tupaia, and, using small shells on the beach, Tupaia created for Cook a map of the Polynesian islands that extended through a radius of some two thousand miles. Many of the islands Tupaia revealed to Cook were unknown to Europeans at the time. 
After Cook's death in Hawaii in 1779, however, his discovery that Polynesian sailors were able to use a completely unknown navigational system was pretty much forgotten. For the next century and a half, European ships with single hulls and traditional navigation instruments dominated the oceans. Yet the Polynesians' traditional seafaring knowledge didn't disappear. Like the scattered master Totora Reed boat builders of Lake Titicaca, traditional Polynesian navigation techniques persisted into the 20th century among individuals on tiny Pacific islands strewn across thousands of miles of ocean. Before European contact, Polynesian navigators had been highly esteemed. Their specialized knowledge, in fact, was closely guarded in secret guilds and was passed down through the generations, often in the form of songs that were memorized. Little by little, however, these guilds had disappeared. Yet in 1969, just as Tor Heyerdahl was attempting to cross the Atlantic on his reed boat Ra-1, and as Americans were preparing to make their first landing on the moon, an American Peace Corps worker named Mike McCoy arrived on the remote Micronesian island of Satawal. McCoy soon befriended a Polynesian named Pius Mao Pialug, nearly forty years old, who belonged to a long line of Micronesian navigators. Gradually, McCoy discovered that his new friend not only was an ancient-style navigator, but that he was the only one surviving in Micronesia. In short, Pialug was the last possessor of the ancient system of navigational knowledge that Captain Cook had once come into contact with and that was probably thousands of years old. A handful of years later and across the Pacific, meanwhile, in Santa Barbara, California, a middle-aged university professor in anthropology named Ben Finney was just finishing a forty-foot replica of an ancient Polynesian sailing canoe, which he had created according to ancient designs. Finney, a specialist in Polynesia, had recently been contacted by Mike McCoy. The latter had heard of Finney's project and had told him about his unusual Micronesian friend. In 1973, Finney founded the Polynesian Voyaging Society, shipped his catamaran to Hawaii, then flew Pius Pialug to the Hawaiian Islands. Two years later, and with a crew of volunteers, Pialug and Finney set sail on March 8, 1975, on Finney's catamaran, which they christened the Haukulea. The ship's name was Hawaiian for Arcturus, an important navigational star. The purpose of the voyage was to attempt to sail 2,700 miles from Honolulu to Tahiti using only Pialug's ancient navigational skills. Thirty-three days later, the Haukulea arrived safely in Papieti, Tahiti's capital. Half of the island's population turned out to witness the arrival of this ancient replica of their past and also to meet Pius Pialug, a direct link to their ancient Polynesian navigators. The smoking gun, the missing vessel and body of knowledge that could explain how people might have discovered and settled tiny islands strewn across thousands of miles of Pacific Ocean, had finally been found. Not surprisingly, perhaps, and given his extensive experience in the area, Captain Cook was the first to theorize that Polynesians originally came from Asia. Today the combined evidence of anthropology, linguistics, genetics, and archaeology has tended to corroborate what Cook suspected and what Heyerdahl spent a lifetime trying to disprove, that Polynesia had been peopled from the West, not from the East. Current linguistic evidence, in fact, points to the island of Taiwan as the ancestral homeland of the Polynesian language. Genetic evidence, meanwhile, points to Polynesians having left Southeast Asia some 10,000 years ago, moving on to the area of Papua New Guinea, then crossing eastward across the Pacific Ocean. Polynesian explorers first populated the islands of Fiji, Tonga, and Samoa around 1000 BC. Other Polynesian explorers reached Hawaii, nearly 3,000 miles distance, roughly 1,300 years later, in A.D. 300. Polynesian sailors eventually reached Easter Island, located 2,500 miles from South America's coast, sometime between A.D. 700 and 1200. The building of megalithic monuments on Easter Island, a tradition that was actually widespread through Micronesia, Melanesia, and parts of Polynesia, began soon afterward. Polynesian explorers did not end their westward explorations at Easter Island, however. If increasing pieces of archaeological and linguistic evidence are correct, 
Polynesian explorers eventually beached their sail-powered catamarans on the shore of what is now Southern California, Ecuador, the Peruvian coast, and central Chile. Grooved and barbed shell fishhooks from the Chumash and Gabrielino cultures along the islands and coast of the Santa Barbara Channel in Southern California, for example, are nearly identical to those found in certain parts of Polynesia and also on the coast of Chile. Those in California have been dated between A.D. 900 and 1500, during the height of Polynesian expansion. Complex canoes made from planks of wood sewn together were used not only by Polynesians, but also by Southern California's Chumash and Gabrielino cultures, and by the Mapuche culture along the central coast of Chile. It is unlikely that this technology was discovered independently. Meanwhile, DNA studies of coconut palms, Cocos nucifera, in Ecuador, have shown that this particular coconut species must have been transported by humans from the Philippine Islands, where they are native, to South America. Survival of the palms by any other method, such as coconuts carried by ocean currents, seems exceptionally unlikely. Finally, the South and Central American sweet potato, Ipomia batatis, which evolved in the Americas, became widespread throughout Polynesia after arriving there by at least A.D. 700. The Polynesian word for sweet potato, kumara, is similar to the word kumar, used by the Canari people on Ecuador's Guayaquil coast. Current thinking is that it was Polynesians who arrived in South America, returning with the valuable route in their catamarans to the South Seas. The combined evidence from a multiplicity of disciplines thus strongly suggests that double canoes with sails manned by Polynesians, not rafts from the New World, cross the Pacific repeatedly and methodically, purposely seeking out new lands to inhabit and explore. While it's possible that some South Americans sailed out into the Pacific on reed or balsa wood rafts, there seems little if any, genetic, linguistic, or archaeological evidence to corroborate such an occurrence. In perhaps a fitting irony, while Tor Heyerdahl often chided professional historians and archaeologists for their disparaging view of ancient people's seafaring abilities, when he crashed on an inhabited Pacific atoll with the Contiki, he himself failed to recognize the obvious vehicle of trans-Pacific migration— even when that very vehicle literally bumped into his own. As he recounted in his book of the voyage, At half-past five we stood in toward the reef again. We had sailed along the whole south coast, and were getting near the west end of the island. On the beach we detected a cluster of motionless black spots. Suddenly one of them moved slowly down toward the water, while several of the others made off at full speed up to the edge of the woods. They were people. Now we saw a canoe being launched, and two individuals jumped on board and paddled off on the other side of the reef. Farther down they turned the boat's head out, and we saw the canoe lifted high in the air by the seas as it shot through a passage in the reef and came straight out toward us. The opening in the reef, then, was down there. There was our only hope. The two men in the canoe waved. We waved back, eagerly, and they increased their speed. It was a Polynesian outrigger canoe. The solution to the age-old mystery of how Polynesia had been inhabited actually reached and docked against Tor Heyerdahl's balsa wood raft on August 3, 1947, but the thirty-three-year-old explorer, trained in diffusionism and blinded by his own Eurocentric beliefs, was unable to recognize the very craft that had been pivotal in populating the South Seas. Heyerdahl, named after Tor, the ancient seafaring Norse god of thunder, had been searching myopically for evidence of white-bearded gods on rafts, not brown-skinned, beardless people on canoes, and although the white gods were more than likely figments of people's imaginations, Heyerdahl nevertheless spent the remainder of his life trying to cobble together evidence to support his diffusionist belief that South America had somehow had contact with Egypt. He took his theory with him to the grave. Tor Heyerdahl passed away on April 18, 2002, aged 87, and was honored with a state funeral in Oslo's cathedral, 
He was then buried where he had lived for years, in Colomaceri, an Italian seaside village that overlooks the Mediterranean Sea once crossed by Greek, Roman, and Phoenician sailors. The replica of the great Polynesian sailing craft, the Haukulea, meanwhile, continues roaming the Pacific Ocean, manned by the descendants of Polynesian seafarers who are now busy training new, younger wayfinders in the ancient art of Polynesian navigation. Thor was a very good person, Paulino tells me, as we shake hands and I prepare to return to La Paz. Indeed, my own memory of Herodal is one of his friendliness, and of how little he was affected by his international fame. I watch as Paulino busies himself with some touch-up work on the giant Totora reed ship, which will soon be bound for Norway. As I walk back up the path to the highway, carrying one of Paulino's model boats in my hand, I have no doubt that it was Paulino's ancestors who built the giant reed rafts that once carried enormous stones across Lake Titicaca to the ancient city of Tiahuanaco, and that it was those same ancestors who had created the magnificent civilization that lasted for nearly a thousand years here. I also have no doubt that Paulino's ancestors needed no help other than their own ingenuity to cut, transport, and erect the enormous stones that now lie littered about that ancient city. No bearded white gods or Egyptians were necessary to create the miracle of civilization that occurred here long ago in the Andes, more than two miles above the sea. All of the evidence, in fact, points to Paulino's ancestors having arrived here long ago from Asia, by land, eventually creating a series of civilizations in what are now Mexico, Central America, Colombia, Peru, and Bolivia, and that it was these same ancestors, distantly related relatives, the Polynesians, who occasionally stepped onto beaches from their double canoes. There they must have gazed in wonder at an inhabited coastline and at a distant and vast mountain chain before eventually, guided by the sun, stars, and swells, they returned to their ancient homelands far across the seas. 7. The End of Che Guevara, Bolivia. This experience of ours is really worth taking a couple of bullets for. If you do come, don't think of returning. The revolution won't wait. A strong hug from the one who is called, and whom history will call, Che. Che Guevara, writing from Cuba to a friend in Argentina, 1959. We learn perfectly that the life of a single human being is worth millions of times more than all the property of the richest man on earth, that the pride of serving our fellow man is much more important than a good income, that the people's gratitude is much more permanent, much more lasting than all the gold one can accumulate. Dr. Che Guevara, speaking to Cuban medical students, 1960. I've come to stay, and the only way that I will leave here is dead, or crossing a border, shooting bullets as I go. Che Guevara, on the eve of starting guerrilla operations in Bolivia, November 1966. Che and sixteen other guerrillas, ten Cuban, five Bolivian, and one Peruvian, walked and stumbled down the night-black trail at the bottom of a deep canyon and beneath the light of a small sliver of moon. The trail followed a creek hemmed in by short trees. Small potato patches emerged here and there, which the guerrillas could see only when the moonlight fell on them. Otherwise, the men in ragged, dirty clothes did their best to find their way through the black canyons created by the shadows of the trees. Che, the leader, was thirty-nine years old, wore green pants, a camouflage shirt, and a brown beret. Bound around his feet were rough pieces of cloth and leather, all that remained of boots that had fallen apart months earlier. Last March, when they had launched guerrilla operations, there had been fifty-two of them. Now, seven months later, there were only seventeen, the rest having been killed or imprisoned or having deserted. As the emaciated guerrillas followed the twisting path, they had no idea that they were nearly surrounded by an ever-tightening circle of some two hundred and fifty Bolivian soldiers, recently trained by U.S. Green Berets. Julia Cortez sits in her small living room, clasping her hands over and over, wringing them, full of worry. 
She thinks she is losing her mind. The room has a couch, a sofa, and a chair, floral wallpaper, and chintz-style pottery. At sixty-three, she wears a black skirt and a freshly starched white blouse. Her hair is gathered neatly in a bun, and her dark eyes are widely set. Her manner is open, somewhat wistful. She speaks in a very quiet voice. Forty-four years ago, Julia Cortez was one of the last people to speak with and see Che Guevara alive. I have serious problems with my short-term memory, she says, handing me a plate with a fresh peach and a sharp knife on it. They're going to do an MRI on me in Sucre to find out what's wrong. I've already been to a doctor in Santa Cruz. It's incredible. Incredible! I forget where I've put things. I go out and forget what I was going to do. I have some kind of neurological problem, she says, clasping her hands again. And it's getting worse. My mother died a month ago, and that has only accentuated everything. For having cried so much, I watched her suffer for four years. I don't know what's going to happen to me now. Julia is a retired schoolteacher. She has a small plot of land outside the town of Valle Grande, where she has some peach trees and raises corn, just for sustenance, she says. After thirty-one years of teaching, she received a pension that amounts to just a little more than one hundred and fifty dollars a month. My mother was both mother and father to me, because my father abandoned us. We were very poor. There were eleven of us, and we had practically nothing. But my mother encouraged me to study. She was very supportive, very diligent, very reliable. For a while, Julia says, she was encouraged by other family members to become a nun, as that would be a sure way of support. But Julia insisted on being a teacher. That's what I wanted to do. Julia's first job was a posting to the tiny village of La Higuera, the fig tree, a small cluster of adobe homes with about eight hundred people and a two-hour walk from her own village of Pucará. It's a rugged region, with layer after layer of forested mountains in the distance that make the view look like a Japanese woodcut. Julia taught in a small adobe schoolroom with a dirt floor, wooden benches, a blackboard, and about twenty primary school kids— the children of farmers who tilled the fields. The nineteen-year-old schoolteacher taught during the week, then walked home on a dirt path on the weekends. A few months after she was posted, the villagers lent her a horse to help make the journey easier. There were no locked doors, Julia remembers. The people were very hospitable. Anyone who visited was invited into their homes to share whatever food they had— on weekends, if I stayed over, we'd cook something in the big adobe oven outside. The neighbors would come, they'd play music, and we'd share everything. It was very pretty. Beneath the camaraderie, however, there was also plenty of poverty. The area of La Higuera, in the department of Santa Cruz, was, and still is, one of the poorest regions of Bolivia, a country that remains one of the poorest in the hemisphere. In 1967, when Julia was assigned as a teacher there, infant mortality, illiteracy, and poverty rivaled that of the poorest nations in Africa. It was for some of those very reasons that the Argentine revolutionary Che Guevara launched guerrilla operations in Bolivia in 1967, the same year that Julia began work. Che, who had helped Fidel Castro come to power in Cuba, had developed a theory that a small band of guerrillas, or foco, could serve as a spark that would ignite a revolution in impoverished countries such as Bolivia. Che's guerrillas first clashed with Bolivian troops about sixty miles south of La Higuera. Their aim was to ignite a popular uprising against the Bolivian government— then to ignite similar socialist revolutions in neighboring countries, such as Peru, Brazil, and eventually Che's home country of Argentina. Unlike Julia, Ernesto Che Guevara was a product of the middle class, born the eldest of five children in Rosario, Argentina, in 1928. A gifted athlete, Che excelled at sports in school, yet chronic asthma often kept him homebound. There he found refuge in books, his parents maintained a 3,000-book library, and for the rest of his life Che was a voracious reader. One of his favorites was the epic Argentine poem Martín Fierro, which told the story of an Argentine gaucho, or cowboy, pursued by the police, 
one of whom changes sides due to the hero's extraordinary display of bravery. Together, the two of them go to live among the indigenous people, hoping to find a better life. In 1951, as a 23-year-old medical student, Che and a friend rode a motorcycle through South America, intent on expanding their horizons. It was the first time Che encountered some of South America's chronic poverty. I have visited all the countries of Latin America, Che later wrote. In the way I traveled, first as a student, then as a doctor, I began to come into close contact with poverty, with hunger, with disease, with the inability to cure a child because of a lack of resources, and I began to see there was something that seemed to me almost as important as being a famous researcher or making some substantial contribution to medical science, and this was helping those people. Even while a medical student, Che gradually grew to realize that bringing medicine to some isolated, impoverished hamlet was not going to cure a level of privation that had sometimes endured for centuries. To Che, working as a doctor amid the destitute was of no more use than putting a band-aid on a gangrenous leg instead of amputating it. It was the poverty itself that had to be rooted out. By the time he was twenty-five, Che had come to the conclusion that the only way the lives of millions of Latin Americans could ever be improved was by transforming their country's political structures. Under most current systems, Che believed, Latin America's government strove to preserve the wealth of a small group of privileged elites while ignoring the poor. Medicine was not going to change any of that. Only a revolution from the bottom up could. While traveling in Mexico at the age of 25, Che met a 26-year-old self-exiled Cuban lawyer and revolutionary named Fidel Castro. Castro proved to be the very catalyst Che had been searching for. On their first meeting, Castro explained that he intended to lead a small group of guerrillas to the shores of Cuba and with them topple the Cuban dictator, Fulgencio Batista. Sizing up the young Argentine doctor, Castro asked Che if he'd join them as the revolutionary's physician. Che immediately agreed. Later, he wrote that, the truth is that after the experiences of my wanderings across all of Latin America, it didn't take much to incite me to join any revolution against a tyrant, but Fidel impressed me as an extraordinary man. He faced and overcame the most impossible things. He had an exceptional faith in that once he left for Cuba, he would arrive, and that once he arrived, he would fight, and that fighting, he would win. I shared his optimism. It was a time to stop crying over social injustices and fight. Three years later, in 1959, Che rode with a triumphant Castro into a liberated Havana, the final prize in their protracted guerrilla war. Proven on the battlefield as a guerrilla commander and fearless to the point of recklessness under fire, Che had risen to become a commandante in the Revolutionary Army. He later became Minister of Industry and President of the National Bank. It was during the war that Ernesto Guevara also acquired his nickname of Che, a uniquely Argentine expression that basically means, hey buddy, or friend. Che used the word so frequently when addressing his Cuban companions that they in turn used it to address him. Six years later, with the Cuban Revolution secure, yet with the island quarantined by a U.S. economic blockade, Castro suggested that Che try to ignite the spark of continent-wide revolution. He suggested launching a war in Bolivia, where Che could help topple a president the CIA had initially helped to put in power, but who had since won an election. Once war broke out in Bolivia, Castro said, revolution in neighboring countries would soon follow. Cuba would then have broken the U.S. blockade. Guevara, now 37 years old, quickly agreed. He then began to prepare himself for the enormous task of liberating all of South America. In a letter written to his mother, a staunch supporter of her by now famous revolutionary son, Che admitted that, like the fictional Don Quixote, he too was something of a dreamer. Once again, I feel below my heels the ribs of Rocinante, he said, referring to Don Quixote's faithful horse. I return to the road with my shield on my arm. I believe in the armed struggle as the only solution for those peoples who fight to free themselves. Many will call me 
an adventurer, and that I am, only one of a different kind, one of those who risks his skin to prove his beliefs. Che may have seen himself as an idealist, but the Cuban Revolution had revealed an uncompromising side of him. By 1959, in a world starkly divided between capitalism and communism, Che was a devout Marxist-Leninist who believed that capitalism was doomed and that inevitably socialism, then communism, would take its place. He also possessed an unshakable faith that the entire process could be hurried along at the point of a gun. According to Alberto Gramado, who, as a young medical student, had accompanied Che on his motorcycle journey through South America, when Che looked through a sniper scope at a soldier and pulled the trigger, he fully believed that he was helping reduce repression by saving 30,000 future children from lives of hunger. When Granado looked through a sniper scope, by contrast, he saw only a man with a wife and children. The difference between them, Granado said, was that Che felt certain he was ushering in a new world order. In his book, Guerrilla Warfare, Che summed up his new plan. The Cordilleras of the Andes will be the Cuban Sierra Maestra, mountains of Latin America, and the immense territories which this continent encompasses will become the scene of a life-or-death struggle against imperialism. This means that it will be a protracted war. It will have many fronts, and it will cost much blood and countless lives for a long period of time. This is a prediction. We make it with the conviction that history will prove us right." Guevara, raised as a Catholic and later an atheist, had nevertheless become a true believer. He was now utterly convinced that Marx's prescription for how to achieve a social utopia was not just a theory, but fact. At which point I left the path of reason and took on something akin to faith in communism, I can't tell you, Che wrote his parents. However, I feel not just a powerful internal strength, which I always felt, but also an absolutely fatalistic sense of my mission, which strips me of all fear. It could be that this will be the definitive one, he warned them. I don't go looking for it, death, but it is within the logical calculations of probabilities. If it is to be, then this is my final embrace. Che also left behind a letter, to be read only if he did not return, for his wife and five children. If one day you must read this letter, it will be because I am no longer among you. You will almost not remember me, and the littlest ones will remember nothing at all. Your father has been a man who acted according to his beliefs, and certainly has been faithful to his convictions. Grow up to be good revolutionaries. Above all, try always to be able to feel deeply any injustice committed against any person in any part of the world. It is the most beautiful quality of a revolutionary. Until always, little children, I still hope to see you again. A really big kiss and a hug from Papa. At 2 a.m., the guerrillas stopped and made camp, next to a large boulder near a stream. Chino Chang, the Peruvian guerrilla, could not see well at night through his glasses, so further progress was difficult. Months earlier, Che had run out of his asthma medicine, and thus was wheezing heavily, his lungs constricting as if they were being crushed in a vice. The guerrillas had with them a single broken two-way radio that they could listen to, but which would no longer transmit. That night, beside the stream on one of the last days of his life, Che listened through the static as a Bolivian news station broadcast an army communique. Then, removing a small notebook in which he'd been keeping a diary since the guerrilla war began, he wrote his final entry. October 7, 1967. We completed the eleventh month of our guerrilla operation, without complications, until 12.30 p.m., when an old woman grazing her goats came into the canyon where we were camped, and we had to seize her. The woman has not given us any trustworthy information about the soldiers, saying that she knows nothing. From what the woman told us, we figure we are about one league from La Higuera, one from Hague, and two from Pucará. At 5.30, the guerrillas, Inti, and the Seto and Pablito, went to the old woman's house where she has two daughters, one a dwarf and the other crippled. 
They gave her fifty pesos, telling her not to say a word to anyone, but with little hope that she will keep her word. The army issued an unusual report by radio this evening concerning the presence of two hundred fifty army men in Serrano to keep the encircled group of guerrillas from getting out. They report we are hiding between the Acero and Oro rivers. The news seems to be a diversionary tactic. Placing the notebook in the small leather pack he carried, Che then lay down alongside his men and went to sleep, unaware that the communique was not a diversionary tactic, but rather a straightforward statement of fact. Now, no matter what direction the guerrillas chose to head toward, they would inevitably run into army troops, as they had been unwittingly caught in a noose. Che was also unaware that a local farmer, the one who tended the potato patches they were sleeping in, had detected their presence and had gone off to alert a company of army rangers. Not long afterward, while the guerrillas continued to slumber, several hundred Bolivian soldiers began moving in. Samaipata is a small, colorful town of whitewashed adobe buildings and tile roofs surrounded by jungle-covered hills. Inca and Guarani sites litter the area, the Incas having arrived here in the 15th century during their push to conquer more territory. On July 6, 1967, three months before their final firefight, six of Che's guerrillas commandeered a truck and drove it boldly into town, desperate to find food and supplies as well as medicine for Che's asthma. The guerrillas shot and killed a soldier and briefly captured ten more, they then fled, unable to find the medicine their leader so badly needed. Che, meanwhile, had waited behind. Lately he had been riding on muleback, unable to walk. Now I am doomed to suffer asthma for an indefinite time, Che wrote gloomily in his notebook that night. The guerrillas by now had already eaten most of their horses and recently had been hungrily eyeing Che's mule, but he would have none of it. On August 24th, he wrote, We remained in ambush all day. At dusk, the macheteros, trail cutters, returned with the animal traps. They caught a condor and a rotten cat. Everything was eaten together with the last piece of anteater meat. The only things remaining are the beans and whatever is hunted. If the object of a guerrilla insurgency is to continually take the fight to one's opponent, inflicting damage on the enemy when he least expects it, then Che's weary band had long since abandoned that strategy. For the most part, chased by increasingly numerous army patrols and unable to win over the support of the local inhabitants, Che's guerrilla column was now constantly on the run. As they fled northward, they often moved at night, hiding in patches of forest cover during the day. The guerrillas were filthy reported a Bolivian soldier Che's men had briefly captured and released. They walked slowly, gradually cutting their way through thick brush with machetes. Che, the soldier reported, travels by horse, and the others serve him like a god. They made his bed and brought him yerba mate, tea. He smokes a pipe of silver and travels in the center of the column. Although he was obviously very badly off because of his untreated asthma, another prisoner reported that Che never complained. In Samaipata, I walked down a dirt street toward the highway that runs outside of town, hoping to find a bus going south toward La Higuera, near where Che was captured. An army jeep passes by, then stops. The driver, a sergeant, motions me to get in. He's short, squat, brown-skinned, wears an olive-green uniform, and has highly polished jungle-style black combat boots. The sergeant is friendly, but serious, has been posted to the Samaipata area for the past three years and is originally from Santa Cruz. He likes the area, he says, gesturing toward the hills. A bit later, as he drops me off on the dirt highway at an isolated toll booth, I tell him that I'm tracing the final steps of Che Guevara, the guerrilla revolutionary. The sergeant lifts an eyebrow and turns to me. We sure took care of him, didn't we? he says, before driving off. At the toll booth, a woman squats alongside the roadway, wearing long skirts and a straw hat. She brushes flies off a basket of homemade cheese-filled pastries covered with a piece of cloth. Jungle foliage cloaks the surrounding hills, 
and the sound of cicadas is intense, mixed with occasional bird calls. The toll man eyes me, then steps out of his booth and strikes up a conversation. He's about sixty, from Santa Cruz. He works twenty days at the booth, he says, then returns for ten days to Santa Cruz. He's then rotated to another toll booth in some other isolated area. The man gestures to a small building across the road. I can see bunk beds through the open door. That's my home, he says. I work for seven years on seismic lines for petroleum companies, he says, in the jungle. I saw a spectacled bear once, ate caiman, almost drowned in the Madidi River. He buys a cheese pastry from the woman for a boliviano and continues, munching, while she tucks the cloth back around her wares. I worked in the Chaco, too, among the Guaranis. They still speak their own language, have hair down their backs, he says, gesturing. They still use boats and arrows. Flat land, all of that, he says, pointing at the hills around us by contrast. Nothing like these. He swallows the rest of his pastry, wipes the crumbs off his shirt, then peers intently at me. In the distance I can hear the sound of a bus. The sound of the bus gets louder, and we both turn to look down the road. Have you seen the Nazca lines in Peru? I say I have. Extraterrestrials landed there, he says emphatically. It was all one big spaceport. The bus pulls into sight, then grinds to a stop in a cloud of squeaks and billowing dust. Arms stick akimbo out of the open windows as the woman hoists her basket and begins selling pastries in a hurry, soiled Bolivian notes and pastries quickly changing hands. The toll man talks to the driver as I climb on, and, with a whoosh and a jerk, we pull out. I walk down the swaying aisle all the way to the back seat, then peer out the rear window. The toll man is standing in his booth again, looking down the deserted highway, while the pastry woman sits on the side of the road, brushing her skirts as a long tube of dust spreads out behind us like a slowly expanding snake. At daybreak on October 8, 1967, Che and his guerrillas awoke alongside a stream at the bottom of a deep canyon called the Quebrada del Churro. Looking up, a guerrilla spotted movement on one of the ridges, hedging them in. Che soon realized that somehow, during the night, the Bolivian army had taken up positions. Trapped at the bottom of a ravine about one hundred and fifty feet wide and nine hundred feet long, the guerrillas discovered that they were surrounded. It was a perfect ambush. At 1.10 p.m., the bombardment began. Hundreds of Bolivian army troops opened up with automatic weapons and mortar fire. Soon, two guerrillas were dead, and the guerrilla force scattered. Taking cover behind a large boulder near the stream, Che kept firing bursts with his rifle until a bullet struck it, rendering it useless. Soon afterward, another bullet ripped a hole in Che's beret, while a third tore into his left calf. One of the Bolivian guerrillas, a man nicknamed Willie, ran to help, pulling Che up through the thick undergrowth that clung to the steep hillside, searching for a way out. As the two guerrillas stumbled forward, a Bolivian ranger suddenly stepped out from cover, trained his rifle on the two unarmed men, then ordered them to halt. Che Guevara, veteran of the Cuban Revolution, former minister of industry, medical doctor, guerrilla theorist, and potential liberator of all of South America, slowly raised his hands. "'Don't shoot,' his captor later claimed, he said. "'I am Che Guevara. I am worth more to you alive than dead.' "'Are you going to La Higuera? a young woman asks me, waiting for a car that is already an hour late. "'Yes, and you? I'm getting off sooner. Where's that?' "'Quebrada del Churro. The ambush site? Yes, you too?' she asks. I tell her that I am, and ten minutes later a car arrives and we climb in. Her name is Lucia. She's twenty-three and is an Argentine from Buenos Aires. Lucia is pretty, has long dark hair, wears blue jean shorts, tennis shoes, and a white t-shirt, and carries a small day-pack. It's been her dream for years to visit the area that Che Guevara fought in. Lucia had two weeks off from her job as a product designer and decided, por qué no? Why not? To come. Like many Argentines, she is of Spanish-Italian extraction. Her parents, she says, were leftists, and as a girl, she traveled to Cuba many times. She's also white and middle class, like Che. 
In Argentina, among the young, Che's a hero, she says matter-of-factly. We admire him and the cause he believed in, helping the poor. She thinks about it a bit, then adds, Che emanated something, a force. She looks at me and takes a long drag from her cigarette. He was also gorgeous. Lucia is not alone in her opinion. An iconic 1960 photo of Che portrays him wearing a smart-looking tunic, fashionably long hair, a scraggly gorilla beard, mustache, and a black beret with a single star on it, which symbolized his rank as a guerrilla commander. Che was attending a funeral in Havana at the time for Cubans who had died from a supposed foreign attack. A Cuban photographer snapped the photo, and it was this image, Che with a determined, heroic, almost otherworldly expression, that eventually circulated around the world. The idea of revolution, not only the Cuban revolution, now had its symbol, a journalist wrote in Spain's El Dominical. And not just any symbol, but one that was sexy, masculine, adventurous, noble, and, very importantly, in concert with the spirit of the times. Would Che have had the same impact? asked another Spanish journalist. If Che had not had the photogenic face that he'd had, and looked more like, say, Raul Castro, Fidel's fiercely revolutionary yet unattractive brother. It's a valid point. Che had found himself not only at the right place at the right time with the right set of skills, but he also just so happened to look like a movie star. He was the first man I ever met who I thought not just handsome, but beautiful, wrote the American journalist I. F. Stone. He looked like a cross between a fawn and a Sunday school print of Jesus, yet he spoke with that utter sobriety which sometimes masks immense apocalyptic visions. In addition to his looks, Che possessed a certain ineffable je ne sais quoi quality, one that, as with all charismatic leaders, engendered fierce loyalty among his followers. When Che appeared, wrote the Uruguayan journalist Julia Constenla de Giussani, he had an incalculable enchantment that came completely naturally. If he entered a room, everything began revolving around him. He was blessed with a unique appeal. While Lucia and I chat about Che's Bolivian strategy, we drive through semi-tropical woodland, occasionally passing solitary men on horseback wearing flat-brimmed black hats. Some of the riders carry a rifle slung across their backs and a lariat looped on their saddles. The car we're riding in, a black Toyota Corolla, has seen better days. For some reason, the steering wheel used to be on the right side, but has been ripped out and reinstalled on the left. All of the gauges, none of which work, have remained on the right, clinging mournfully around the hole where the steering wheel used to be, loose wires dangling from them. It's the driver's car, though, and he babies it, navigating his way carefully over deep ruts and through pools of water. The road we follow often loops past sheer edges and cliffs. Later, as we motor through mist and past trees that have rough, lime-green lichen on their trunks that look like fur carpets, we arrive in Pucara, a village that unfolds down the side of a hill like a medieval Italian village. Stone and adobe houses stand beside knots of men with black hats who are clustered on street corners. The men pause and stare at us as our car passes by. Of the many setbacks Chase suffered in Bolivia, perhaps none was bigger than his failure to incorporate local Bolivians, like these, into his guerrilla force. The farmers in the area, Che soon discovered, viewed the mostly light-skinned, bearded Cubans not as liberators, but as foreigners. Foreigners who, for some indecipherable reason, had begun to ambush and kill Bolivian soldiers and police. In his 1960 manual, Guerrilla Warfare, completed soon after the Cuban Revolution, Che wrote that, it is important to emphasize that guerrilla warfare is a war of the masses, a war of the people. The guerrilla band is an armed nucleus, the fighting vanguard of the people. It draws its great force from the mass of the people themselves. Three years later, he summed up his thinking with a stark warning. Any attempt to carry out this type of war without the population support is a prelude to inevitable disaster. However, the Bolivian forces that Che was up against, some of which had recently been trained by U.S. Green Berets in counterinsurgency warfare, 
knew precisely how important the local population was. They had no doubt studied Che's very own manual. Without popular support, the army knew, Che's guerrilla band would die, starved and dehydrated like a plant without water. It was thus of critical importance that Che's guerrillas not be allowed, as Mao Zedong had suggested, to move amongst the people as a fish swims in the sea. It was imperative that the army, not the guerrillas, capture the hearts and minds of Bolivia's rural farmers and thus deny the guerrillas local support. Groups of Castro communist tenancy, mostly foreigners, have infiltrated our country, the army warned the Bolivian public in April 1967, a month after fighting began. With the sole objective of sowing chaos and halting the progress of the nation, carrying out acts of banditry, pillage, and assault against private property, the armed forces, conscious of its specific obligations, has been mobilized to detain and destroy the foreign invasion as malicious as it is vandalous. For good measure, in a country where the average income was less than a thousand dollars a year, Bolivia's president, René Barrientos, placed a four thousand two hundred dollar bounty on Che Guevara's head. A few months later, in June of 1967, Che confessed in his diary his increasing frustration over the guerrillas' encounters with the local inhabitants. The lack of peasant recruits, he wrote, is a vicious circle. To get this enlistment of volunteers, we need to settle in a populated area, and for this we need more men. Militarily the army's actions have been nil, but they are working on the peasants in a way that we must be very careful of, as they can change a whole community into informers, either through fear of our aims or through trickery. Che's characterization of the local farmers as peasants, however, was an error in judging local conditions that ultimately had devastating consequences. When Che and Fidel Castro had invaded Cuba and taken refuge in the Sierra Maestra Mountains, the locals they encountered there were peasants. That is, they were men and women who worked for large landowners and possessed no land titles themselves. Castro quickly promised the peasants land, a promise that led many to join the revolutionary movement. In 1952 in Bolivia, by contrast, fifteen years before Che began combat operations, a reformist government had come to power that soon enacted wide-ranging land reform. Suddenly, a large percentage of Bolivia's peasants had become landowners. Unlike in Cuba, then, Che was unable to offer local Bolivian farmers the promise of land, as they already had their titles. Although the farmers' largely negative reaction to the guerrillas greatly frustrated Che, the reality was that they were being both shrewd and practical— they were simply terrified of losing the land titles they had so recently gained. Little by little, as Che and his guerrillas marched through the remote Bolivian countryside, the army continued to work on the farmers' hearts and minds, increasing the guerrillas' isolation and leaving them with fewer and fewer places to hide. Only in one village, Alto Seco, after Che and his guerrillas had gathered the bewildered townspeople together for a political talk, did one young man finally hold up his hand and offer to join the guerrillas. As he readied his things, one of Che's men took the volunteer aside. Don't be silly, the guerrilla warned him. We're done for. The comment more than likely saved the man's life. In August, Che's forces accidentally became split into two columns. The army soon wiped out the first group, which was betrayed by a local farmer, now only seventeen guerrillas remained, and with each new confrontation attrition was taking its toll. The essential task of the guerrilla fighter is to keep himself from being destroyed, Che had written in 1960. Yet in Bolivia, in late 1967, Che seemed unable to prevent his group from destruction. Che biographer John Lee Anderson wrote that, one can't help but conclude that by this point Che had become strangely detached from his own plight, an interested witness to his own inexorable march toward death, for he was now breaking every rule sacred to guerrilla warfare, moving in the open without precise intelligence about what lay ahead, without the support of the peasants, and knowing that the army was aware of his approach. If there was one aspect of Che's character that remained unshakable, however, it was the fact that he was as stubborn as he was determined. Che was here to prove that a handful of well-trained guerrillas 
could unleash a powerful social revolution, that they could reshape the political structure of an entire country, if not the world. Defeat, therefore, was not an option. Che Guevara was going to either ignite a successful revolution in Bolivia, or else, as Guevara himself had said, I've come to stay, and the only way that I will leave here is dead. After about a twenty-minute drive from Pucará, we arrive at the spot where a trail leads down to Quebrada del Churro, the scene of Che's last firefight. Our driver, Lucia, and I begin the half-hour hike down through vegetation that would have to be cut with a machete if no path existed. It's bright, sunny, around six thousand feet in elevation, and the trail is punctuated occasionally with cornfields. Ridge after ridge extends to the horizon for as far as one can see. In the 1960s, a visiting journalist described the area as an infernal, desolate countryside of high peaks and deep valleys, strewn with occasional villages. It seems to be perfect guerrilla habitat. Our driver says that pumas live in the forests, sometimes emerging to feed on feral goats. On either side of the trail, orange mistletoe wraps itself around hapless plants, feeding off the plant's juices, while the path underfoot is alive with ants. We watch a trail of leaf-cutter ants, stacking bits of finely veined leaves beside a hole in the ground. Later, a giant rhinoceros beetle crosses our path, black and shiny as a Bolivian soldier's combat boot. A bit further on, a smaller black beetle stands mid-path, its head facing down and abdomen pointing up warning us that, if disturbed, it might launch a direct chemical attack. The whole area we are passing through, it seems, is alive with its own miniaturized jungle warfare. "'It was a farmer who ratted the gorillas out,' says our driver, as we reach the bottom of the canyon, then start following a path through thick vegetation alongside the stream called the Churro. "'He went and told the military, and that's how the army learned where the gorillas were.' "'Shouldn't people have ostracized that man?' Lucia asks incredulously, picking her way over rocks. She pauses, smoking a cigarette, indignant. The driver shrugs his shoulders. "'They were guerrilleros,' he says. We walk through a forested tunnel alongside the stream. Here and there, in the shadows, fist-size images of Che's face emerge, ghostly white, as if from a resurrection— Someone has carefully stenciled his iconic image on the occasional tree trunk or protruding stone with spray paint. We continue walking, Che's face gazing sternly at us as we pass. Not far ahead we arrive at a clearing with a large boulder beside a gnarled fig tree. On the boulder a visitor has scrawled, Patria o Muerte, Homeland or Death, in large letters, and alongside it a white star. It was here that Che was captured. The clearing is now quiet and peaceful. The sound of water and that of a dove calling drift through the canyon. One can clearly see how the soldiers could have fired down on the gorillas from the thickly forested hills above, and how the soldiers had the advantage of height. In the fierce firefight, two gorillas and five soldiers were immediately killed. Then Che was captured. In the ensuing days, six more gorillas were shot to death. Of the seventeen gorillas who spent the night in this area, only five eventually escaped, three of them by hiking under cover of darkness out of Bolivia and into Chile. The climb back up out of the Quebrada is hot and takes an hour. We sweat, and the steep ascent makes me breathe hard. Che, suffering from an asthma attack and unable to put weight on his injured leg, limped up this same slope with two soldiers supporting him. Down below, more soldiers followed, carrying the bodies of the two dead Cuban guerrillas. Once they reached the road, the soldiers took Che to La Higuera, a tiny village three miles further on. There, with his hands bound and his leg wound untended, Che was thrown onto the floor of a schoolroom, alongside the bodies of his dead companions. It was the same tiny school where nineteen-year-old Julia Cortez taught. It was Sunday. Julia was in the village, and she was scheduled to teach class the next day. That night the army celebrated Che's capture, Julia, now sixty-three, remembers. The army had warned us that Che was a very cruel man, cruel and ugly, but there were rumors in the countryside that Che was enchanted, 
that no bullet could touch him or penetrate his body, that he was a sorcerer. So I was curious. At dawn the next morning, I went to see. Soldiers at the doorway let the young schoolteacher pass. Inside, Julia found Che seated on a rustic wooden bench that her students used, the room lit by candlelight. The gorilla's hands were bound before him with rope, and his back was against the wall. Che was filthy and hadn't bathed in months. A CIA agent who visited him later that day summed up Che's appearance by saying that the guerrilla leader looked like a piece of trash. For the young schoolteacher, however, Che still retained his charismatic charm. When I went to see him, I immediately saw that he wasn't like they had said he was. That surprised me, she says. Che asked Julia who she was. She replied that she was a schoolteacher. From that moment on, Che referred to her as the professora, or teacher. He was friendly, sophisticated, intelligent, and very handsome. He said I had nice eyes and legs. I asked him why, being so handsome and intelligent, he went about like that, looking like a beggar. He answered that he did it for his ideals. After a chat, Julia left the schoolroom. Soon other officials came in. What was his attitude? I asked. He replied to everyone as they were, Julia said. If they were aggressive, then he was hard. If they treated him well, then he treated them well. According to Julia, Che called for her later in the morning. She was told that he had asked to see La Professora. I went back around ten o'clock, Julia said. They had taken him to the doorway of the schoolroom to take that famous photo of him with the CIA agent. Che wanted me to be in the photo, but they didn't let me. It was the last photo of him alive. I went inside, and we talked some more. I asked him if he had a wife, and he said he did. He said he had children in Cuba. Che said that it was unlikely that he would see them again. When Julia asked why, he told her that three soldiers had recently entered the room and had asked him for his last wish. According to Julia, Che had made them an offer. They were going to shoot him, she says. So he told them that if they did not kill him, then Cuba would make sure that the roads, health, and education would be improved in the entire area. He promised them tractors, roadways, fully equipped schools, all the basic services people needed. What did they say? She looks at me and shakes her head sadly back and forth. No, she says. Che asked me if I would bring him some food. He wanted to eat, and he wanted me to know about the offer he'd made, so that people would know about it, because he said he'd seen so much poverty in the area, so much malnutrition, so many people with bad teeth and thyroid problems. He said he felt badly about these forgotten people. Julia went to the house she was staying in, filled a bowl with peanut soup, then quickly returned. Che ate the soup by grabbing the bowl with his bound hands and drinking it. He thanked me and said that if he ever got out of this he would remember me for it. He then asked me if I would find out what was happening outside, what they were going to do with him. Julia said she would and returned to the house where her mother had prepared lunch. When I told her that Che was not as they had painted him, she told me to sit down and that I shouldn't have anything more to do with him, that it was very dangerous and that any moment there could be another firefight. Then, while we were eating, we suddenly heard gunfire. We thought the guerrillas were attacking. Che Guevara was standing in the schoolroom when 26-year-old Felix Rodriguez, a Cuban exile and CIA agent, walked inside. Rodriguez, who had spent the last four months working with the Bolivian military and was dressed in one of its uniforms, had just made a copy of Che's two diaries with a special camera. Earlier he'd been speaking with Che when a burst of gunfire sounded in the room next to theirs, which was a second classroom. The soldiers had just executed the Bolivian guerrilla who had helped Che in the Quebrada del Churro, a man nicknamed Willie. Che stopped talking, Rodriguez remembered. He did not say anything about the shooting, but his face reflected sadness, and he shook his head slowly from left to right several times. Perhaps it was at that instant that he realized that he, too, was doomed. Rodriguez told Che that orders had come from the high Bolivian command that he was to be executed. 
Che's face momentarily turned white, Rodriguez said, and then Che said quietly, It is better like this. I never should have been captured alive. Rodriguez asked Che if he had any last messages. Tell Fidel that he will soon see a triumphant revolution in America, Che said, and tell my wife to remarry and try to be happy. Che's bravery in the face of his own death affected the CIA agent, who had been trying to reverse the Cuban Revolution for years. He stepped forward and embraced the prisoner. It was a tremendously emotional moment for me, Rodriguez wrote. I no longer hated him. His moment of truth had come, and he was conducting himself like a man. He was facing his death with courage and grace. Rodriguez left the room. A short while later, a short sergeant named Mario Terran entered, having volunteered to shoot Che after losing three of his comrades in the recent firefight. When the sergeant told Che to sit, Che refused. No, I will stand for this, he said, fixing him with his stare. The sergeant had been drinking and hesitated. Che, who himself had signed numerous execution orders in Havana and had once executed a man himself, reportedly told Terran, Calm yourself and shoot. You are only going to kill a man. The soldier pulled the trigger of the automatic weapon, but his aim was poor. The burst of bullets hit Che in the legs and arm. Che fell, writhing on the ground, then bit his arm to stop from yelling. The soldier pulled the trigger again. This time, one of the bullets entered Che's chest, bursting his heart. After Julia heard the rifle fire, she waited for a bit, wondering if there was a guerrilla attack. But there were no more sounds. I waited until I couldn't stand it, she said, with all of the tension and fear I had. Finally, I made the decision to go see. Julia ran across the dirt road to the schoolhouse. There was no soldier in sight, the executioner having already departed. Inside, she found that Che was no longer sitting on the bench as she had left him, but was now stretched out on his back on the ground, his arms extended, unbound, his eyes staring at the ceiling. It didn't seem like he was dead, she said. His eyes were open and he was staring. I approached him and watched his eyes carefully to see if there was any movement, but there wasn't any. He didn't move. I didn't know what to do. I was afraid to leave and afraid to stay. My legs felt like they had a sack of corn, un quintal, on each one. I couldn't walk. My legs wouldn't obey me. Within a short while, a helicopter appeared, prearranged to carry Che's body to Valle Grande, where the army had set up operations. Soldiers laid the gorilla's body on a stretcher and roped it to the helicopter's skids. A priest arrived. Together, he and Julia prayed for Che's soul as the helicopter lifted off and bore the guerrilla leader away. In Valle Grande, on Malta Street, there's a chapel called the Capilla del Signor de Malta. The facade is white, and its tower the color of burnt umber. Next to the chapel is a hospital, and next to that, apparently in case things don't work out in either the church or the hospital, are two funeral parlors. It's late in the afternoon, the sun hangs like an orange, and I'm searching for the laundry room where Che's body was taken and displayed in the days following his execution. I watch as a man helps an old woman up the stairs to the chapel. Inside, a woman is singing Ave Maria, accompanied by a piano, her voice floating out sweetly into the street. Farther down the road, an elderly woman stands in a doorway. I stop, ask directions, and then suddenly ask her if she happened to be here when El Guerrero, Che Guevara, arrived years ago. She says she was, and motions me inside, looking both ways as if someone might see us. The woman's name is Eva Vargas Llosa del Monte. She's eighty-five, tall, and lanky. She says that her husband died seven years ago. Che was laid out on a stretcher on the cement wash basin, she says, just behind the hospital. The whole town turned out and filed past him with soldiers standing by. They moved him around like he was a stone, she says. He had no shoes. His eyes were open, his hair down to here she says, motioning to her shoulders. His face looked sad. Poor thing, such a cruel death he had. I cried because I'm sensitive, 
she tells me. I couldn't sleep afterwards, so I said a prayer for him. Behind the hospital, and on a sloping hill overlooking the valley, near a grove of eucalyptus and pines, I find the whitewashed adobe building that used to be a laundry room. The building has faded red tiles with gray lichen on them, and is open on one side. Within it are the two waist-high cement wash basins, where Che's stretcher was laid out, and where women used to gossip while hand-washing hospital linens. Photos from that day show Che as a lean, Christ-like figure, shirtless, his head propped up, his eyes wide open with a vacant stare. Various soldiers and officials pose behind their valuable quarry. A bullet hole is clearly evident in Che's alabaster-colored chest. The cement basin is now cold and smooth to the touch. On it, a visitor has left a vase of yellow chrysanthemums. The flowers have dried, and some of the petals have fallen lifelessly into the drain. Carved or written on the walls are hundreds of inscriptions by visitors from around the world. Countries such as Denmark, Mexico, Cuba, Argentina, Germany, France, Brazil, and Poland are all represented, bearing messages such as, Presente, or Che lives, or You did not die in vain. Outside the sun sinks and the wind blows softly through the trees. Forested hills rise in the distance, and church bells can be heard. At least for the pilgrims who come here, Che's story, his hopes, his struggles, and his dreams, live on. The once unremarkable laundry room has somehow been transformed into a kind of shrine, a shrine that, at least for these visitors, was once graced by a revolutionary hero or saint. Throughout the area, I'm told, people now pray to Santo Che. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and Che Guevara, help me in my time of need. That evening, after dinner, I walk past the local party headquarters of the MAS, or MAS, an acronym that stands for Movimiento al Socialismo, Movement for Socialism. Bolivia's current president, 52-year-old Juan Evo Morales Aima, is presently in his second term and, if he finishes, will be the first president in Bolivian history to complete two terms. Morales was born in an adobe home in a tiny Andean village. He became a coca leaf growing farmer and is the first indigenous Aymara speaking president in Bolivia since the country declared its independence from Spain in 1825. A critic of United States foreign policy and of the involvement of transnational corporations in Latin America, Morales is a socialist and an ally of the socialist governments of Venezuela and Cuba. Inside his presidential office in La Paz, Morales has installed a portrait of Che Guevara fashioned out of coca leaves. Guevara is invincible in his ideals, Morales has said president now of the very nation that once hunted down the Argentine revolutionary and had him killed. After so many years, he inspires us to continue fighting, changing not only Bolivia, but all of Latin America and the world. Inside the mass office, burning the night oil, I find 38-year-old Walberto Rivas Brito, president of Morales's mass party in Valle Grande province, he is short and strongly built, has an easy smile, and tells me an unusual story. In October 1967, just a few miles from where Che was captured, Walberto's parents were living in a small adobe home. There his father raised sheep, goats, and a few cows. A few days before the final ambush, the army captured one of Che's guerrillas, a man nicknamed Kamba. The guerrilla was taken temporarily to Walberto's parents' home. The military took a photo of him in my parents' house, Walberto says. It's in black and white, and you can see Camba tied up, alongside Coronel Gary Prado, who later became a Bolivian general. Walberto, who was born six years after Che's death, says that his parents were very conservative at the time. The guerrillas, they'd been told, were devils. The illiterate farmers in the area believed this, he says, so despite their poverty, they were reactionaries. The soldiers stationed in this particular region, however, ignored a key component of winning over his parents' hearts and minds. Seizing their sheep and goats, the soldiers slaughtered and ate them without payment. Later they told Walberto's father that, when the time came, they would reimburse him. They never did. 
When he later went to town to receive payment, they laughed at and humiliated him. My father returned, Walberto said, and swore that all of his kids would become revolutionaries like Che Guevara. The first book I ever read was Che's Bolivian Diary. My father had it, along with other books about Cuba. All of my brothers and sisters read them. Later, we all joined the Socialist Party MAS. Walberto's parents had fourteen children. Every one of them went to college. Because of the sacrifices my father and mother made, Walberto says, one by one we became doctors, lawyers, businessmen, accountants. When he was eighteen, Walberto received a scholarship to study at a university in Cuba. He spent fourteen years on the tropical island studying veterinary medicine and then computers. It was inspiring, he says of his stay. There was a real feeling of solidarity. Cuba's education system is first class. After Che's execution, Walberto tells me, he was buried three days later by several Bolivian soldiers and a CIA officer, secretly, in the dead of night. Che's hands had been amputated for identification, and his handless corpse was then thrown into a makeshift grave in an open field near Valle Grande's airport. Thirty years later, in 1997, a Cuban forensic team traveled to Valle Grande and located his remains. Che's body was repatriated to Cuba, and the revolutionary hero was given a large state funeral, his wife and children in attendance. I waited in line from 6 a.m., remembers Walberto, who was living in Cuba at the time. It took ten hours to visit his casket. It was very moving. Che was finally back home again, among people who appreciated him. I think the whole island was there. In Cuba, Walberto also met the son of the Bolivian guerrilla Willie, who'd tried to help Che to safety the day of the ambush and had been executed just before Che in the adjacent schoolroom. His son had also received a scholarship and was studying at the university, Walberto said. The two of them became good friends. In 2004, when Walberto learned that the socialist Evo Morales was running for president, he returned to Bolivia. A year later, Morales won, and Walberto ran for and was elected president of the MAS party in Valle Grande. Forty years after Che died, a socialist government had arrived in Bolivia, not with guns, but through the ballot box. For revolutionaries like ourselves, Walberto says, Che is nevertheless an example to follow— an example of the new man he was trying to build. That was his dream, no? Che didn't just talk. He showed by example. That's why we have such admiration for him. And that's why all of us who support Evo Morales are inspired by the ideals of Che. He affected us all. On the other side of town, Julia Cortez sits in her living room, clasping her hands. Che's arrival four decades ago in her La Higuera schoolroom affected Julia deeply, too, but not in the same way it had Walberto. Shortly after Che was executed, Julia says, people in the area began whispering, The teacher in La Higuera is dangerous. She's a communist. She should not be teaching our children. All because I gave food to Che, Julia says. Because I spoke with him, because I treated him as a human being and not as an animal— because I respected him. That same year, an article came out in a newspaper in Valle Grande repeating the rumors and suggesting that Julia was teaching communism to La Higuera's students. None of it was true, but the rumors took on a life of their own. School authorities soon transferred Julia to a remoter town, Alto Seco. It was the same village Che and his guerrillas had occupied briefly a year before, haranguing the population— Soon, signs began to appear on the town's walls, painted in red. La profesora es comunista. The teacher is a communist, they proclaimed. Julia was transferred again. It made me mad, Julia says. I was ready to fight anyone who said something like that. Before that, I was timid. Finally, six years after Che died, Julia was able to meet with General Joaquin Zenteno Anaya, who had commanded the 8th Division, which captured Guevara. Zenteno had visited the famous prisoner on his final day, but Che had refused to speak to him. After listening to Julia's predicament, however, the general spoke publicly about the matter. He said that no one was to bother me any more, that he had been to La Higuera when Che was captured and knew the truth, 
that he and other military men had eaten in my home. He stood by me and said, Hands off. After that, things calmed down. Three years later, Julia says, Zenteno was assassinated while he was an ambassador in Paris. It was part of Che's curse, she says, clasping her hands. Those who captured Che died in terrible ways. President René Barrientos, for example, who ordered Che's execution, died in a mysterious helicopter crash two years later. One day his chopper, Julia says, dropped from the sky like a stone. Lieutenant Colonel André Selick, who helped capture Che and kept one of his wristwatches afterward, died in 1973. He was beaten to death by thugs working for the Bolivian dictator Hugo Banzer, whom Selick had helped seize power. In 1981, Colonel Gary Prado, head of the Bolivian Rangers who captured Che, shot himself accidentally while cleaning his gun. He's been paralyzed and in a wheelchair ever since. Only Mario Taran, the sergeant who actually executed Che, has thus far escaped the curse, although only partially. For years he lived under an assumed name, fearful that he might be assassinated. Some say the CIA helped to protect him. Then, in 2006, Tehran showed up in the Bolivian city of Santa Cruz at a free eye clinic called Operation Miracle, funded by Venezuela and staffed by Cuban doctors. Ironically, the man who had killed Che Guevara decades earlier had his cataracts removed and his sight restored by doctors from the very socialist nation that Che Guevara had helped create. Four decades after Mario Taran attempted to destroy a dream and an idea, Che returns to win yet another battle, the Cuban newspaper Granma proclaimed. Now an old man, he, Taran, can once again appreciate the colors of the sky and the forest and enjoy the smiles of his grandchildren. A free Cuban health clinic now operates in La Igara, Julia tells me, and helps the needy in the still impoverished zone. Thirty-six more Cuban doctors are spread throughout the region, all volunteers. On the last day of his life, when asked by one of his captors why he'd come to Bolivia to fight, Che replied, Can you see the state in which the peasants live? They're almost like savages, living in a state of poverty that depresses the heart, having only one room in which to sleep and cook, and no clothing to wear, abandoned like animals. The Bolivian lives without hope. Just as he is born, he dies, without ever seeing improvements in his human condition. Some forty years later, I can't help but reflect that sixty percent of Bolivians continue to live in poverty, nearly forty percent in extreme poverty, eighty percent have no electricity, fifty percent have no sewage system, and another eighty-six percent have no running water. Despite an endless stream of governments, little seems to have changed. Meanwhile, in her living room, Julia clasps and reclasps her hands some more, thinking of the events of forty years ago and how they affected so many people. On my way out, I leave her a small gift of money, for which she says she is grateful. It's not from me, I tell her. She stares at me, uncomprehending. It's from Che. 8. The Final Days of Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid Bolivia. A man who has had an outlaw past is never safe, no matter how straight he goes afterwards. That's the price he pays. Something out of his past life may raise up against him and wreck his life any time. Matt Warner, former outlaw friend of Butch Cassidy. I came down to South America with the idea of settling down. In the States, there was nothing but jail, the noose, or being shot by a posse. I thought maybe I could change things, but I guess things at this late date can't be changed. I know how it's going to end. I guess that's the way it's got to be. Butch Cassidy to a friend, circa 1907, in Bolivia. I never met a soul more affable than you, Butch, or faster than the kid, but you're still nothing but two-bit outlaws on the dodge. It's over. Don't you get that? Your time is over, and you're going to die bloody and all you can do is choose where. William Goldman, Screenplay, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid It was roughly six o'clock on a Friday afternoon, the sun sinking low, as the two gringos, both outlaws, 
rode over the lip of the valley and began heading down the trail toward town. San Vicente, Bolivia, was an old mining town, a cluster of sagging adobe houses with thatched roofs and a single church. A cemetery with crumbling wooden crosses surrounded by an adobe wall rose just behind town, and mine shafts with gray tailings scarred the nearby hills full of silver and zinc. At over fourteen thousand feet, the cold was already descending. By nightfall, it would be freezing. The two outlaws had ridden all day, the day before and the day and night before that, and were tired. In their saddlebags they carried a pair of binoculars, an English dictionary, a well-marked map of Bolivia, and hundreds of rounds of ammunition. Colt revolvers of blue-gray steel protruded from their holsters, and each had a rifle strapped to his saddle. In one of their saddlebags they also carried money, 15,000 bolivianos, worth about $90,000 U.S. Only two days earlier they had liberated the money at gunpoint from a Bolivian mining company. One of the gringos, the quiet tall one, was forty-one years old, nearly six feet tall, wore a dark mustache, and rode a black mule. The other, who went by the name of Butch, was forty-two and shorter, about five foot nine, with a thick, square jaw, sand-colored hair, and deeply set blue eyes that some said could burn a hole right through you. Butch rode a coffee-colored mule that the two had seized in the hold-up. Neither knew it, but as the men and their mules plodded slowly into the outskirts of town, a few townspeople looking up at them curiously, this was the last place where either would ever seek shelter. For Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, names that had made them infamous throughout North America, neither would ever leave this small, wind-blown Bolivian town alive. Tobitza, Tobitza, Tobitza! shouts the bus driver, opening with a whoosh the pneumatic door. The tall, blue, double-decker bus I've arrived on is covered in dust as most roads in Bolivia alternate between paving and dirt, with a heavy emphasis on dirt. Tupiza, I discover, is a small, sunny, pleasant rural city set at 7,000 feet at the base of a fold of the Andes in southwest Bolivia. After retrieving my baggage from the bus's hold, I flag down a cab and in no time at all am dropped off at the Hotel Mitru. Mitru means crown in Greek, and the hotel was founded by a Greek immigrant, Nicolas Mitru, just after the turn of the century. At first, Signor Mitru tried his hand at mining, and then, after coming up empty-handed, went into the hotel business. Back in his day, Tupiza boasted two hotels, both on the main plaza the Terminus and the Internacional. The hotels, small by today's standards, routinely filled with traveling businessmen, mining superintendents, merchants, laborers, and even occasional bandits traveling under aliases. On November 3, 1908, Butch Cassidy was one of them. It's to follow the trail of Butch's last robbery and of his and Sundance's final days that I've arrived in Tupiza. Two days before Butch and Sundance rode their mules into San Vicente, the two outlaws had pulled their final hold-up. In a rugged and remote area studded with tall cacti, they'd surprised two Bolivian men and a boy who were accompanying three mules, one of which carried the payroll from a mining firm, Aramayo, Franque, and Company. According to Carlos Perot, the man in charge of the payroll, while they were on their way down a mule trail on a rocky hillside near where the trail met a shallow canyon, they were stopped by two men on foot who suddenly stepped out with cocked rifles. Perot later wrote to his employers that, On the descent to Wakawanuska, Dead Cow Hill, on the rugged bottom part, we were surprised by two Yankees whose faces were covered with bandanas and whose rifles were cocked and ready to fire at our slightest suspicious movement. In a very threatening manner, they ordered my servant and my son to dismount, having found me following them on foot, and immediately ordered us to hand over the money we were carrying, to which I answered that they could search us and take whatever they wanted, as we were hardly in a position to offer any resistance. One of them, most likely Butch Cassidy, quickly began to search our saddlebags, and, not finding what he was looking for, demanded that we unload our baggage, specifying that they were not interested in our personal money, nor in any articles that belonged to us, but only in the money that we were carrying for the mining company. The two Yankees wore new, dark-red, thin whale corduroy suits with narrow, soft-brimmed hats, the brims turned down in such a way that, 
with the bandanas tied behind their ears, only their eyes could be seen. One of the bandits, most likely Butch, the one who came closest to and talked with me, is thin and of normal stature, and the other, most likely Sundance, who always maintained a certain distance, is heavyset and taller. Both of them carried new carbines, which appeared to be of the Mauser type, small caliber and with a thick barrel. The bandits also carried Colt revolvers, and I believe they also had very small Browning revolvers outside their cartridge belts, which were filled with rifle ammunition. They knew that I spoke English, in which language they asked me if we were not carrying 80,000 Bolivianos, around $500,000 U.S., to which I replied that the sum was not quite as large as they believed, and when I saw that there was no point in hiding anything, a search of the baggage having begun, I informed them that it was only 15,000 Bolivianos, or around $90,000 U.S. What I said caused great anguish, momentarily silencing the bandit nearest us. As soon as they saw the package containing the cash, which was beside another very similar package, the bandit conducting the search took it and passed it to his companion, without bothering with the other package, nor searching any more of the baggage, which shows that they had clear knowledge of the package with the cash. They then demanded that I give them our servant's mule, the dark brown named Aramayo, with the town of Quechisla brand, which is known by all our stable hands in the nearby city of Tupiza. Keeping their eyes on us and their rifles ready, they departed with the mule. Certainly these bandits had been in the city of Tupiza for some time, studying our company's habits and preparing their strike with total coolness and knowledge. Moreover, they undoubtedly planned their retreat carefully. Otherwise, they would not have left us with our animals, or they would have killed us in order to avoid accusations or to gain time. Butch and Sundance's hold-up of the Aramayo Franke and Company payroll was the last in a long, mostly successful string of bank and payroll robberies that stretched back nearly twenty years, dating from the first bank Butch robbed in Telluride, Colorado, in 1889. At the time of his first hold-up, Butch was twenty-three. Sundance, who may also have been a participant, was twenty-two. Although Sundance had already served eighteen months in prison for horse theft, and Butch would later serve eighteen months for the same, neither was ever captured for a bank robbery, despite eventually stealing hundreds of thousands of dollars and being pursued by numerous posses, thanks to rewards adding up to more than thirty thousand dollars that had been placed on their heads. The two were excellent cowboys, skilled bronco-busters, seasoned and cool bank robbers, and highly accurate shots. Butch, by most accounts, was friendly and gregarious. A biographer who interviewed many of Butch's contemporaries at the time wrote, He never drank to excess, was always courteous to women, was free with money when he had it, and extremely loyal to his friends. All the old-timers, including officers who hunted him, were unanimous in saying, Butch Cassidy was one of the finest men I ever knew. Sundance, by contrast, was quieter, more distant, some even said shy. Their friendship nevertheless lasted for more than a decade, and, despite what was often a violent and dangerous profession, neither Butch nor Sundance had ever killed a man. That is, until their final moments in Bolivia. The two outlaws rode their mules into San Vicente, a town named after an early Christian Spanish martyr. Neither knew if word of their robbery had reached town yet. Bolivia was crisscrossed by telegraph wires now, as the modern world continued to creep in, fueled by mining profits. But none connected to San Vicente yet. In a dusty street, the two inquired at the mayor's house if there were lodging. There was none, he said. The mayor suggested they might find a spare room at Bonifacio Casasola's house, in the center of town. Butch and Sundance headed that way, led by the mayor. No doubt they were outwardly relaxed, yet ready to pull a gun, kick their spurs into their mule's flanks, and begin shooting at the proverbial drop of a hat. Casasola's house sat inside a patio surrounded by adobe walls with a single entrance to the dirt street outside. Butch and Sundance dismounted, led their mules through the entrance into the patio, and took their saddles off. They then entered their quarters. A single room with thick adobe brick walls, a wooden bench, a large earthenware jug, and no windows. 
Tired and dirty, and with no change of clothes, they asked Casasola to buy some tins of sardines and a couple of beers, and gave him some money to do so. Unbeknownst to either of them, only three hours earlier an armed patrol consisting of an army captain, two soldiers, and a police officer had arrived in town. The patrol was part of a region-wide mobilization, hunting for the pair of outlaws who had recently stolen a mining payroll. The mayor lingered, asking them some questions. Where were they coming from? he asked. From the Argentine border, they replied. Where were they headed? South, to Santa Carolina, a town in Argentina. Butch and Sundance, nevertheless, asked about the trail north, in the opposite direction, the trail that led to Uyuni. The latter was the nearest town with a railway station. From there they could take the train and disappear. The mayor told them how to find the trail, bid them good evening, then hurried off to alert the soldiers. Butch and Sundance had no plans to rob the mining payroll. Felix Charlar Miranda, a sixty-one-year-old judge and Butch Cassidy aficionado, explains to me. They wanted to rob the Tupitza Bank on the main square. Then a cavalry regiment arrived and decided to bivouac in one of the hotels on the plaza for a lengthy stay. So Butch and Sundance were forced to make new plans, rash ones, and that's what got them into trouble. I'd called Felix by phone the night of my arrival in Tupitza, thinking that we might meet for the first time the following day. "'Where are you staying?' he asked. When I told him at the Hotel Mitru, he quickly replied, "'I'll stop by right away so that we don't lose any time.' Sure enough, Felix soon arrived, wearing slacks and a suit jacket. He had salt-and-pepper hair, a mustache, bushy eyebrows, and intense dark eyes. Felix had lived in Tupitza all his life, had owned a television station, Channel 5, now defunct, had worked as an attorney and presently worked as a judge. In his office lay stacks of divorce papers and a smaller stack of murder cases. Felix is the local expert on Butch and Sundance and has converted part of his house into a sort of historical museum. Soon after meeting, he suggests we take a walk. Outside, the adobe buildings are joined to one another, with smooth stuccoed facades and peeling layers of old posters and paint. As we walk the dark streets, lit by dim lamps, everyone seems to know him. We stop repeatedly as the judge shakes hands with passers-by. Buenas noches, he says repeatedly. Como están? People stop, bow, shake hands, then continue. Everyone pays me their respects, Felix says, then turns toward me, lifting an eyebrow for emphasis. Except those I put in jail. Felix's father, it turns out, used to be a prison guard, and, as a boy, Felix used to go to the Tupitza prison. In those days the prisoners worked outside of their cells. Felix soon struck up a friendship with a Peruvian prisoner serving a murder sentence, who taught Felix to play chess. My father told me about why these men were inside and how the justice system worked, Felix says. That's what got me interested in the law. Felix tells me that had Butch and Sundance been captured instead of killed, they could very well have ended up in the same prison where his father had worked. The outlaw known as Butch Cassidy was born Robert Leroy Parker, the son of Mormon parents who emigrated from England in 1856. Born in 1866 in Beaver in the Utah Territory, Butch was the first of thirteen children and was just a young teenager when his father decided to move the family to outside of Circleville, a tiny community about twelve miles away. The family took over a small pine-planked cabin that had been abandoned during the Mormon-Ute-Indian War, and soon launched into homesteading on 160 acres of semi-arid scrubland. It was a tough, hard-scrabble existence, but also a time during which Butch learned to hunt, ride, break broncos, and rope cattle. By the time he was thirteen, the friendly, sandy-haired boy had hired himself out as a cowboy on a nearby ranch. Butch's father, meanwhile, having trouble keeping his family fed, began farming additional land. When another farmer later complained, a Mormon bishop forbade Butch's father from farming the extra land, despite all the work already invested in it. Embittered, both Butch and his father took the church's decision hard. From then on, his sister Lulu later wrote, Butch did everything he could to avoid attending church. In his mid-teens, Butch had a brief yet fateful encounter with a young ranch hand and part-time cattle rustler named Mike Cassidy. 
Cassidy soon befriended the young teenager, teaching him a number of skills. One of those was how to appropriate cattle from stock owners, that is, how to put one's own brand on unbranded strays, then hide them in isolated canyons before selling them as one's own. This was an era of hard winters and cattle and sheep wars, when large cattle syndicates began squeezing out the smaller ranchers, and itinerant cowboys had trouble scraping together a living. Butch so looked up at Cassidy that, when he too began to cross over to the other side of the law occasionally, he began giving his name not as Parker, but as Cassidy. For a while, Butch went by the name of Robert Cassidy. After a short stint working as a butcher in Wyoming, however, he eventually picked up the final piece of the sobriquet that would stick with him the rest of his life. Butch Cassidy. Old-timers in the area of Circleville later remembered that by the time he was a teenager, Butch was already a crack shot. Stories circulated of the young Mormon cowboy spending hours practicing his marksmanship by drawing his gun and firing at a playing card, hitting it dead center each time. At other times, they said, Butch would ride his horse as fast as he could around a slender tree, firing at the tree and hitting it over and over again, no matter how fast he rode. In June 1889, after knocking around the West as a cowboy and occasional cattle rustler, and breaking broncos for a dollar a day, Butch, now twenty-three, took the fateful step that would forever alter his future. At noon on Monday, June 24th, Butch and three other men walked into the San Miguel Valley Bank in Telluride, Colorado, wearing boots, chaps, spurs, and gun belts, pulled out their revolvers, then announced that this was a hold-up. Butch's job was to leap over the counter and remove the cash from the vault. The others made sure that no one made a move. Even split four ways, their haul of $21,000 was more money than any of them could make as hired cowboys working steadily for the next five years. In an otherwise flawless getaway, however, the quartet of newly minted desperados had a piece of bad luck. Riding hard outside of town, they galloped unmasked past an acquaintance who recognized them and who later gave their names to the posse. Just that little accident made all of the difference in the world to us for the rest of our lives, wrote Matt Warner, one of the three riding with Butch. It gave them a clue so they could trace us for thousands of miles and for years. Right at that point is where we broke our half-outlaw past, became real outlaws, burned our bridges behind us, and had no way to live except by robbing and stealing. It was also during that bank robbery that Butch may have hooked up with 22-year-old Harry Longabaugh, a young man who read about cowboys and the Wild West in dime novels while growing up in Pennsylvania, and headed out west on a wagon train at 15. A good rider and bronco buster, Harry had already served two years in jail in Sundance, Wyoming, for horse theft, picking up the nickname The Sundance Kid afterward. Eventually, he and Butch would form a loose confederation of outlaws known as the Wild Bunch, which robbed trains, banks, and mining payrolls throughout the West. Butch, the former Mormon cowboy, was its charismatic leader. Despite a string of mostly successful robberies, however, during the next decade, civilization gradually began creeping into the western frontier, making the life expectancy of the typical outlaw shorter and shorter. It was hard for us to understand this change that had come over the Old West, Matt Warner later wrote. For a time, we couldn't see that what was behind it was that more railroads, telegraph lines, wagon roads, bridges, farms, cities, and settlements was blocking all the old long trails, filling up the old hiding places, and making it easier for the law to spread a dragnet over the whole country. That made it tougher each year for the horseman outlaw. In 1900, the Union Pacific Railroad, robbed one too many times by Butch's wild bunch, hired a permanent posse of some of the best trackers and marksmen in the West. The railway outfitted a special train to carry the posse and their horses rapidly to the site of any robbery. Their mission was a simple one, to hunt down and capture or kill any member of the wild bunch they could. For Butch and Sundance, the writing was on the wall. 
With the law closing in, rewards on their heads, and posses waiting to spring on them like bear traps, it was perhaps time to rethink their chosen profession. Somehow the two came up with the idea that Argentina and the vast wild cowboy pompous in the South might be the perfect place for them to start over. Stories about ranching and homesteading opportunities in Argentina were not uncommon in American newspapers of the 1890s, Western historian Dan Buck told me. Maybe Butch read one of them while in a barber shop. However it came about, a decision was made. After pulling one last train robbery in Tipton, Utah, in August 1900, Butch, Sundance, and Sundance's girlfriend Ethel Place boarded a steamship in New York City headed for Buenos Aires. Butch was 35, Sundance 34, and Ethel was 24. Between 1901 and 1905, Butch and Sundance did their best to become law-abiding ranchers, homesteading four square leagues, roughly 12 square miles or 7,500 acres, of government land in the Chubut province in southern Argentina. Ethel posed as Sundance's wife, and for four years the three lived at the base of the Andes. There they bred cattle and horses, made friends with their neighbors, and lived together in a plank wood cabin that Ethel had decorated with articles cut out of North American magazines. Butch went by the name of Santiago Ryan. Sundance and Ethel posed as Mr. and Mrs. Harry Place. An Italian immigrant who spent a night at their house later wrote that Ethel was well-dressed and liked to read. He added that Ryan and Place were... Tall, slender, laconic, and nervous, with intense gazes. Those who knew them well said they were expert shooters, capable of hitting a coin in the air. Everything went reasonably well until sometime in 1905, when Butch and Sundance received a message that would set them on the run again, a tip-off from an acquaintance that the Pinkerton Detective Agency had located them, and that Argentine authorities were about to make their arrests. Almost overnight, the three abandoned their ranch and disappeared into the Andes. A few months later, they emerged long enough to rob a bank in northern Argentina, their first robbery in South America, then fled across the border to Chile. Butch, Sundance, and now Ethel were bank robbers on the run again. "'You'll never know what it means to be hunted,' said Matt Warner, Butch's former partner in crime. "'You can never sleep.' You've always got to listen with one ear and keep one eye open. After a while, you almost go crazy. No sleep. Even when you know you're perfectly safe, you can't sleep. Every little noise sounds like a posse of sheriffs coming to get you. At some point, probably in 1906, Ethel returned to the United States, with Sundance accompanying her. Perhaps she was tired of running from the law. Perhaps she was sad over having lost the ranch that they had devoted four years of their lives to. Butch, meanwhile, moved on to Bolivia, and Sundance soon returned and joined him. The two outlaws, now wanted in the United States and Argentina, decided to keep a low profile, taking jobs at the Concordia Tin Mines, southeast of Bolivia's capital, La Paz. They worked as mule tenders, used assumed names, and Butch, ever the gregarious one, soon made friends with the many expatriates working there. Recalled Percy Siebert, an American who worked with them at the time, The tightly knit group of Americans working the mines were bound together by the loneliness of that God-forsaken place, high up in the mountains, where the air was so thin we could use only a special tough breed of mule, and the only other humans were Indians. We had to rely on one another. It didn't make any difference if your neighbor was an outlaw, former Western gunfighter, or fugitive from an army stockade in the States. He was all you had to share memories of the States, as a partner in chess, dominoes, or checkers, to share a drink, and to help you celebrate Christmas, New Year's, and July 4th. By November 1908, Butch and Sundance were in their early 40s, had been in South America for seven years, had almost run out of money, and were visiting Tupiza in southern Bolivia. The city had much in common with Telluride, Colorado, where Butch had robbed his first bank. Both cities lay in the middle of rich mining regions, and both possessed banks often overflowing with profits from the extraction of raw ore. Not long after they arrived, Butch and Sundance decided to rob Tupiza's main bank, which sat on the central plaza. 
It would be their first robbery since northern Argentina three years earlier. As usual, the duo carefully cased the target, plotting their escape route and readying themselves for what by now was a routine job for them. Then, just as they prepared to make their move, a military detachment arrived in town, choosing the International Hotel as its headquarters. Unfortunately for the two outlaws, the hotel stood directly across from the bank. Butch and Sundance didn't know what to do, explains Felix Charlar, the judge. Now they were stuck in town and had no money and had no bank to rob. They were never going to outrun a regiment. So what were they going to do? I'd stop by the judge's residence, a two-story row house that has a metal sign engraved on the door. Felix Charlar Miranda, abogado, lawyer. It's where Felix has lived for forty-five years. The house is old and made of whitewashed adobe. The foyer inside has a cement floor and cracked walls. It's crammed with so many weathered objects that it looks like an antique store. Posters of the 1969 film Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid hang from the walls, along with a collection of turn-of-the-century bric-a-brac from Tupitza's Cowboy Past, rusted and used Winchester rifles, revolvers, telegraph boxes, pitted spurs, and enormous iron padlocks with five-inch keys, safeguards against potential bandits who died long ago. Felix searches through several stacks of documents, tilts his glasses down to read better, then pulls out a copy of an old local newspaper, the Chirolke. It's an issue dated November 4th, 1908. I wanted you to see this he says, using a thick forefinger to underline his point. This shows Butch Cassidy staying at the Terminus Hotel on the square, he says, on Monday, the night before the robbery. I peer over his shoulder and see a notice apparently routinely published in the newspapers in those days, a list of names of the various travelers staying at the town's two hotels. On the night of November 3rd, twelve guests had registered at the Terminus Hotel. One of them was Santiago Lowe, an alias Butch Cassidy used in Bolivia. Just below the notice is a list of the guests who were staying at the Hotel Internacional, just across the square. The chiefs and officers of the Alboroa Regiment. With their planned operation now spoiled, Butch and Sundance had to find another target to rob. They soon found a suitable replacement. Felix Aramayo, one of the wealthiest men in Bolivia, and his firm Aramayo, Franque, and Company. Butch's philosophy about banks and express companies was common in the early West, wrote James Horan, an early Butch biographer. In the popular mind of that time, they represented big business, which foreclosed on farms and homes and were hated by small ranchers and farmers. I'm not as bad as I'm painted, Butch once told a Utah lawyer he had contacted in 1900, asking what the chances were of getting a pardon if he promised to stop robbing. I never killed a man in my life, and that's gospel. I never robbed an individual, only banks and railroads that have been robbing the people for years. After the lawyer informed him that his chances of a pardon were slim, Butch no doubt fixed his intense gaze on him and said, You know the law, and I guess you're right, but I'm sorry it can't be fixed some way. You'll never know what it means to be forever on the dodge. Butch Cassidy may have hated big business, but in both the U.S. and South America, he got along well with common folk. In Bolivia, said Percy Siebert, who worked with Butch and Sundance off and on at the Concordia Mines from 1906 to 1908, Butch was quite popular in the countryside, particularly with the Indian children. Whenever he went to La Paz, he would always come back with sticks of candy, which he gave to the children— I can still see him coming up the trail to our place, followed by a pack of yelling, laughing kids. On one occasion, after becoming friends and learning that his two mule tenders were actually famous outlaws, Siebert asked if they might not show him how fast they were with their guns. Butch and Sundance agreed, then rummaged around till they found some targets. As Siebert later recounted, We walked outside, Butch and the kid each, with two beer bottles. They strapped on their six-shooters, and when Butch nodded, they suddenly threw the bottles high in the air. As they started to curve down, first the kid's gun leaped into his hand, and the bottles vanished into splinters. Then Cassidy's followed. They repeated the same trick a few times and never missed. 
The gunfire echoed in the valley like a cannonade and brought out Mrs. Siebert. "'My God, boys,' she said, "'what on earth are you doing?' Butch apologized. "'I'm sorry, ma'am. We were just showing Purse and Mr. Glass a little western shooting.' According to Siebert, by 1908, Butch, now forty-two years old and having worked since he was thirteen, was beginning to show both his age and the effects of always being on the run. I began to see a change in Cassidy. He looked older and worn. The strain was now showing. The Sundance kid became more morose, and although we were old friends, he barely said more than the usual amenities. Their welcome, as mine employees, was also wearing thin, because the army was visiting the mines unexpectedly and hinting to the owners that it might not be wise to hire these train and bank robbers. A year earlier, in fact, the Pinkerton Detective Agency had sent a circular to as many banks in South America as possible, advising them to be on the lookout for Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. The last paragraph issued a stark warning to any law enforcement agency that might attempt to apprehend them. When attempting to arrest either of these fugitives, officers are warned to have sufficient assistance, be fully armed, taking no risks as they will make a determined resistance before submitting to arrest, not hesitating to kill if necessary. The two soldiers and the police inspector were sitting inside their quarters in San Vicente when the mayor arrived with some unexpected news. Two well-armed Yankees had just ridden into town, the mayor told them. One was riding a mule from the Aramayo mining camp where the stolen payroll had been headed. The Yankees had asked questions about the road north to Uyuni, where the train left from, and were bunked in a room in Casasola's house. Each had a revolver and a rifle and plenty of ammunition. The police inspector wasted no time, telling the soldiers to load their rifles and to come with him to investigate. The mayor tagged along behind. Inside their room, Butch and Sundance were eating. It was dusk, and the room was already lit by candlelight. A noise or commotion must have tipped them off. Butch stood and drew his gun. Outside, two soldiers carrying rifles had entered the patio and were approaching the doorway to their room. The police inspector and the mayor stood well behind them, out in the street, trying to peer inside. Butch waited until the first soldier came near, then stepped suddenly into the doorway, aimed his pistol, and fired. After my visit with the judge, the next morning I get up early, have breakfast, and then walk outside the hotel, where I find a Toyota Land Cruiser waiting, a blue auxiliary gas barrel strapped on top of its rack. The hotel runs a tour agency, meet through tours, and for the next few days I've booked the Toyota and a driver who's also a guide. The only way to retrace the trail Butch and Sundance took to their hold-up site, and to San Vicente, I've learned, is with a four-wheel drive. My driver, Enrique, is in his late twenties, was born in the tiny pueblo of San Miguel, and asks if we can take his mother there, which is along the way. I nod, and soon an energetic woman with long black skirts and very few teeth climbs in. Gracias, senor, she says, shaking my hand. We are soon outside the city, heading to where Butch and Sundance held up the mining payroll, a place called Waka Wanyuska. Six months before their final robbery, Butch and Sundance had visited Santa Cruz, a frontier town in Bolivia's southeastern jungle. After exploring the area, Butch felt that he had finally found a place to start over. Some believe that the payroll heist Butch and Sundance carried out later that year was to fund another try at going straight, this time as cattle ranchers in the Bolivian jungle. Butch soon fired off an enthusiastic letter to his expatriate friends at the Concordia Tin Mines. We arrived here about three weeks ago after a very pleasant journey and found just the place I have been looking for for twenty years. This is a town of eighteen thousand, and fourteen thousand are females, and some of them are birds. This is the only place for old fellows like myself. One never gets too old if he has blue eyes and a red face and looks capable of making a blue-eyed baby boy. Land is cheap here, and everything grows good that is planted— Land is worth ten cents per hectare, ten leagues, thirty-five miles, from here, and there is some good estancias, ranches, for sale, one twelve leagues, forty-five miles, from, with plenty of water and good grass and some sugar cane, for five thousand bolivianos, 
around $30,000, and others just as cheap, and if I don't fall down, I will be living here before long. We expect to be back at Concordia in about one month. Good luck to all you fellows. We travel through dry, desolate country, through forests of tall silver cacti called Cabello Pelado, with yellow stubby fruits on top, and past ruined adobe villages, their mud and cane roofs caved in. Some of the villages, softened by time and occasional rain, look more like sandcastles slowly melting back into the ground. After about an hour, we stop in the tiny town of San Miguel, where my driver was born. Corn stands in fields that stretch down to the river Salado, the tasseliers shivering at times in the breeze. Mountains rise in the distance on the other side. Enrique's mother owns several small homes here, one with a cracked glass window set into the straw and mud bricks. A mud oven, looking like a giant chest-high beehive, squats nearby. His mother uses it for baking bread. The villagers have built irrigation ditches, and under the stones in the clear, rippled water scuttle small, gray, freshwater crabs. The crabs are tasty, Enrique says, when fried in oil. His mother gets out, walks into a nearby field, pulls a shaggy corn stalk from the ground, then deftly cuts up the interior of the stalk into small white pieces with a machete. She hands me one with her gnarled brown fingers, suggesting I suck on it. I do, and am surprised to find it nearly as sweet as sugar cane. His mother then shakes my hand, smiles a toothless smile, and disappears behind the village. Enrique says his mother has come to get some goat cheese to sell at the Tupizza market. Most of the village is deserted, he says, as residents have died and their children have left to find work in the cities. Many of the houses' roofs have collapsed, the buildings sinking slowly into the ground like tired elephants. Only the old people, it seems, have remained behind, living quietly among the sun-baked bricks. A little further on, we arrive at Salo a similar village of small thatched-roofed homes. It was here that Carlos Perro, his son, his servant, and their four mules stayed, their first night out from Tupiza, in an adobe hacienda that the mining magnate Felix Aramayo owned. The building is still there, now converted into a school with large archways in its façade. In the distance we see an old man walking, slightly bent over with a cane, moving as if in slow motion. The old man wears gray slacks, a frayed jacket, a battered hat, and tire sandals. "'I don't seem to know you,' he says, peering at us when we approach and offer our hands. The man speaks Quechua and only a little Spanish, was born in 1930, and has lived here all his life. He quickly adds that he will die here, too. His skin is leathery, like that of a tortoise. Enrique asks him in Quechua if he has ever heard a story of two gringos being killed in the area. Yes, he says, frowning. Two bandits were killed long ago at Huaca Juanusca. Where did he hear about this? Enrique asks. From his parents, the man replies. The story is partially garbled. Butch and Sundance held up the payroll in Huaca Juanusca, but they died in San Vicente. Still, one hundred and three years after they were killed, Butch and Sundance's story still remains as a faint echo in the memory of an eighty-one-year-old Quechua-speaking farmer. In front of the hacienda sits a small adobe house with broken windows and a locked door. It's for the priest, the old man says. The priest comes here only once or twice a year. The old man then asks us for a few coins to buy a drink. I give him a coin worth five bolivianos. The old man thanks me, bowing formally, then heads slowly away. From Salo, which lies along a fertile valley, we continue on, through forests of cacti of different kinds. We climb from the valley on the dirt road, then turn off onto a smaller one, heading first past a group of burros, wandering among the cacti and scrub, then past a group of llamas, black, white, and multicolored. Finally, Enrique stops the car and shuts off the engine. To catch the ambush site, we must go on foot, he says. Clouds touch the mountaintops in the distance as Enrique and I begin following a faint trail along a tiny stream flowing down a kind of quebrada, or shallow canyon. The creek is smooth and clear, and the water slides over black sand that has the cloven tracks of llamas pressed into it. 
Giant blocks of greenish-gray stone, streaked with thin lines of milky quartz, lie marooned alongside the stream bank, having fallen down from nearby cliffs. We walk past native canua trees, about twenty feet high, with cinnamon-colored scaly dry bark and tiny green leaves. Butch and Sundance probably tied their horses to trees like these, Enrique says. Ulala cacti sprout from the ground, higher than a man, with long white spines. Bright green circles of moss, called yaretta, a foot round, grow low to the ground, looking like stranded brain corals. As we walk, the only sounds are those of water trickling, birds calling, and our feet occasionally stumbling over stones. Further ahead, we turn away from the stream and follow the old mule trail up from the Quebrada, up onto the flank of Huaca Juanusca. The trail rises, then crests a ridge, and we stop. Ahead, we can clearly see the mule trail extending up around the side of the hill for a good mile before it disappears around a curve. Behind us, we can look down to the stream bed we just hiked up. It's an obvious lookout spot, an excellent place for Butch and Sundance to have crouched, waiting for the mining payroll to show up in the distance, ready to spring their ambush. I sit on a ledge of rock just behind the ridge, scanning the trail on the other side where Carlos Perot would have appeared. For the first time, I feel the presence of Cassidy and Sundance. No doubt they, too, had sat right here. Nothing in the area has really changed since then, I realize. Butch and Sundance would recognize everything. Butch's bullet caught the first soldier in the neck from about four paces away. The soldier fired instantaneously in return before he knew what had hit him. He then dropped his rifle, fell to the ground, and began to crawl away. The second soldier fired twice, saw there was no cover, then ran out of the patio into the street. He and the policeman then began firing through the patio door in a crackling exchange. The bullets from the soldier's Mauser rifle easily penetrated the adobe wall of the bandit's room, making a thump sound. As Butch and Sundance returned fire through the doorway, the first soldier crawled outside and died. It was the first man Butch had ever killed. Now they would be accused not only of robbery, but also of murder. With each passing moment, in fact, the situation for the two outlaws was getting worse and worse. Both were wounded, Butch with a bullet wound in the arm, while Sundance had been hit multiple times. Medical help, of course, was impossible— as the gunfight continued, the mayor began rounding up townspeople to help. The army captain, meanwhile, directed those who had arrived with guns to surround the building in order to prevent the Yankee bandits from digging a hole through the wall and escaping. Wounded, pinned in by gunfire, with their only exit covered, and with armed townspeople now filling the streets, Butch and Sundance must have looked at each other. Without having to say a word, they both knew they were trapped. From Butch and Sundance's ambush site of Waka Wanyuska, we head northwest toward San Vicente. The dirt road winds over rolling hills of yellow clumps of Ichu grass. The whole region, with the snow-capped mountains in the distance, looks for all the world like the foothills of the Rocky Mountains in Colorado or Wyoming. Butch and Sundance must have felt quite at home here. The only difference is that the Altiplano, at an average of 14,000 feet, is too high for cattle. Instead, occasional groups of llamas with red tassels in their ears wander about, lifting their heads to look at us while slowly chewing. Later on, we pass sandstone buttes that look like enormous, tan-colored human skulls, as clouds like giant UFOs drift over the plains and hills, discharging great masses of blue-gray water. We cover what would normally be a day's mule ride from Salo, in only a few dusty hours, rising over the crest of a hill and finding the mining town of San Vicente in a bowl-like valley below, a natural depression that Butch and Sundance rode into, and from which they never returned. From above, the community looks like a typical mining town, with rows of houses with corrugated tin roofs, gray tailings on the hills nearby, and entry to the town monitored by guards at gates. The silver and zinc mine is now run by a Canadian firm, Pan American Silver, based in British Columbia. Outside of town, on a slope, squats an old adobe-walled cemetery. We park next to a small stream that runs through town and get out, then begin walking along a row of miners' houses. 
The houses have small walled patios behind them, lining the dirt street. Within the patios, laundry hangs in bright colors alongside small strips of llama meat hung out to dry. Inscriptions are splayed in faded letters across the walls. Movimiento Revolucionario Nacional. The inscriptions refer to the National Revolutionary Movement, which came to power in the 1950s and began land redistribution for the first time in Bolivia since the arrival of the conquistadors. After the revolution and the nationalization of the mines, the National Mining Company, Comebol, tore down the old village of San Vicente, or most of it, in order to build more efficient workers' quarters with tin roofs. They then built a new adobe village for those they had displaced, a short distance away. I ask a teenage boy wearing tire sandals if any old people still live in the area who might know something about the two bandoleros who died here a hundred years ago. Ask for Froilan Rizzo, he says. He knows everything. Froilan, it turns out, lives in the new village, a knot of adobe homes on dirt streets, separated from the mining town by two soccer fields. It's Sunday, and two games are in progress the miners having formed teams and wearing uniforms. Around the pitches, mostly women and children sit on the ground, eating, swapping stories, and watching the match. Their low voices fill the air, punctuated by the sounds of tennis shoes and sandals hitting the soccer balls with thuds. In San Vicente el Nuevo, we knock on some wooden doors, but no one answers. Everyone seems to be either at the soccer matches or else to have gone to Tupiza for the weekend. I knock on another door, and a thirty-ish miner opens it, a lean man with high cheekbones and a thin white T-shirt. He's lived here only a year, he says, and doesn't know of a Mr. Riso. Finally, we find Mr. Riso's grandson, Vicente, who is thirty years old. Or, actually, he finds us, as he'd heard that we were searching for his grandfather. Vicente has short black hair, a stern face, and a twitch beneath his right eye. He says his grandfather is in Tupiza, but might return later today. Does he know where the balacera, or shootout, occurred? Yes, my grandfather showed me, he says. He stares at us solemnly while his right eye twitches some more. He wants to be paid to show us the location, he finally says. We agree on a figure and fall in behind him. Back in the mining town, we cross a small bridge over the stream, and, next to a small evangelical church, we arrive at an adobe-lined corridor. The passageway runs between the church on the left and a newer building on the right. Midway down the corridor, on the left-hand side, rises a tall, thick wall made from old adobe bricks and with bits of pebbles and straw visible in the baked mud. The grandson stops and puts his hand on it. Butch Cassidy and the Sundance died just inside, he says emphatically, calling the Sundance kid the Sundance. On the other side of the wall? Yes, on the other side. That's where they killed themselves. I climb up onto the wall and look down into the courtyard of an old adobe home. A chicken is walking with halting steps, its head jerking. Laundry hangs from a line. A dog trots out, then lies down, placing its head on its paws, staring at me. The wall, the grandson says, used to be the outer wall of the room in which Butch and Sundance had their final shootout. The house once belonged to the father of his uncle, a man named Casasola, he says. I recognized the name as that of the man who had rented Butch and Sundance a room. A few years ago, Vicente says, his uncle, a very religious man, ripped down the remaining walls and built the evangelical church. I look back down into the patio and can't help but think of Butch and Sundance's final meal. Bullets, beer, and sardines. The next morning, at dawn, after a cold night during which no shots were fired, the army captain ordered the owner of the house, Bonifacio Casasola, to go see whether the two bandits were alive or dead. The captain, who had somehow managed to miss all of the front-line action himself, reason that as Bonifacio was the owner of the house, the bandits wouldn't shoot him. With the town still in shadows, Bonifacio walked slowly into the courtyard, no doubt pondering the captain's logic, then approached the doorway of the bandits' room and peeked inside. As an eyewitness later testified, all of us then entered and found the smaller gringo, likely Butch, 
stretched down on the floor, dead, with one bullet in the temple and another in the arm. The taller one, probably Sundance, was hugging a large ceramic jug that was in the room. He was dead also, with a bullet wound in the forehead. According to some reports, the smaller man had shot his compañero in the forehead, then held the gun against his temple and pulled the trigger. Four days after the shootout, however, the local newspaper in Tupiza reported that the second man had been shot in the chest and had seven other gunshot wounds in different parts of the body. Had Sundance died from his wounds, and had Butch then killed himself? Or had Butch put Sundance out of his misery before putting the gun against his own temple and pulling the trigger? Or, as Judge Felix Charlar later suggested to me, had the police and soldiers first captured and then killed them, and lied about it afterward? Suicide among outlaws was not unheard of. Kid Curry, for example, who had ridden with Butch and Sundance during their glory days, had done just that four years earlier. Chased by a posse, wounded and surrounded in a cornfield in Colorado, Curry had shot himself in the head rather than be caught, sent to prison, or hanged. Had Butch and Sundance done the same? We have lunch, then walk up to the cemetery. The gate is open. Inside we find the burial ground to be a crowded hodgepodge of cement tombs lying alongside graves marked with simple wood or metal crosses. Some of the crosses have small, hand-sized metal sheets fastened to their centers, with details about who is buried below. Metal is a bad choice for posterity, however. Even on newer graves, the metal is already rusted and difficult to read. In the middle of the cemetery rises a thick adobe archway, with an adobe wall on either side, almost cutting the cemetery in two. Passing through the archway, we come to a sign over one cement tomb that boldly states that Esto fue la tumba de Butch Cassidy. This was the grave of Butch Cassidy, placed there by the Pan American Silver Company. The sign, however, is incorrect. In 1994, Vicente's grandfather, Forlan, had directed a Nova documentary crew to dig up this very grave. Forlan had told the crew that his father, who had been a boy of ten when the shootout occurred, had instructed him that this was where the Yankee bandits had been buried. The problem, however, is that the San Vicente graveyard has always been a cementario popular, or public graveyard. Over the years, people have dug graves beside and even on top of old ones. By the time the documentary crew arrived, the graves at San Vicente were a tangled mess— sometimes three layers thick, one grave lying on top of the other. After exhuming a skeleton three levels down that was obviously that of a gringo, the crew eventually discovered that it belonged to an unfortunate German miner who had inadvertently blown himself up with a stick of dynamite. There were no traces of Butch or Sundance. My guide, Enrique, meanwhile, tells me a theory that I've heard from others about Butch and Sundance not being buried in the cemetery, which everyone has assumed. After all, only one eyewitness at the time mentioned a burial, and he said at the inquest that after searching through the bandit's belongings and having recovered the unspent mining payroll, in the afternoon we interred them. He didn't say where. In the old days, people didn't normally bury suicides in cemeteries. Enrique says, because everyone knew that suicidios went to hell. Butch and Sundance, Enrique says, not only apparently killed themselves, but they were also bandits, that is, evil men. No one in town would have wanted bandoleros buried in the same cemetery as their relatives. The two outlaws, Enrique believes, would have been at best been tossed into a shallow grave somewhere outside of town. Como basura, he says, like trash. With a cemetery two and three levels deep, and with Butch and Sundance probably having been buried in a hastily dug grave elsewhere, Enrique says, it's unlikely that anyone will ever find them. Wandering through the graveyard, I look up at the rim of the valley that the two outlaws crested before heading down into town. After nearly twenty years on the run, Butch and Sundance made a series of compounding errors that ultimately cost them their lives. If they'd been more ruthless criminals, then they would have killed the three people they had robbed. No description of two Yankee bandits would then ever have gotten out. 
nor would word of the robbery have traveled so quickly. Had they planned things better, they could have at least taken the payroll team's mules, so that Carlos Perot, his son, and his servant would have had to walk out, again slowing news of the robbery. Similarly, if Butch and Sundance had decided to avoid San Vicente and to camp out in the hills instead, then most likely no one would ever have seen them. Finally, taking a clearly branded, stolen mule into San Vicente was another risk that backfired on them. With word out, a good description of the robbers being two well-armed Yankees, with new telegraph lines linking many of the towns, with a stolen mule, and with the two of them still being in the general area of the robbery two days afterward, all of those slip-ups ultimately cost them their lives. Butch and Sundance met their ends only a day's ride from Uyuni, where they could have taken the train to Chile or north to Oruro or La Paz, and then could have vanished into a faceless crowd. Instead, they more than likely disappeared into a shallow grave in San Vicente, two anonymous bandits whose bodies no one ever claimed and have never been found. In the early evening, Froilan Riso arrives in town from Tupiza. He is seventy-four years old, has creased brown skin, and wears slacks, tire sandals, and a blue baseball cap. Froilan invites me into his home and seats me on a wooden bench next to an adobe wall. He then pulls up a chair and looks at me with direct brown eyes. "'What do you want to know?' he asks, in kind of a sing-song voice that takes every sentence and tilts it up at the end. Froilan then asks bluntly, how much will you pay? I suggest fifty bolivianos. He suggests two hundred. After some negotiating, we agree on two hundred. Clearly, he and his grandson know how to mine Butch and Sundance's story, as others would mine a rich vein of gold. My father was around ten when the shootout occurred, Froilan says. He showed me where it happened and told me about it many times. His father died around 1957 or 1958, he says, and was sixty-three when he died. He then tells me the familiar story of the shootout and the suicides. What happened afterward, I ask? They went inside and found the money and a lot of guns, modern ones, with, oof, a lot of bullets. They only found half the money, less than half. Then they took the bodies out into the patio after going through their things and buried them in the cemetery. What about the grave in the cemetery, the one they dug up? It turned out not to be Butcher Sundance, but a German miner. They didn't want to pay me, he says, referring to the documentary crew. So you show them the wrong grave? Yes. Do you know where Butch and Sundance are buried? Yes. Are they buried inside the cemetery or outside? Inside. But you will have to pay a lot for me to show you where. A few days later, on my final evening into pizza, I have dinner with the judge at a restaurant fittingly called the Alamo. I tell the judge how Froilan had said that his father witnessed the shootout when he was a boy and insisted that the two outlaws were buried in the cemetery. Over a plate of stir-fried lomo saltado, the judge leans forward, winks at me, and says, who knows if what Froilan Riso says is true? The judge then takes a swig of cold beer, sits back, and lifts up an eyebrow. After all, it happened a long time ago. 9. Darwin, the last Yamana, and the uttermost part of the earth. Chile and Argentina. But ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Acts chapter 1 verse 18, King James Version. Whilst beholding these savages, one asks, Whence have they come? What could have tempted, or what change compelled, a tribe of men to leave the fine regions of the north, to travel down the Cordillera or backbone of America, to invent and build canoes, and then to enter on one of the most inhospitable countries within the limits of the globe. Charles Darwin, The Voyage of the Beagle, 1839. 
The true barbarian is he who thinks everything barbarous but his own tastes and prejudices. William Hazlitt, Characteristics, 1837 The old woman lives in a yellow corrugated iron house outside of the naval town, down a rutted dirt road next to a stream. Smoke rises from the fitted chimney pipes and from the cluster of dwellings nearby. This is all that is left of the Yamana Indian community, a small gathering of iron houses outside of Puerto Williams on Navarino Island in Chile. It is the uttermost part of the earth and the southernmost city in the world. The frigid seas of the Beagle Channel suck and pull restlessly nearby, punctuated occasionally by a right or humpback whale that blows a greeting of stale air and frost. The old woman's sister, the second-to-last speaker of a nearly extinct language, died four years earlier, so the old woman now has no one with whom to speak her native language. Over her doorway is a sign that says, Hai Sapakuta Sean Sky Sean Hawa Morocco, which means basically, you are welcome, friend. On a windswept island with thick beech forests and snowy peaks, Christina Calderon, eighty-three years old, is the last Yamana-speaking Indian alive. I knock on the door and hear a shuffling inside. A minute later the door opens. An old woman stands there, short yet thickly built, with shoulder-length black and gray hair and dark eyes. I introduce myself. She looks at me pauses a moment, then says in Spanish, Come in. In the summer of 1831, a black coach pulled by horses rode through the crowded streets of London, the capital of an English maritime empire that literally stretched round the world. Inside the carriage rode a most peculiar quartet. Three natives from Patagonia and a twenty-five-year-old English sea captain named Robert Fitzroy, a year and a half earlier, while employed to map and survey the distant coast of Patagonia, Fitzroy had captured the natives and had brought them to England. A fourth had died of smallpox soon after arriving. The remaining three, a man of about twenty-five, a boy of about fourteen, and a ten-year-old girl, had survived and, for the last year, had been receiving lessons in English language, etiquette, and gardening. Although in Patagonia the natives had gone naked and traveled by foot or in bark canoes, they were now accustomed to wearing nineteenth-century English clothing, the girl in dresses and the men in double-breasted suits, burnished leather shoes, and proper English hats. When introduced, they automatically exclaimed, "'Hello! How do you do?' All three now spoke rudimentary English, and of course their own native language, which no European knew. On this particular day, as the carriage horses clopped their way near the Thames River, the four travelers continued toward St. James's Palace. There they had an appointment with the King and Queen of England for tea. A bit later, inside the sixteenth-century palace, the four were led past ornate drawing-rooms of silk and damask, rare woods and marble, and all the representative wealth of the most powerful empire in the world. In a state drawing-room sat sixty-five-year-old King William IV, and next to him thirty-eight-year-old Queen Adelaide. The Queen had large, sympathetic eyes and a German accent. The King was wigless, had tousled white hair, and wore stockings. Soon after their arrival, attendants presented the three natives, and each said, "'How do you do?' before sitting down. Although the normal diet of the Patagonians was roasted mussels, sea lion meat, and occasional whale blubber, they were now treated to British crumpets, cakes, and miniature sandwiches. According to Captain Fitzroy, who planned to depart for Patagonia with his captives by the end of the year, the two monarchs were extremely curious about their visitors and about the distant land from which they hailed. Wrote Fitzroy, his Majesty asked a great deal about their country, as well as themselves, and I hope I may be permitted to remark that, during an equal space of time, no person ever asked me so many sensible and thoroughly pertinent questions respecting the Fuegians of Tierra del Fuego Island and their country. The Queen had lost two of her own children, and was especially taken with the ten-year-old native girl whom English sailors had nicknamed Fuegia Basket. The girl charmed everyone she met with her impish personality and smiles. 
During their tea, the queen rose from her chair, left the room briefly, then returned with one of her own laced bonnets. This she placed upon the young girl's head. The queen then put one of her rings upon the girl's finger, and gave her a sum of money to buy an outfit of clothes when she should leave England to return to her own country. Their visit over, the four bid the king and queen farewell. Two hundred miles away, the ship that would carry them back to Patagonia lay quietly at anchor in Plymouth Harbor. Her name was Her Majesty's ship, the Beagle. She was ninety feet long, and among her crew was a twenty-two-year-old pug-nosed English naturalist, of whom few outside of his hometown of Shrewsbury had ever heard. Recently graduated from the university, the young man, Charles Robert Darwin, would soon join Captain Fitzroy and the three natives and set sail for Patagonia, the southernmost tip of South America. Robert Fitzroy, the aristocratic son of a British general and an illegitimate great-grandson of Charles II, had gone to sea at thirteen. He was only twenty-three when he received his first commission as captain, yet he'd gained his appointment through a suicide. Four months earlier, during its second year of mapping the rugged Patagonian coast, the HMS Beagle had been commanded by Captain Pringle Stokes. The constant cold and dangerous weather, a natural predisposition toward depression, and the enormous difficulties involved in the task, however, had weighed heavily on him. Cooped up in his cabin, the despondent Stokes withdrew a pistol, placed it against his head, and pulled the trigger. The Beagle was now suddenly without a captain, buffeted by howling winds amid one of the most dangerous seas in the world. Four months later, after successfully making it to Uruguay for supplies, the Beagle returned to Patagonia, this time with Fitzroy at the helm. Aquiline-nosed, delicate-looking, deeply religious, indefatigable, an excellent officer and cartographer, Fitzroy took over the mapping of a coast wherein the last three centuries hundreds of ships had gone down, often with all hands on board. As the age of exploration had gradually morphed into an age of commerce and imperialism, Britain had emerged as the foremost world power. In order to protect its trade routes, Britain needed to control the world's shipping lanes. To do so meant possessing not only a large fleet of ships, but also accurate charts and maps with which to guide them. Fitzroy's mission was thus the same as his ill-fated predecessors, to continue mapping the labyrinthine islands and fjords of Patagonia's coast, one of the most complex and nautically treacherous archipelagos in the world. Only then would British shipping through the area become more secure. Patagonia's seemingly inhospitality, however, had not deterred it from having been populated by various tribes of natives who, although stark naked, were somehow able to navigate the frigid waters with only small bark canoes. First contacted in the 1500s, various tribes by now routinely approached ships or landing parties in order to gain access to the Europeans' abundant trade goods and tools. They did so, however, either by trade or theft. Thus it was that, three months into his mission, early one morning on February 5, 1831, Captain Fitzroy received a rude knock on his cabin door. As he later wrote, At three this morning I was called up to hear that the whaleboat used by a shore party was stolen by natives, and that her coxswain and two men had just reached the ship in a clumsy canoe made like a large basket, of wickerwork covered with pieces of canvas and lined with clay, very leaky and difficult to paddle. My boat was immediately prepared, and I hastened away with a fortnight's provisions for eleven men, intending to go in search of the stolen boat. Seven days later, Fitzroy and his sailors finally cornered some of the natives they believed had been involved in the theft. After creeping through bushes to encircle the natives' camp, the sailors had rushed forward, attempting to seize as many natives as they could. It was no easy task. The oldest woman of the tribe was so powerful, Fitzroy wrote, that two of the strongest men of our party could scarcely pull her out from under the bank of the stream. While children ran screaming into the forest, two men and a woman tried to conceal themselves alongside a stream. 
Cornered by one of Fitzroy's men, they attacked him with stones, trying to beat out his brains. Seeing the sailor's danger, a crew member fired at one of the Fuegans, who staggered back and let him escape, but immediately recovering himself, picked up stones from the bed of the stream, or was supplied with them by those who stood close to him, and threw them from each hand with astonishing force and precision. His first stone struck the master with such force, broke a powder horn hung round his neck, and nearly knocked him backwards, and two others were thrown so truly at the heads of those nearest him that they barely saved themselves by dropping down. All this passed in a few seconds, so quick was he with each hand. But, poor fellow, it was his last struggle. Unfortunately he was mortally wounded, and, throwing one more stone, he fell against the bank and expired. Although most of the natives subsequently escaped, a ten-year-old girl remained behind. Fitzroy's sailors named her Fuegia Basket, after the basket-like boat his men had fashioned during the loss of their whale-boat. In subsequent days Fitzroy captured three more natives, a roughly twenty-five-year-old man he named York Minster, a twenty-year-old man he named Boat Memory, in memory of the stolen boat, which Fitzroy never recovered, and a teenager, about fourteen years old, whom he named Jemmy Button. The boy was so named because, after encouraging him to step out of a canoe full of natives into their longboat, the English sailors had thrown the natives a shiny button in payment. Unable to locate his missing boat, Fitzroy now had to decide what to do with his captives. Slowly an idea began to form in his mind. I became convinced that so long as we were ignorant of the Fuegian language, and the natives were equally ignorant of ours, we should never know much about them, or the interior of their country, nor would there be the slightest chance of their being raised one step above the low place which they then held in our estimation. Their words seemed to be short, but to have many meanings, and their pronunciation was harsh and guttural. I eventually made up my mind to carry the Fuegians to England, trusting that the ultimate benefits arising from their acquaintance with our habits and language would make up for the temporary separation from their own country. I began to think of the various advantages which might result to them and their countrymen, as well as to us, educating them there as far as might be practicable, and then bringing them back to Tierra del Fuego. The four natives were thus now made the subjects of an impromptu social experiment. Could these naked inhabitants, whom Fitzroy and his sailors considered savages, be civilized by removing them to European society for a year or more, then returning them to their country at a future time, with iron, tools, clothes, and knowledge which they might spread among their countrymen? In other words, could native Patagonians make the leap from a hunting and gathering lifestyle, with a supposed pagan belief system, to agriculture and Christianity, all within a few years' time? Three years later, the first part of the experiment had been completed. After Boat Memory had died of smallpox in England, the remaining three natives had spent nearly a year studying English and manners. They then spent another eight months returning with Fitzroy to Patagonia on the second voyage of the HMS Beagle. Superficially, they were radically transformed. All now routinely wore clothes, spoke basic English, and Jemmy Button, especially, loved dressing up in fine suits, waistcoats, and gloves. As the three now peered over the bow in the stormy weather, revisiting their homeland for the first time in three years, the young Charles Darwin stood peering over the bow with them. Twenty-eight years later, in 1859, he would publish On the Origin of Species, a book that would revolutionize man's perception of his place in the natural world. For now, however, as an inexperienced and often seasick naturalist at the beginning of a long journey around the world, Darwin was content to observe and record his observations in his journal, including descriptions of the three Patagonians with whom he'd been living aboard the ship. During the former voyage of the Beagle, Captain Fitzroy seized on a party of natives as hostages for the loss of a boat. Two men, one of whom died in England of the smallpox, a boy and a little girl, were originally taken, 
and we had now on board York Minster, Jemmy Button, whose name expresses his purchase money, and Fuegia Basket. Jemmy Button was a universal favorite, but likewise passionate. The expression of his face at once showed his nice disposition. He was merry and often laughed, and was remarkably sympathetic with anyone in pain. When the water was rough, I was often a little seasick, and he used to come to me and say in a plaintive voice, "'Poor, poor fellow!' But the notion, after his aquatic life on canoes, of a man being seasick was too ludicrous, and he was generally obliged to turn on one side to hide a smile or laugh, and then he would repeat his, "'Poor, poor fellow!' He was of a patriotic disposition, and he liked to praise his own tribe and country. Jemmy was short, thick, and fat, but vain of his personal appearance. He used always to wear gloves, his hair was neatly cut, and he was distressed if his well-polished shoes were dirtied. He was fond of admiring himself in a looking-glass. Fuegia Basket was a nice, modest, reserved young girl, and very quick in learning anything, especially languages. This she showed in picking up some Portuguese and Spanish, when left on shore for only a short time at Rio de Janeiro and Montevideo, and in her knowledge of English. York Minster was very jealous of any attention paid to her, for it was clear he determined to marry her as soon as they were settled on shore. Finally, in January 1833, three years after her last visit, the HMS Beagle anchored in the southwest coast of Patagonia. Captain Fitzroy soon set off in four small boats up the Beagle Channel, intent on returning York Minster, Jemmy Button, and Fuegia Basket to their native land. Darwin accompanied them, and, as he later wrote, "'This channel, which was discovered by Captain Fitzroy during the last voyage, is a most remarkable feature in the geography of this, or indeed of any other country. It may be compared to the valley of Loch Ness in Scotland, with its chain of lakes and firths. It is about one hundred and twenty miles long, with an average breadth, not subject to any very great variation, of about two miles, and is throughout the greater part so perfectly straight that the view, bounded on each side by a line of mountains, gradually becomes indistinct in the long distance. This is the residence of Jemmy Button's tribe and family. Believing at first that all four natives belonged to the same tribe, Fitzroy had gradually come to realize that they were in fact from two different ethnic groups. Upon further questioning of his captives, in fact, Fitzroy had learned that numerous tribes inhabited the southern tip of Patagonia and the island of Tierra del Fuego, each with its own language and customs. York Minster and Fuegia Basket, it turned out, spoke the same language and were from the Alakaluf tribe. Jemmy Button, by contrast, spoke a different language and was from a tribe that called themselves the Yamana. Because foul weather had made it impossible to return York Minster and Fuegia Basket to their native islands further to the east, Fitzroy had decided to return all three of them to Jemmy Button's land. York Minster and Fuegia Basket had assured the captain that they could make their way home by canoe. As Fitzroy and Darwin sailed alongside Navarino Island, in what is now the southernmost part of Chile, they soon began seeing natives along the coast. Wrote Darwin, during the night the news of our arrival had spread, and early in the morning a party of natives arrived, belonging to the Yamana, or Jemmy's tribe. Several of them had run so fast that their noses were bleeding, and their mouths frothed from the rapidity with which they talked, and with their naked bodies all bedaubed with black, white, and red, they looked like so many demoniacs who had been fighting— we then proceeded, accompanied by twelve native canoes, each holding four or five people, down Ponsonby Sound to the spot, Ulaya Bay, where poor Jemmy expected to find his mother and relatives. He had already heard that his father was dead, but as he had had a dream in his head to that effect, he did not seem to care much about it, and repeatedly comforted himself with the very natural reflection, Me no help it. He was not able to learn any particulars regarding his father's death, as his relations would not speak about it. 
During the return voyage from England, Jemmy had indeed confided one day that he'd had a dream, a dream in which a visitor had told him that his father had died. From that moment on, Jemmy had been convinced that his father had passed away in his absence, a fact that he confirmed upon his arrival. What Darwin didn't realize was that among the Yamanas, relatives did not speak about their dead, which was taboo. They did, however, carry out elaborate burial rituals in which they expressed their grief and sadness over their loss. Understanding neither their culture nor their language, Darwin also misread the stylized, low-key greetings between the Yamanas as evidence of a lack of empathy among them. He later wrote, the next morning after our arrival, the Fuegians began to pour in, and Jemmy's mother and brothers arrived. The meeting was less interesting than that between a horse turned out into a field when he joins an old companion. There was no demonstration of affection. They simply stared for a short time at each other, and the mother immediately went to look after her canoe. The family's seeming lack of affection shocked both Darwin and Fitzroy, both of whom assumed that this was more evidence of savagery. Strangely, it never seemed to have occurred to the captain that seizing an adolescent boy and taking him aboard a ship for years to a distant land would not have bothered the boy's family, and of course the family had never been asked for their permission. Darwin soon learned from York Minster, however, that Jemmy's Mother had been inconsolable for the loss, and had searched everywhere for him, thinking that he might have been left somewhere after having been taken in the Englishman's boat. In other words, Jemmy's mother had been as frantic about the disappearance of her son as any mother would have been, but she had been powerless to do anything about it. Fuegia Basket, meanwhile, had literally been seized as a hostage after at least one of the adults she'd been with was shot to death. And while Fitzroy and his crew considered the Yamanas to be thieves, what they didn't understand was that the Yamanas shared their goods among themselves. It was inconceivable that a person would ever hoard wealth and leave his companions poor. To the Yamanas, finding an abandoned boat full of equipment was akin to finding a beached whale. Within a short time the boat's contents had no doubt been divvied up and distributed. A week after their arrival, after helping to build two wigwams, dig gardens, and deposit a large store of European goods for trade, Fitzroy and his men bade farewell to their three native captives, leaving them with a young Anglican missionary named Richard Matthews. The latter had volunteered to accompany the three Patagonians in order to Christianize their countrymen. Although Darwin had his doubts about abandoning a twenty-one-year-old missionary in such a wild region— Fitzroy was determined to establish a beachhead of civilization on Navarino Island. It was his hope that a new community would be established, one consisting of the missionary, the three partially civilized natives, perhaps some of Jemmy Button's family, along with several gardens now planted with turnips, potatoes, onions, and beets. The young missionary was a lay catechist charged by the Anglican Church to sow new congregations around the world— Thus, as Matthews helped to plant the gardens, he was just as determined to plant Christianity, hopefully disseminating English in the process as the new lingua franca of the region. After another week of surveying, however, Fitzroy decided to pay a final visit to the new settlement before the Beagle departed for at least a year. He was shocked to learn that his mission project had quickly fallen into serious anarchy. As Darwin later wrote, from the time of our leaving, a regular system of plunder commenced. Fresh parties of the natives kept arriving. York and Jemmy lost many things, and the missionary Matthews almost everything which had not been concealed underground. Every article seemed to have been torn up and divided by the natives. Matthews described the watch he was obliged always to keep as most harassing— Night and day he was surrounded by the natives, who tried to tire him out by making an incessant noise close to his head. One day an old man, whom Matthews asked to leave his wigwam, immediately returned with a large stone in his hand. Another day a whole party came armed with stones and stakes, and some of the younger men and Jemmy's brother were crying. 
At one point, a group of natives made it clear that they wanted to strip the young missionary of his clothes and pluck all the hairs from his body. They proposed to do so with tweezers made from mussel shells, as if the missionary were some kind of duck or seabird. Most likely, however, this was an attempt to make Matthews appear more like themselves, to make him fit in. Yet Matthews by now had had enough. The natives had trampled the gardens. They'd seized and redistributed most of his supplies. Fearing for his life, and no doubt in complete culture shock, Matthews asked Fitzroy to be taken back on board. After more than a year of preparation and seven days of proselytizing, his career as a missionary in Patagonia was over. Also over, or so it seemed, was Fitzroy's three-year experiment in civilizing the region. Although disappointed, Fitzroy nevertheless still hoped that his motives in taking Jemmy, York Minster, and Fuegia Basket to England would become understood and appreciated among the natives, and that the soil on Navarino Island had indeed been seeded not only with European garden plants, but also with the first roots of civilization. Darwin, however, with nothing invested in the social experiment, and therefore a more circumspect observer, wrote that, It was quite melancholy leaving our Fuegians among their barbarous countrymen. Poor Jemmy looked rather disconsolate, and certainly would have liked to have returned with us. I am afraid whatever other ends their excursions to England produces, it will not be conducive to their happiness. They have far too much sense not to see the vast superiority of civilized over uncivilized habits, and yet I am afraid to the latter they must return. I fear it is more than doubtful whether their visit to England will have been of any use to them. Roughly a year later, on March 5, 1834, Darwin's premonitions were confirmed at the same time as Fitzroy's hopes were dashed. The two had returned to Walaya Bay to search one last time for their three native friends. On shore, Fitzroy later wrote, The wigwams in which I had left York, Jemmy, and Fuegia were found empty, though uninjured. The garden had been trampled over, but some turnips and potatoes of moderate size were pulled up by us and eaten at my table, a proof that they may be grown in that region. Not a living soul was visible anywhere, and an anxious hour or two passed after the ship was moored before three canoes were seen, paddling hastily towards us from the place now called Button Island. Looking through a glass I saw a face which I knew yet could not name. It must be someone I have seen before, said I, and then his sharp eye detected me, and a sudden movement of the hand to his head, as a sailor touches his hat, at once told me it was indeed Jemmy Button. Fitzroy had last seen Jemmy thirteen months earlier, wearing pants, a shirt, and shoes, and industriously working in his garden. Now the captain was shocked to see that, among the two canoe loads of naked savages, all of whom had matted hair and bodies smeared with seal oil and grease, was his favorite protege, Jemmy Button. As Fitzroy later wrote, "'But how altered! I could hardly restrain my feelings, and I was not by any means the only one so touched by his squalid, miserable appearance.' He was naked, like his companions, except a bit of skin around his loins. His hair was long and matted, just like theirs. He was wretchedly thin, and his eyes were affected by smoke. We hurried him below, clothed him immediately, and in half an hour he was sitting with me at dinner in my cabin, using his knife and fork properly, and in every way behaving as correctly as if he had never left us. He spoke as much English as ever, and, to our astonishment, his companions, his wife, his brothers, and their wives, mixed broken English words in their talking with him. I thought he was ill, but he surprised me by saying that he was hearty, sir, never better, that he had not been ill, even for a day, was happy and contented, and had no wish whatever to change his way of life. He said that he got plenty fruits, plenty birdies. Ten guanacos in snow, winter time, and too much fish. Darwin noted as well that, despite his seemingly disheveled appearance, Jemmy told us he had too much, meaning enough, to eat, 
that he was not cold, that his relations were very good people, and that he did not wish to go back to England. I do not now doubt that he will be as happy as, perhaps happier than, if he had never left his own country. Jemmy soon explained that, not long after Fitzroy and Darwin had left the previous year, York Minster had stolen most of Jemmy's things one night, including his clothes, and York and Fuegia Basket had secretly departed in a large canoe for their own islands. Jemmy had watched, day after day, he said, for the peas, beans, and other vegetables to sprout in the garden, but his countrymen had trampled them. The wigwams the Europeans had built, meanwhile, were too tall and thus too cold in winter, so they had abandoned them and made traditional ones. As Fitzroy watched Jemmy finish his meal, smiling and contented, he no doubt couldn't help but think of the enormous effort he'd invested in this experiment, and perhaps also of Boat Memory's death in England of smallpox. Looking no doubt to salvage something, he wrote, I cannot help still hoping that some benefit, however slight, may result from the intercourse of these people, Jemmy, York, and Fuegia, with other natives of Tierra del Fuego. Perhaps a shipwrecked seaman may hereafter receive help and kind treatment from Jemmy Button's children, prompted, as they can hardly fail to be, by the traditions they will have heard of men of other lands, and by an idea, however faint, of their duty to God as well as their neighbor. The next day, as the Beagle prepared to depart from the area, Jemmy returned to shore, but only after leaving behind presents for his English friends. As sailors unfurled the ship's sails, Darwin watched as Jemmy lighted a signal fire and the smoke curled up, bidding us a last and long farewell as the ship stood on her course into the open sea. Darwin and Fitzroy thus departed, never to return, embarking on personal destinies that would include an immortal legacy on the one hand, an ultimate tragedy on the other. While both Fitzroy and Darwin were Anglicans, Fitzroy had gradually become more and more devout during the Beagle's voyage. Darwin, by contrast, unable to reconcile the fossil record he was observing during his travels with the story of creation told in the Bible, little by little began to doubt the book of Genesis, then finally began to doubt the Bible altogether. As he later wrote, Whilst on board the Beagle, I was quite orthodox, and I remember being heartily laughed at by several of the officers, though themselves orthodox, for quoting the Bible as an unanswerable authority on some point. But I had gradually come to see that the Old Testament, from its manifestly false history of the world, from its attributing to God the feelings of a revengeful tyrant, was no more to be trusted than the sacred books of the Hindus or the beliefs of any barbarian. By further reflecting that the clearest evidence would be requisite to make any sane man believe in the miracles by which Christianity is supported, that the more we know of the fixed laws of nature, the more incredible do miracles become— I gradually came to disbelieve in Christianity as a divine revelation. I was very unwilling to give up my belief, but I found it more and more difficult, with free scope given to my imagination, to invent evidence which would suffice to convince me. Thus disbelief crept over me at a very slow rate, but was at last complete." Darwin's dining companion, Captain Fitzroy, meanwhile, remained steadfast in his belief that the Bible could be read not only as a religious text, but also as literal history. Patagonians such as Jemmy and the Yamanas, Fitzroy believed, must have thus originally migrated from the Middle East, as they were undoubtedly the children of Adam and Eve. The reason their skins were darker than those of Englishmen, Fitzroy reasoned, was because, like black Africans, Patagonians must be the sons of Cain, who killed his brother Abel. The two groups' darker skins were the result of the stain left by the sins of their infamous ancestor. Little by little, as the Patagonians' ancestors had migrated away from the Holy Land, certain groups must have lost their knowledge of whence they came, of writing and agriculture and coins and clothing, until, by the time they arrived at the bottom of South America, they had become, Fitzroy said, savages in the fullest sense of the word, from which degraded condition they would not rise a step by their own exertions. 
Fitzroy published his theory of the origin of Patagonians in 1839 as a chapter in the book Narrative of the Surveying Voyages of His Majesty's Ships Adventure and Beagle. Darwin, by contrast, published the results of his own thinking twenty years later in On the Origin of Species. Darwin's book, of course, was a completely radical reworking of Genesis, that man had not been created by God in God's image, but rather had evolved from other animals. After receiving a copy of the book Darwin had sent him, Fitzroy penned a reply. My dear old friend, I, at least, cannot find anything ennobling in the thought of being a descendant of even the most ancient ape. Reading Darwin's book had clearly shaken the now-retired sea captain to his very core. Oxford University, Saturday, June 30th, 1860. Nearly one thousand people, students, professors, scientists, and journalists, have filed into the Museum of Natural History, ostensibly to listen to a paper about the sexuality of plants. The real lure, however, is the promise of a debate afterward about Charles Darwin's recently published theory of evolution, and its obvious contradiction of certain passages in the Bible. It is also well known that, amid the audience of well-dressed Victorians in hats, boots, and cravats, Bishop Samuel Wilberforce, famed orator, Lord Bishop of Oxford, and member of the House of Lords, is in attendance and is going to speak afterward. Wilberforce had been involved in the recent construction of Oxford Natural History Museum for the study of, as he dubbed it, the wonders of God's creations. None doubted that he would vehemently denounce Darwin's radical new theory. Darwin had already sent word that he was ill and therefore would not be in attendance. Instead, some of his most ardent supporters assembled, such as the famed zoologist Thomas Henry Huxley, who had already written several positive reviews of Darwin's book, and Joseph Dalton Hooker, the well-known botanist and Darwin's best friend. Also in attendance, seated in the center of the audience and clutching a large Bible, is 54-year-old Robert Fitzroy. The former sea captain has made it known that he is now mortified that he, of all people, had selected the young naturalist to accompany him on the voyage of the Beagle. It is doubly mortifying that he had thus inadvertently helped give rise to Darwin's blasphemous theory. This, it is obvious to those who know him, causes him the acutest pain. After an hour and a half of desultory lecture on plants that one observer later summed up as flatulent, the audience finally senses that the showdown it has been waiting for is about to begin. Bishop Wilberforce, wearing the flowing robes of his office and with a cross hanging round his neck, takes the stage. Slowly and dramatically, breathing life into the vast, stuffy room, the bishop predictably begins to denounce Darwin's crackpot theory, a theory, as the Oxford Journal will later record, that was founded not on philosophical principles, but upon fancy. And he, Wilberforce, denied that one instance had been produced by Mr. Darwin on the alleged change from one species to another had ever taken place, and concluded, amid much cheering, by denouncing it as degrading to man, and as a theory founded upon fancy, instead of upon facts. Turning toward the zoologist Thomas Huxley, Bishop Wilberforce, whose very profession is to serve as an intermediary between God and man, caps his speech off with both a taunt and an insult. He begged to know, wrote the reporter from the journal, was it through his, Huxley's, grandfather or his grandmother that he claimed his descent from a monkey? Thirty-five-year-old Huxley is said to have leaned over to a friend at this moment and to have whispered, the Lord hath delivered him into my hands. Dark-haired, with long sideburns, brilliant and largely self-taught, Huxley now takes the stage. As he later wrote, When I got up, I spoke pretty much to the effect that I had listened with great attention to the Lord Bishop's speech, but had been unable to discover either a new fact or a new argument in it except indeed the question raised as to my personal predilections on the matter of ancestry, that it would not have occurred to me to bring forward such a topic as that for discussion myself, but that I was quite ready to meet the right Reverend Wilberforce even on that ground. If then, said I, 
The question is put to me, would I rather have a miserable ape for a grandfather, or a man highly endowed by nature and possessed of great means of influence, and yet who employs those faculties and that influence for the mere purpose of introducing ridicule into a grave scientific discussion, I unhesitatingly affirm my preference for the ape. In the crowded room, one lady faints upon hearing Huxley's rebuttal and has to be carried outside. The crowd now erupts in shouts, laughter, and a general uproar. In the midst of the melee, a gray-haired man in a rear admiral's uniform stands up, holding a large Bible high over his head, and tries to make himself heard. It's Robert Fitzroy, now head of a meteorological department in London, and aged well beyond his years. Darwin's book is an abomination, the former sea captain shouts. Darwin's ideas contradict Genesis, wrote one observer. Lifting an immense Bible first with both and afterwards with one hand over his head, he solemnly implored the audience to believe God rather than man. Few hear the former captain, however, amid the great tumult. A despondent Fitzroy leaves quietly afterward. Five years later, at the age of fifty-nine, Fitzroy becomes increasingly more susceptible to depression. One morning, the former sea captain walks into his bathroom and slits his throat open from ear to ear. The second captain of the HMS Beagle to commit suicide. I arrive in Ushuaia in April, the beginning of fall in Patagonia. Ushuaia sits on the Argentine side of the Beagle Channel, on the southernmost rim of Tierra del Fuego Island. It's a port town, nestled on a U-shaped bay at the base of snow-covered mountains. The mountains themselves are the southernmost extension of the Andes, a tapering spine of broken gray granite looking as stark and ragged as shark's teeth projecting from a lower jawbone. Ushuaia is a Yamana word that means inner harbor to the westward. It's an assortment of A-framed houses and buildings with roofs of iron and zinc and resembles a ski resort. I walk down its main street, Avenida San Martin, crowded with glass-fronted restaurants. Many display racks of lamb roasting over a fire. Pedestrians trundle past, bundled up in jackets, some headed down to the port where ships leave for Antarctica. I stop by a bakery and buy a warm churro stuffed with sweet manjar blanco, then pass by a fish market, the Pesquera del Beagle, Beagle Fish Market. On its front window is painted a large southern red king crab, a five-foot-long monstrosity that looks as close to an alien life-form as anything on the planet. King crabs scuttle about in the dark at depths of up to two thousand feet. Above the town rises a thick forest of beech and evergreen trees that stretches up the flanks of the mountains. Now that it's fall, the trees are a tangle of rust, mustard, and pastel yellow colors, some are so permanently bent over by the northerly winds that sailors once fashioned the trunks into curved braces for their boats. Beyond the tree line rises an expanse of naked black rock, then white ice and snow. Because Ushuaia is so far south, snow line here begins at a mere 1,500 feet. The streets of the city climb steeply from the water line to the hills, like a Patagonian San Francisco. Here and there the corners are adorned with street signs that bear names such as Roberto Fitzroy, Carlos Darwin, and even Fueguia Basket. In mid-January 1833, Darwin, Fitzroy, Jemmy Button, York Minster, and Fueguia Basket sailed past this uninhabited bay in a flotilla of four small boats on their way to Navarino Island on the other side of the Beagle Channel. It was the last leg of their journey from England to return Jemmy and his companions to their native land, wrote Darwin. As we proceeded along the Beagle Channel, the scenery assumed a peculiar and very magnificent character. The mountains were here, along Ushuaia Bay, about three thousand feet high, and terminated in sharp and jagged points. They rose in one unbroken sweep from the water's edge, and were covered to the height of fourteen or fifteen hundred feet by the dusky-colored forest. Jemmy's tribe, the Yamana, inhabited both sides of the Beagle Channel, crossing the open expanse with their families in bark canoes and living in numerous temporary encampments along its shores. Not surprisingly, after Fitzroy and Darwin's final departure in 1834, 
news about the three natives who had once visited England became scarce. For roughly the next five decades, however, Jemmy or Fuegia Basket would occasionally be spotted by foreign sailors, who were no doubt surprised to see a bark canoe approach their ship from some inhospitable shore and a naked savage with long matted hair shout out a greeting in English. Wrote one English sailor, who visited Wulaya Bay in 1855 and encountered Jemmy Button more than twenty years after Fitzroy had departed, "'Well, I'm blowed. What a queer thing. This beats me out and out. There's that blear-eyed, dirty-looking, naked savage speaking as clearly to the skipper as one of us. And I'd be hanged, too, if he isn't as polite as if he'd been brought up in a parlour, instead of born in this outlandish place.' Well, it is queer, and so is all the whole affair. Lots of wild barbarians civil to us, and now one of them talking as plain as ourselves. It knocks me down quite. Fourteen years later, in 1869, London's South American Missionary Society established an Anglican mission on Ushuaia Bay, consisting of a single metal house, twenty by ten feet, surrounded by a number of native Yamana huts, Two years later, a young English missionary, Thomas Bridges, arrived to take over as its head. Bridges was twenty-nine years old, stood five foot eight, had black curly hair, dark eyes, and a high forehead. Arriving with him was his English wife of two years, Mary. The Bridgeses soon had a son, Lucas, the first non-native to be born in Ushuaia. Many years later, Lucas wrote about what it must have been like when his parents first arrived. As they were rowed ashore, this Ushuaia, of which she, Bridges' wife Mary, had heard so much, was new, strange, and rather frightening. Behind the pebbled beach the grassland stretched away to meet the sudden steep hill less than a quarter of a mile from the shore. Between shore and hill were scattered wigwams, half-buried hovels made of branches, roofed with turf and grass, smelling strongly of smoke and decomposed whale-blubber or refuse flung close outside. Round the wigwams, dark figures, some partially draped in otter-skins, others almost naked, stood or squatted, gazing curiously at the little boat as it approached the beach. Some canoes lay hauled up on the shore, and in others women were fishing or paddling alongside the schooner, trying to barter fish or limpets for knives or those great delicacies introduced by the foreigners, biscuits and sugar. These people were wanderers, attracted by the wish to see what the white men were doing in Ushuaia. Thomas Bridges, who had been abandoned as a baby and left in a basket on a bridge in Bristol, England, hence his last name, was adopted by missionaries. His adoptive parents later moved to the Falklands, a cluster of islands that lies about three hundred miles off the coast of southern Argentina. By the late 1850s, missionaries from the Falklands had begun to transport small numbers of Yamana Indians from Patagonia to the Falkland Mission on Keppel Island in an effort to learn their language and to Christianize them. Growing up amid the visiting Yamanas and their children, Bridges eventually became the first non-native to become fluent in their language. It was also on Keppel Island that Bridges began to write down Yamana words and expressions, a lifelong interest that eventually resulted in the only Yamana dictionary ever created. Gradually, as he learned their language, Bridges began to realize that many famous explorers, including Darwin, who believed the short, powerful natives had previously been cannibals, had gotten the Yamanas completely wrong. As his son Lucas later wrote in his classic book, The Uttermost Part of the Earth, the belief that the Fuegians were cannibals was not the only mistake Charles Darwin made about them. Listening to their speech, Darwin got the impression that they were repeating the same phrases over and over again, and therefore came to the conclusion that something like one hundred words would cover the whole language. We who learned as children to speak Yamana know that, within its own limitations, it is infinitely richer and more expressive than English or Spanish. My father's dictionary contains no fewer than thirty-two thousand Yamana words and inflections, the number of which might have been greatly increased without departing from correct speech. The Yamana language, for example, has five different words for snow, while English has only one. English also has about seventeen different words for family relationships, while Yamana has about fifty, and so on. 
The more he got to know them, the more Bridges also grew to respect the Yamana's ability to flourish in an area where Europeans, convinced of their own superiority, had previously been unable to survive. Just twenty years earlier, for example, a group of Anglican missionaries had attempted to found a mission on Picton Island in the Beagle Channel. The seven men, unable to speak the local language and with no experience whatsoever hunting or fishing in Patagonia, slowly starved to death. Next to the body of the reverend leading the group, fragments of a letter were found that he'd written, while delirious, about the death of one of their members. The Lord has seen fit to call home another of our little company. Our dear departed brother left the beached boat on Tuesday afternoon, and has not since returned. Doubtless he is in the presence of his Redeemer, whom he served faithfully. Days without food. Heaven. Elsewhere, the same drama had been repeated throughout the centuries, beginning with a Spanish attempt to colonize the area in 1583. In that year, twenty-four ships had set out for Patagonia from Spain. Eight subsequently sank in fierce storms, and all but four of the remainder soon abandoned the expedition. The surviving ships entered the Magellan Strait and unloaded three hundred Spanish colonists in a bay on the strait's northern shore. All eventually died from starvation, and, fittingly, the area was later christened Port Famine. By the time Thomas Bridges arrived in Ushuaia, European explorers had studded the rugged topography of Patagonia with names that described their frequent life-and-death struggles with the elements. Port Famine, Desolation Island, Fury Harbor, Useless Bay, Mount Misery, and so on. The Yamanas and their ancestors, by contrast, had lived successfully amid the islands and channels of Patagonia for at least the last six thousand years. As did many other indigenous groups, they used names that described the ecology of the land, which mirrored their understanding of it. There was, for example, Tushkapalan, or the kelp island of the flying loggerhead duck, Lapayusha, the coast of conch shells, Alakushwaya, the bay of the flapping loggerhead duck, Tuwulumbiwaya, Black Heron Harbor, and so on. The food they subsisted upon, seals, cormorants, penguins, fish, birds, eggs, mussels, and other shellfish, were abundant if you knew where and when to look for them. Wulaya Bay, the heart of Yamana territory on Navarino Island, where Darwin and Fitzroy had returned Jemmy Button, is by most accounts a biological wonderland. The sheltered bay's shallow waters possess innumerable ecological niches that are filled with a vast smorgasbord of food for anyone skilled at harvesting it. As Jemmy Button explained to a shocked Fitzroy on their last meeting, he was, "'Hearty, sir, never better,' and had, "'Plenty fruits, plenty birdies, ten, roughly two hundred pound, guanacos in snow, winter, time, and too much fish.' Indeed, Bridges gradually learned that the Yamanas knew not only how to fish, but also how to harpoon seals and sea lions, dive for mussels and shellfish, build canoes, construct shelters, skillfully navigate Patagonia's unpredictable seas, conduct important rituals, recount myths, marry, raise children, and have fun. Charles Darwin, who knew nothing about anthropology and regarded the Yamanas as savages, nevertheless recognized that Jemmy— did not wish to go back to England. Yet despite his repugnance to matted hair and seal oil, Darwin was nevertheless able to understand the essential core of the issue, that is, whether or not a savage, in his natural environment, was content. I do not now doubt, Darwin later wrote, that Jemmy will be as happy as, perhaps happier than if he had never left his own country. The Achilles' heel of the Yamanas, it turned out, was not the inhospitable nature of Patagonia, but rather two riches they possessed that were soon coveted by foreigners. The first was the newly discovered shipping lane connecting Europe with Asia, which the Yamana unfortunately lived alongside. The second was the abundant marine life, the penguins, whales, sea lions, and other marine animals that thrived in their waters— Europeans and Americans, for example, both coveted whales, especially sperm whales, for their oil and blubber, in addition to seals for their pelts. 
In fact, Captain Fitzroy himself had marveled at the sheer abundance of its wildlife during his first voyage to Patagonia in 1828 to 1830. In the tideway at the narrow passage, the sea teemed with fish, over which hovered cormorants and other sea fowl, preying upon the small fry that were trying to elude their voracious enemies, the porpoises and seals, thousands of which were seen sporting about as we proceeded on our way. Whales were also numerous in the vicinity, probably because of an abundance of the small red shrimp, krill, which constitutes their principal food. Fitzroy, to his credit, clearly understood a food chain when he saw one. The coastal areas of southern Patagonia actually contain some of the richest upwellings of nutrient-rich waters in the world. Entire food chains as intricate as rainforests flourish here, beginning with microscopic plankton and ending with squid, toothfish, seals, albatross, whales, and, in the area of the Beagle Channel for thousands of years, harpoon-wielding Yamana natives. The ocean might be cold, frigid even, but it was filled with wildlife that could be hunted. Eleven years after the Beagle's final visit, a twenty-two-year-old sailor and future novelist named Herman Melville rounded Cape Horn and sailed through Yamana territory in 1844. Melville's ship was part of a veritable armada of American and European whaling and sealing ships. In Melville's most famous novel, Moby Dick, his character Ishmael explains why he sought whales in such distant parts of the world. Chief among these motives was the overwhelming idea of the great whale himself— such a portentous and mysterious monster roused all my curiosity. These, with all the attending marvels of a thousand Patagonian sights and sounds, helped to sway me to my wish. With other men, perhaps, such things would not have been inducements. But as for me, I am tormented with an everlasting itch for things remote. I love to sail forbidden seas and land on barbarous coasts, although it is but well to be on friendly terms with all the inmates of the place one lodges in. Just a few years before Melville's visit, the crew of another American whaling ship, perhaps wishing to be on friendly terms with the local inmates, was surprised when a naked woman in a bark canoe approached them, hailing them in English. It was Fuegia Basket, a dozen years after her return from England, the only woman in Patagonia who spoke English, According to members of the crew, Fuegia called out, "'How do? I have been to Plymouth and London!' Later she conversed in English with the captain and stayed a few days. Then, just as abruptly, she climbed back into her canoe and soon disappeared amid rugged headlands that were bordered by the sea. In Ushuaia I walk along a peninsula that stretches out into the bay, forming one shore of the harbor. The wind-swept peninsula is covered in tall yellow grass and affords wonderful views of the Beagle Channel. In the distance, Navarino Island looms up, a smudge of green with white mountains. To the east lies the city, spread out along the harbor's northern shore. I wander about the peninsula, my jacket zipped tight due to a biting cold wind, searching for the site of the original Anglican mission and Thomas Bridges' home. Ushuaia no longer has an Anglican church, but has a Catholic one, Nuestra Señora de la Merced, Our Lady of Mercy. The Anglican mission shut its doors in 1910. I walk by a cluster of old naval buildings with peeling white paint and several large rusted anchors lying abandoned in front, then climb over a metal fence. Along the top of the bluff I finally find a white triangular monument, about five feet high, marking the site of Bridges's home. The monument is studded with a variety of small bronze plaques, and one of them, fastened here in 1998, says, En memoria de los misioneros anglicanos que murieron hace cien años. Thomas Bridges, July 15, 1898. In memory of the Anglican missionaries who died one hundred years ago. The tiny plaque is the only reminder of the original English settlement in Ushuaia. The English, after all, are not popular here, a much larger monument stands beside the quay that reads Las Malvinas son nuestras, meaning the Falklands are ours, placed there after the Falklands War, and using the Spanish name for the islands, Las Malvinas. 
The Bridgeses lived on this peninsula for a dozen years, gradually teaching an increasingly sedentary group of Yamanas the arts of European agriculture and how to raise sheep and cows. In a sense, they were reproducing European subsistence patterns along a narrow stretch of wild Patagonian coast. In 1882, ten years after the Bridgeses arrived, a French physician, Paul Iad, visited the mission. The doctor was part of a French scientific expedition, staying on nearby Oste Island, and was curious about the mission's inhabitants. He later wrote that, An impression of melancholy imposes itself when one first sees the few English houses, all of the material brought from Europe, installed in this somber surrounding, as if lost at the end of the world. This impression lingers when one disembarks and becomes aware of the natives, dressed as they are, possessing relatively comfortable huts, and some even owners of well-kept gardens. But none seems any happier than the Fuegans we just left on Oste Island, naked in their canoes, going as they well please, in search of their daily sustenance. Eventually, anthropologists discovered that going naked was a useful strategy for the Yamanas, since rain and water spray were constant, the Yamanas wore no clothes because clothes quickly became wet and were practically impossible to dry. Instead, the Yamanas covered themselves with seal or whale oil, which served as a protective barrier, and never went anywhere without taking fire with them. While it was the woman's job to dive for mussels and shellfish in the frigid waters, Yamana men tended the fire, made the canoes, and hunted seals and other animals— when the Yamanas got wet, they dried themselves next to the nearest fire. Europeans, who got caught in wet clothing in Patagonia, by contrast, often died of pneumonia or hypothermia. When missionaries began to insist that the natives wear clothes, scores of Yamanas soon died as a result. The missionaries learned too late that even the Yamanas' long matted hair, which the missionaries encouraged them to cut off, was useful. It served as insulation against the frigid weather— to make matters worse, the Yamanas who frequented the mission and hence tried to adapt to soggy clothing, short hair, and a more sedentary lifestyle also caught European-introduced diseases. As the French doctor Iad later wrote, More than one of those Yamanas who passed one or two years in Ushuaia and through work and good behavior acquired a little house and a cultivated plot of land suddenly, without regret, left all their possessions to resume their life in the canoe— these savages are aware that those who settle in Ushuaia rapidly lose their habit of supplying their own needs by means of the traditional industries. Their sons no longer know how to make canoes, nor harpoons to hunt, sea otters, or seals, and they find themselves dependent on the good graces of the English for their food. They also flee from Ushuaia because the sickness there is more fatal than elsewhere, be it consumption or other imported diseases." Adding to the gradual loss of their culture and their exposure to imported diseases loomed something equally dangerous, the loss of their native foods. The destruction of the seal and sea lion rookeries was the beginning of the end for the Yamanas and other coastal sea nomads, says Ernesto Piana, a wiry, gray-haired archaeologist who has worked in the Ushuaia area for the last thirty years. Piana, a chain-smoking Argentine, is passionate about the Patagonian archipelago and its wild, wind-swept seas. He works for CADIC, Centro Astral de Investigaciones Científicas, a scientific investigation center housed in a group of buildings that resembles an ochre-colored naval ship run aground. The center lies just to the west of where the bridges once had their mission. The Amana's ancestors, Piana tells me, arrived some six thousand years ago, after the retreat of the last glaciers. Before that, the Beagle Channel and the Strait of Magellan had been filled with ice. Only when the earth warmed did the channels fill with water, and Tierra del Fuego become an island. For the next six thousand years, Piana says, the Yamanas and their ancestors had a pretty smooth time of it, until the arrival of the first Europeans. The Europeans sailed down in their ships and began slaughtering animals in their rookeries, Piana says. The Yamanas never did that. The Europeans not only wiped out the local population of whales, but they also wiped out penguins, seals, and sea lions. The Yamanas inhabited these islands and coasts for thousands of years, he continues, tipping some cigarette ash into a small glass container. There are thousands of middens along the coast, thousands. 
Middens, Piana explains, are the mounds of discarded mussel and other shells that pile up after years of harvesting and eating shellfish. Heated in a fire, bivalves relax their muscles, the shells open, and their hot contents can be quickly devoured. The Yamana then threw the shells onto a pile outside their huts. Ondagumakona is a Yamana word that means to pick mussels off clusters, one by one, from a canoe. Piana takes a pull on his cigarette and fixes me with intense dark eyes. His ancestors were Italian. The Yamana's food supplies collapsed, he says. They began to starve to death. By the time the missionaries began to gather them together in the late nineteenth century, they were already weakened. Then the epidemics arrived. Jemmy Button, it so happened, was one of the first to go. Inoculated against smallpox in England in 1833, Jemmy was last seen in Wulaya Bay in 1863 by a group of visiting Anglican missionaries. A few months after they left, an epidemic hit Navarino Island. Scores of Yamanas died, including Jemmy, who was in his mid-fifties at the time. A missionary who met Jemmy's wife soon afterward wrote that, Her face was visibly impressed with sorrow, and, pointing with her finger towards the sky, she gave me to understand by looks, more than words, the cause of her grief, and how great it was. Jemmy's family cremated his body, as was customary, on a funeral pyre. So ended the life of the man who, as a fourteen-year-old boy, had been whisked away from his canoe by foreigners, taken to England, and presented to the king and queen, only to be felled later in life by one of the foreigner's many diseases. The epidemics, brought to the area no doubt by the fur sealers and whalers, soon became common. Tuberculosis hit the Ushuaia mission in 1882, killing dozens of natives, none of whom had resistance to the bacterial disease. Two years later, a measles epidemic struck Ushuaia and the surrounding area with devastating effect. Lucas Bridges, Thomas Bridges's son, remembered that, The natives were dying at such a rate that it was impossible to dig graves fast enough. In outlying districts, the dead were merely put outside the wigwams, or carried or dragged to the nearest bushes. Sickness then struck Navarino Island again, the natives' impermanent huts quickly filling with the dead. A look at the census records for the Yamanas in the area shows a traditional population pyramid turned completely upside down. 1833, 3,000 Yamanas. 1908, 170 Yamanas. 1947, 43 Yamanas. 2014, 1 Yamana. The inverse was true for Ushuaia's non-native population. 1871, 3 English inhabitants. Thomas Bridges, his wife, and their daughter. 1914, 1,558 inhabitants. 1947, 2,182 inhabitants. 2014, 65,000 inhabitants. The Bridgeses did what they could to try to stave off the rapid decline of the Yamanas, but, having no control over the epidemics, there was little they could do. Bridges, however, did begin to wonder whether he should remove his family, and some of the Yamanas, to a more isolated area, beyond the reach of the sealers, whalers, and Argentine settlers. Eventually, he began to fixate on an untouched area beside a small bay, about sixty miles east of Ushuaia. He would later call it Harberton. It's a two-hour drive to the Estancia, or ranch, of Harberton, which lies along the rich blue waters of the Beagle Channel, on the southern edge of Tierra del Fuego. The dirt road wends its way around low, snow-covered mountains, through groves of birch and coihue trees, around small streams that have been dammed by imported Canadian beavers, and over small wooden bridges. A-framed houses appear now and then, tucked away amid the trees, isolated and alone, Gradually, the homes become fewer and fewer until they disappear altogether. During winter, the road is clotted with snow. Only if you have snowshoes or a four-wheel drive can you get through. It's mid-morning when I reach the edge of the ranch, a cluster of old red-roofed white buildings set amid rolling hills of knee-high grass and scattered forest alongside a bay on the Beagle Channel. The ranch is called Harberton, after the town in England where Mary Bridges was born. In 1884, as epidemics raked Ushuaia and the Argentine Navy arrived to formally install a sub-prefecture there, thus finally taking possession of the area, 
Bridges clearly saw the writing on the wall. Lowering the British flag over the mission and running up the Argentine flag, Bridges soon petitioned the Argentine government for land on which to establish a sheep farm. Argentina had just spent the previous five decades successfully clearing the Pampas of the Tehuelche Indians, who lived further north amid the vast Pampas and who hunted guanacos. Evidently, the government was feeling magnanimous as it eventually ceded Bridges 50,000 acres. A few years later, the now 44-year-old reverend resigned from the mission, then left with his family and a large group of Yamanas, launching himself into the sheep-raising business. Although Bridges was the first to do so, other settlers soon began carving up the island of Tierra del Fuego, about the size of Ireland, into sheep ranches. This, despite the fact that much of the island was already inhabited by the Selknam, also known as the Ona Indians, who lived by hunting guanacos. While Bridges made a point of finding work for the natives, most of his fellow ranchers did everything they could to rid the island of its original inhabitants, some of whom had turned to hunting sheep as the guanacos disappeared. A few settlers had even begun hiring hunting parties to massacre native families en masse in their camps. Those few who survived were forcibly taken to a Salesian mission on Dawson Island in the Magellan Strait. There, the formerly independent natives were soon relegated to a sedentary lifestyle of gardening, sewing, woodworking, and prayer. Here, too, however, in this last artificially concentrated population, epidemics soon arrived. An Italian priest named Father Fagnano, who gradually witnessed the natives' dwindling numbers, actually wept during his last visit to the Dawson Mission in 1902. He had been unable to ignore the fact that the number of crosses in the Mission Cemetery was now larger than the remaining population. Another Salesian wrote, in a way summing up the entire missionary effort in Patagonia, that, "...sometimes an action that requires so much missionary sacrifice does not guarantee success." Of the 1,000 Indians who entered the Dawson Mission between 1889 and 1898, only 25 were left by the time the mission closed in 1911. All the rest had died. Lucas Bridges, who spoke both Yamana and Ona, later described a visit to the Dawson Mission at its height in the late 1890s. I was on a little steamer which touched at Dawson Island, where, it was said, about seven hundred Ona were confined. The women were employed making blankets and knitting garments under the training of the Salesian sisters, and a number of men were working in a sawmill, cutting timber, largely for shipment to Punta Arenas. When I went into the sawmill and made a remark to these fellows in their own language, they crowded around me. These Indian workers were decently clad— in discarded or shop-soiled garments, generally some sizes too small for them. Looking at them, I could not help picturing them, standing in their old haunts, proud and painted, armed with bows and arrows, and dressed, as of yore, in guchil, uil, and yamni, headdress, robe, and moccasins. Some of them knew me by sight, and many others by report. I am afraid that the work came to a standstill, and the lay brothers showed some annoyance at the interruption, so I retired. Later, however, when they broke off work, I was able to have a talk with Eclio, a native Bridges knew. He seemed to have nothing whatever to complain of with regard to his treatment, but was terribly sad at his captivity. Looking with yearning towards the distant mountains of his native land, he said, Chuet Matnya, longing is killing me which was actually the case, for he did not survive very long. Liberty is dear to white men. To untamed wanderers of the wilds, it is an absolute necessity. Lucas's father, Thomas Bridges, died in 1898 of stomach cancer at the age of 56. His mother, Mary, remained a few years at Harperton and then returned to England, where she passed away some two decades later. The couple's three sons, Despard, Lucas, and Will, eventually married and continued to run the Harberton sheep farm, which gradually grew and prospered. Today the ranch is still there, run now by Thomas Bridges's great-great-nephew, Thomas Goodall, and his American-born wife, Natalie. The Estancia no longer operates as a sheep farm, but as a tourist attraction. It now caters to tourists who want to visit the oldest ranch in Tierra del Fuego. 
the main house, built in Devon, England, then disassembled, shipped, and reassembled here more than a century ago, has a tea room with large glass windows that look out onto the bay. Visitors here can order scones, coffee, tea, and jam. On the hillsides sprout beech trees dripping with pale green lichen. Some of their branches are marbled with an edible orange fungus that Charles Darwin discovered and is now named Cetaria darwinii. Ancient middens of crumbling mussel shells also abound. I stroll about the grounds and find a midden near the Bridges family cemetery. The mound is knee-high, about six feet across, and composed of ink-colored mussel shells. I lift some up. They are soft with age and crumble between my fingers. Years ago, a hundred, a thousand, a native woman once dove into the sea, wrestled these mussels off the ocean floor, then swam back to her canoe, depositing them inside. Some of the middens have native skeletons buried within, a few small children in one, an adult woman in another. The mounds are now the only visible signs that indigenous people once lived here. Inside the main house, Thomas Goodall stands behind a counter in the wooden tea room. He's in his mid-seventies, wears blue overalls, has yellow, peg-like teeth, speaks Spanish with an unusual accent that includes English-pronounced R's, and tells me bluntly that he does not do interviews. His wife Natalie, on the other hand, is seventy-five and amiable. She's a scientist and admits that her husband can be abrupt. He was like that when I first visited here, on a lark, in 1962, she tells me. Natalie is from Ohio, went to Kent State University, has a master's degree in biology, and taught school. She has blue eyes and curly gray hair, and is presently laid up in bed after a knee operation. Her bedroom is stocked with wood furniture, photos of families and friends, and piles of paper that she's working on, mainly a variety of science reports. When she was young and landlocked, Natalie dreamed of escaping the Midwest and finding adventure. By chance, she read Lucas Bridges's account of life at the southern extreme of Tierra del Fuego. It was while reading those pages that she knew she had to visit Ushuaia and the Bridges's estancia at Harberton. There was no road out here to Harberton then, she says. No visitors. I arrived in Ushuaia on a DC-3 plane— Shortly after I got there, I requested to visit Harberton by radio. Tom was managing the ranch and refused, she says, laughing. He didn't want to have anything to do with me. Natalie was persistent, however, and eventually found her way out to the ranch, staying for three weeks. Tom wasn't very friendly, she says, but his mother was. That was in December of 1962. Somehow, during those three weeks, something clicked, and Tom thought out a bit. He later visited Natalie in Ohio. A month later, the two were married. Natalie has been living in Tierra del Fuego, the tip of Patagonia, ever since. I first began studying the flora, she says. At the same time, I started noticing bones and skulls washed up on the coast, so I began collecting them. Dolphin skulls, whale skulls, things like that. In 1973, scientists from a U.S. expedition to the Antarctic, whose mission was to study whales and dolphins, paid a visit to Harberton. "'Would you like to see some skulls?' Natalie asked them. They nodded, she said. "'But you could tell they were bored.' Fifteen minutes later, the scientists were slapping each other on the back. Among Natalie's collection, it turned out, they discovered extremely rare skulls of the spectacled porpoise— a dolphin that looks like a tiny version of a killer whale. Until then, only eight specimens existed in the world. Natalie had found thirty-five. "'If you want more, I'll go find some,' she nonchalantly said. And she did. Soon Natalie was receiving funds from the National Science Foundation, and later from the National Geographic Society, whose magazine profiled her in 1971. Natalie now runs the Southernmost Marine Bird and Mammal Museum, Akatushun, based at Harberton. The museum and research center is full of the reassembled skeletons of spectacled and commerson's dolphins, beaked whales, southern fur and leopard seals, and other creatures found in the southern seas. By now, Natalie and her assistants have collected about 300 spectacled porpoise skulls and more than 2,700 marine mammal skeletons. 
In 1998, Kent State University awarded her an honorary doctorate. As I prepare to leave, Natalie tells me that last year some forty-five seals washed up on the coast, when usually there are only one or two. It may be that the ocean is getting warmer, she says, due to global warming. Higher temperatures can kill off the krill, she says, and without the krill the seals and other marine life can starve. It's all about ecology. I ask her about the name of her museum, Akatuchun. It's a Yamana word, she says, but I don't know what it means. It's what they call this part of the coast. Are there any natives who still speak Yamana? Just one, she says, on Navarino Island in Puerto Williams. She runs a hand down her leg cast and readjusts herself in bed. Her name is Cristina Calderon. Three days later, I'm on a Zodiac, crossing the Beagle Channel from the Argentine port of Ushuaia to Chile's Navarino Island. The inflatable boat has a low plastic roof for protection against the waves. The sky is gray, the sea the color of slate and with strong swells. The skipper stands in the open behind, dressed in foul weather gear that includes a ski mask, goggles, and a baseball hat. Es feo. It's ugly he tells me bluntly before we take off. Seabirds dip and rise as we skim along the backs of cresting swells, sometimes slamming into the troughs. The zodiac shudders, then scoots up another swell again. About midway, we see the fluke of a whale. Hump back, the skipper shouts. Looking back across the Beagle Channel, I can see the crescent harbor of Ushuaia and the final dragon-like tail of the Andes Mountains, stretched out behind it in a rather majestic and jagged chain that eventually slinks into the sea further south at Cape Horn. To the north rise two snow-capped peaks, obscured by clouds. One is Mount Darwin. Two hundred miles further north is Mount Fitzroy. Both Andean peaks now pay homage to a naturalist and a captain, once genial dining companions, whose voyage through this area ultimately changed the world. On Navarino Island we disembark at a tiny port that consists of a small bay and a single wooden wharf. We then transfer to a mud-spattered SUV and begin heading south, following a dirt road that skirts through the forest and along the coast, the car jouncing and hot inside, the sea looking blue and cool and inviting. About an hour south, a woman flags us down, and we stop and let her in. She wears a long checkered coat, is about sixty, and has lived on Navarino Island for fifteen years. She has a face as lined and weathered by the elements as granite that has been scoured by glaciers. The trees here, too, are contorted, bent permanently southward by the constant winds. The woman tells me she's been out cutting firewood and will return to pick it up in a few days. For the winter she says. Another hour south we arrive in Puerto Williams, a town of twenty-two hundred inhabitants. Those who live here boast of living in the southernmost city in the world. It is, if your criteria for a city is a few thousand inhabitants. If not, then the sixty thousand people who live in Ushuaia, thirty miles across the Beagle Channel in Argentina, can claim the title. The afternoon is sunny, and the air freshly scrubbed from rain, I walk down a street, the gabled houses in town all brilliantly lit, their corrugated iron roofs so many rectangles and squares of pale green, blue, black, or red. Piles of firewood lie stacked alongside or in front of each house, the remains of Coihue or Lenga beech trees. All heating in Puerto Williams comes from the small hatcheted pieces of wood that are thrown into metal furnaces. Outside, small round metal chimneys poke through the roofs, exhaling constant plumes of black and milk-colored smoke over town. It's late in the afternoon by the time I find a fisherman's house that doubles as a bed and breakfast. The owner's name is Nelson. He's brown-skinned with dark eyes and shows me to a room that is heated with hot water pipes. The bedroom's only window is already frosted. Nelson's originally from Concepcion, on Chile's northern coast, he is forty-two years old and has been a fisherman all his life. Ten years ago, he risked setting crab pots down in an area where no fisherman had dared to go crabbing before, due to its treacherous nature. Nelson soon hit the jackpot, finding so many southern king crabs and making so much money, 
that he was able to buy his present house with cash. Nelson christened his new place the Hostal Paso McKinley, named after the channel where he'd made his fortune. The crabs were this size, he says, holding his thick, lined hands out for a four-foot spread. I ask him where, after a lifetime spent on the sea, the roughest seas are. He thinks a minute and says, Las Malvinas, the Falklands. He shakes his head slowly from side to side. Es lo peor. It's the worst, he says. Sixty miles northwest of Puerto Williams, on the back side of Navarino Island, lies Wulaya Bay, which I reach a few days later. Wulaya is still accessible only by boat, as there are scarcely any roads on the island. It's the same bay where Darwin and Fitzroy left Jemmy Button, York Minster, and Fuegia Basket in 1833. The bay is surrounded on three sides by tall, forest-covered hills that slope down to the water, while the bay itself is dotted with tiny forested islets, low to the water and looking like the overturned hulls of boats. I follow a path up into the hills, the trail covered in small, fall-colored beech leaves, then emerge onto a bluff with magnificent views over the bay. It has recently rained, so the ground is cold and damp. Water drips from the trees. Wulaya was once the heart of Yamana territory, and the area is still strewn with abundant shell middens. One hundred and seventy-eight years ago, the HMS Beagle anchored here and was soon surrounded by dozens of canoes filled with excited Yamana Indians. Other canoes remained out on the bay, the women fishing or diving, as children cried and the smoke from small fires in the canoes set upon wet clay curled up into the sky. Now the bay is quiet and eerie. There are no signs of life other than birds calling in the forest or trees moving in the wind. The area where Jemmy and the Beagle's crew once created gardens is now knee-high in yellow grass. In the distance, clouds shift their shapes, slowly scudding along the sea. To the north, I can just see Button Island, green and forested, where Jemmy lived and where his body was later cremated. Now, not a soul lives there. In 1873, nine years after Jemmy died, a canoe showed up at Ushuaia across the Beagle Channel. Inside was Fuegia Basket, who had not been seen in years. Thomas Bridges had taken up residence in Ushuaia only a year earlier, but he, of course, had heard of her. As Lucas Bridges recounted, It was my father's first meeting with her. He found her strong and well, short, thick-set, and with many teeth missing from a mouth that was large even for a Fuegian. When he tried sounding her memory, she recollected London and Miss Jenkins, whose special charge she had been. She also retained memories of Captain Fitzroy and the good ship Beagle, and recalled such words as knife, fork, and beads. When my mother showed her two children, she seemed greatly pleased, and said, "'Little boy, little gal!' All else she appeared to have forgotten, including the art of sitting on a chair, for when offered one, she squatted beside it on the floor. Fuegia's husband, York Minster, it turned out, had been killed years earlier, she said, in retaliation for the murder of another man. Fuegia had remarried and was now in her early fifties. Although Bridges did his utmost to get her to recall her religious training, all recollection of it had faded entirely from her mind. A decade later, in 1883, two years after Darwin died, Thomas Bridges came across Fuegia one last time on what is now called Cook Island at the northern end of the Beagle Channel. She was about sixty-two years of age, Lucas Bridges wrote, and nearing her end. He found her in a very weak condition and an unhappy state of mind, and did his best to cheer her with the beautiful biblical promises in which he himself so firmly believed. It was the final time, he said, that Fuegia Basket, the last of the natives who had once visited England, was ever seen. A few days after visiting Wulaya Bay, I walked south out of Puerto Williams, along the road leading to Ukika, the Yamana settlement. In the early part of the nineteenth century, the only remaining Anglican missionary in the area, Reverend Williams, petitioned the Chilean government for land for the Yamanas. The government granted it at Mejones, which is Spanish for mussels. Mejones is a small bay on the northwestern shores of Navarino Island. It was the only land the Yamanas ever received. 
For years, many Yamana families lived along the bay's edge, in wooden houses with zinc roofs, fishing, diving for mussels, tending small herds of sheep, and occasionally hiring themselves out as workers on various ranches. In 1958, the Chilean Navy relocated the remaining Yamanas to a tiny settlement on the Uquica River, just east of Puerto Williams. The Navy built a small cluster of wooden houses with corrugated metal siding and sloping metal roofs set amid a grove of beech trees. I walk up to one of them, a small yellow house whose roof is a mix of rust and green paint. Smoke streams from a chimney stovepipe. I knock on the door and hear footsteps inside. The door opens, and Cristina Calderon, the last Yamana speaker on earth, stands before me. Come in, she says in Spanish. Cristina is about five feet two, with gray-black shoulder-length hair parted down the middle, wide-set brown eyes, and a firm, no-nonsense face. She is eighty-three years old and was born in 1928 on a sheep ranch on Navarino Island. My mother, my brothers and sisters, we all spoke Yamana growing up around the house, she tells me, balancing her great-niece, four-year-old Tamara, on her knee. There used to be more of us speakers, but they died. The last person I could speak my language with was my sister, Ursula. She died four years ago. Ursula, she says, loved Mejiones, or Mussels Bay. When she grew ill, she kept saying that she wanted to return there. Her daughter took her there finally, Christina says, just before she died. Now no one lives on the bay. Only the Yamana Cemetery remains, rising from a grassy field alongside the road. The cemetery is an assortment of wooden crosses surrounded by a wicker fence and backed by trees that look out over the Beagle Channel. Christina's father disappeared soon after she was born, she says, and her mother died when she was five. Her mother's sister and her uncle then raised her and her six brothers and sisters. She never went to school, she said, because there was no school where they lived. When Christina was sixteen, she found work on a sheep ranch, helping out in the kitchen and taking care of the owner's children. Eventually, she married a Spanish-speaking Chilean, she and her husband found work in the 1950s on Harberton Ranch with the Goodall family, the descendants of Thomas Bridges. That was before Thomas Goodall was married, she says. She lived in a small cottage for ten years on the Harberton property and has fond memories of living there. Christina eventually had six children. All work as fishermen, except for one who works on a cruise ship. None of them speak Yamana. I never married a Yamana she tells me, so I couldn't teach my children. They grew up speaking Spanish. A hundred years ago, sixteen indigenous languages were spoken in Chile. Now seven of those have already gone extinct. In the wider world, of the seven thousand or so languages that are spoken today, roughly half are spoken by fewer than three thousand people. Linguists estimate that between fifty percent and ninety percent of all the languages presently spoken on earth will disappear within the next fifty years. Languages are not simply vocabulary lists or sets of grammatical rules, says the anthropologist Wade Davis, but old-growth forests of the mind. Languages are products of unique cultures, he says, cultures that reflect different ways of being, thinking, and knowing. When a language goes extinct, it reduces the entire range of the human imagination, what will happen to the Yamana language now? I asked Christina. Since you're the last speaker, is anyone else learning it? My niece is, Christina tells me. Her niece is a teacher, married to a German, and both she and her husband know some Yamana words. My niece helped me write my book, she says. Christina fetches a slim red paperback and shows me its title. Haikur Mama Sushis. It means in Yamana... I want to tell you a story. The book is a collection of myths that she and her sister Ursula learned from the older Yamanas when growing up. Despite the title, it's written in Spanish by her granddaughter, Cristina Zoraga, who transcribed the myths. When she was a young girl, Cristina tells me, she witnessed the last Yamana initiation rite, what the Yamanas called the Cheshaw. The elders built a large, oval-shaped shelter, she said, some of the elders wore headbands of white albatross feathers, which symbolized the foam of the sea. Others dressed up as spirits, such as the fierce Winefkar or the Yetaite. 
There was non-stop singing and dancing. A fire was lit within the shelter, and two or three young teenagers, called Ushwala, were led inside to learn the Yamana myths, the sacred rites and songs. They were there to learn what it meant to be Yamana. The Cheshaw was sort of a school, Christina says, and usually would last for weeks, even months. In the old days, if a beached whale were found, the Yamanas would gather and use the whale as an excuse to throw a Cheshaw, as the constant supply of food allowed them to take a sort of holiday. The last Cheshaw took place when Christina was too young to be initiated herself. That was the last one we ever held, she said. It was beautiful. I buy a copy of her book and ask her to sign it, without really thinking about the request. Christina opens it carefully, flips a few pages, and then, on the frontispiece dedicated to her sister, Ursula, she carefully scrawls out C-R-I-S-T-I-N-A in rough letters. Each letter stands alone and looks as if it has been engraved with a penknife. As she scrawls out her name, I suddenly realize that Christina, the last Yamana speaker, never learned how to read or write. Two days later, I'm on a cruise ship, the Via Australis, headed out of Ushuaia. It's night, and the ship glides down the Beagle Channel, on its way to Cape Horn, the southernmost island off South America, and the southernmost island that the Yamanas once inhabited. Nowadays, on Cape Horn, there's only a lighthouse run by the Chilean government, and a single Chilean family, which changes every year. On the island's shore, long feared by sailors, protrude the quiet remains of shell middens. To the Yamanas, this craggy, forlorn outpost, the last outburst of the Andes, was home. Earlier in the day, at dusk, I had strolled along the top deck, witnessing a humpback whale lift its black fluke and then dive, slowly wending its way to winter feeding grounds off Antarctica, perhaps singing to other whales deep beneath the sea. Christina had told me that her son worked here, in the ship's galley, making the repeated run from Ushuaia to Cape Horn and then to Punta Arenas and back, stopping at various ports along the way. During our voyage, the ship had passed blue-green glaciers that routinely cracked in the sun, shifting their contents abruptly into the sea. I ask a steward to arrange a meeting, and, one night outside the galley, the door opens. A man steps out. Christina's son is about five foot three, wears black slacks, a dark shirt, and a white apron. He has thick salt-and-pepper eyebrows, brown skin, and a puzzled look on his face. Nearly two centuries earlier, the HMS Beagle had cruised these same waters, taking on board a young Yamana boy known as Orundelico, in his own language, and Jemmy Button to others. Now, nearly two centuries later, I chat with the son of the last Yamana speaker— a man who works on a ship that caters to wealthy travelers from around the world. His name is David. He is fifty-five years old, and he tells me that he's an assistant cook. I never learn my mother's language, he says, looking a bit wistful, because my father only spoke Spanish. And now, he says, wiping his hands on his apron, I'm afraid it's too late. This concludes Life and Death in the Andes by Kim McQuarrie. Narrated by Jonathan Yen. Copyright 2015 by Kim McQuarrie. This unabridged audiobook is published by arrangement with Sarah Lazen Books and was produced in the year 2015 by Tantor Media Incorporated, a division of recorded books, which holds the copyright there too. Please visit Tantor.com for more information on our growing library of unabridged audiobooks and to take advantage of special offers. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.